Section 49 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 47, John P. Stockton, 1826-1900, New Jersey. Election Case, December 4, 1865, to March 27, 1866. Issues, conduct of election, whether Senator could vote for himself on Senate floor in contested election case. Chronology, credentials presented December 4, 1865. Referred to committee, January 8, 1866. Committee report, January 30, 1866. Senate vote, March 27, 1866. Result, unseated. Background. John P. Stockton's family connections prepared him for political leadership in New Jersey since both his father and grandfather had been United States senators. In 1858, President James Buchanan appointed Stockton, who was a lawyer, to be United States Minister to Rome, where he served until 1861. When Stockton, a Democrat, was elected to the Senate in 1865, the method of his election precipitated a major debate and ultimately passage of a law specifying procedures for state legislatures to follow in electing U.S. Senators. Statement of the Case Stockton's credentials for the term to begin March 4, 1865, were presented on December 4, 1865, together with a memorial from a portion of the New Jersey legislature complaining that the election was invalid. Opponents in the legislature protested that Stockton had received only a plurality, rather than a majority, of the votes in the joint session. At the time of the election, the joint session of the legislature had voted, 41 to 40, to rescind the state requirement that a senator be elected by a majority of all the legislators, and instead to permit election by a plurality of those present. The opponents contended that such a change would require a majority vote by each House, and that a majority of the state assembly members had not voted for the resolution. The Senate, however, allowed Stockton to take his seat while referring his credentials to the Judiciary Committee on January 8, 1866. Response of the Senate The Judiciary Committee, chaired by Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, reported on January 30th that Stockton's election had been valid. According to the committee, the New Jersey statute provided that a joint meeting of the Senate and the General Assembly would select the United States Senators, but the law contained no stipulations regarding how the joint meeting would be organized and the election conducted. In fact, the committee noted that the New Jersey legislature's joint meetings had in the past operated under a variety of different rules, which were adopted at the beginning of the session, an arrangement apparently permitted by the state constitution. On March 22, 1866, Daniel Clark, Republican of New Hampshire, initiated the Senate debate challenging the recommendations of the Judiciary Committee. Clark argued that the Constitution remained silent on the subject of election by plurality or majority, and that past custom represented the accepted common law for New Jersey. Additionally, Clark noted that when the New Jersey legislature had voted to change the traditional method of counting a victory, only one body, the state Senate, had a majority present. In defending the legislature's conduct, Stockton raised a point that was becoming increasingly apparent to the Senate. He said, quote, Senators are not always elected in New Jersey or in any other state, I presume, in precisely the same way. Since I have been in Washington, he complained, the position I have occupied has been very unexpected. 
It is a very unpleasant thing to have anyone believe that a gentleman would claim a seat to which he was not clearly entitled. Unquote. Post Civil War factional animosities continually surfaced during the complex legal arguments of the contending senators, adding considerable heat to the debate. On March 23rd, the Senate voted 22 to 21 to affirm the Judiciary Committee's recommendation, but failed to end the controversy since Stockton himself participated in the vote. Urged on by radical Republicans William P. Fessenden of Maine and Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, Lot M. Morrill, Republican of Maine, who had been paired with Stockton's absent New Jersey colleague, William Wright, Democrat, insisted on voting against the resolution. He thus abandoned the pair arrangement, in which the vote of a senator who is present is neutralized by that of an absent senator on the opposite side of an issue. Contending that New Jersey was thus being denied a vote on an issue crucial to the state, Stockton then angrily demanded that his name be called, and he cast the deciding vote for the committee's resolution, although some senators objected that he could not properly vote in his own case. On Monday, March 26, Charles Sumner declared that the record in the Senate Journal showing Stockton voting on his own case reflected badly on the Senate. He therefore demanded that the journal be amended to remove Stockton's name from the list of those voting. After considerable debate, Stockton offered to withdraw his vote, but the Senate finally decided that the proper approach was simply to reconsider its earlier action. In the midst of the heated debate, Stockton asked the Senate not to act on the case until his ailing New Jersey colleague, Democrat William Wright, could return to Washington. The Senate, however, decided to move ahead the next day and take a new vote on the Judiciary Committee's resolutions, this time without Stockton's participation. On March 27th, the Senate voted 23 to 20 to deny the New Jersey senator his seat. Conclusion During the course of his defense, Stockton had prepared a detailed list of the procedures used by state legislatures across the country in electing their senators. This report dramatized the inconsistency in the way such elections were handled and led the Senate to take action. In response to this evidence and to the burden of multiple election challenges resulting from extensive misconduct and corruption at the state level, Congress in July 1866 passed a law to regulate the time and procedure for the election of United States Senators. This legislation represented the first major change in the selection process originally authorized by the Founding Fathers. It stipulated that on the first Tuesday after a legislature met in a senatorial election year, the two houses would meet separately to each select a senator by voice vote. The next day, both houses would meet in joint session to report their individual selections. If both houses chose the same candidate, that candidate would be declared elected. If not, the law provided that, quote, the joint assembly shall meet at 12 o'clock meridian on each succeeding day of the legislature and take at least one vote until a senator shall be elected, unquote. The requirement that the two houses of a legislature meet together was designed to end the deadlocks in which each house of a legislature had ignored the other. Although much of the extensive debate on this case dealt with the complexities of the New Jersey election, radical Republican senators like Sumner and Fessenden had an additional agenda. The Senate had recently failed to override President Andrew Johnson's veto of the Freedmen's Bureau bill and the president was also expected to veto the Civil Rights Bill. 
They hoped that unseating Democrat Stockton would help them gain the necessary two-thirds vote to override that veto. As it happened, on April 6, 1866, the Senate succeeded in overriding the civil rights veto by a vote of 33 to 15. And in July, the Senate overrode a veto of a second Freedmen's Bureau bill. Stockton's seat remained vacant until the following September, when the legislature elected a Republican to serve out the remainder of the term. In 1869, John Stockton was returned to the Senate, where he served until 1875. In 1877, he became Attorney General of New Jersey, a position he held for 15 years. Stockton died in 1900. End of Case 47 and of Section 49. Section 50 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 48, David T. Patterson, 1818-1891, Tennessee. Election Case, July 26, 1866, to July 28, 1866. Issues. Reconstruction. Qualifications. Ability to honestly swear to test oath. Chronology. Credentials presented July 26, 1866. Referred to committee July 26, 1866. Committee report July 27, 1866. Senate vote July 28, 1866. Result, seated. Background. Tennessee's desire to return to the Union following the Civil War caused great concern among radical Republicans, who feared that the admission of that state's congressional representatives would establish precedents for other rebel states that would be difficult to check. On the other hand, the state had supported a large Unionist population throughout the war and was the home of President Andrew Johnson, who was certain to watch the proceedings in Congress with a keen eye. Once Tennessee ratified the 14th Amendment and was readmitted to the Union on July 24, 1866, under an Enabling Act certifying that all necessary conditions had been fulfilled, Congress had little reason to refuse to seat the state's representatives. Statement of the Case On July 26, 1866, David T. Patterson, Unionist, elected to complete the term that began on March 4, 1863, presented his credentials. Charles Sumner, Republican of Massachusetts, immediately asked that the certificates be sent to the Judiciary Committee. Sumner based his request on information from Tennessee that Patterson had taken an oath of allegiance to the rebel government and had served as a state judge during the war. Under the terms of Reconstruction, a person who had acted as an official of a rebellious state was denied office in the national government. Response of the Senate. Reverdy Johnson, Democrat of Maryland, and James Grimes, Republican of Iowa, both objected to referring the matter to committee. They insisted that Patterson be seated at once to provide his state with Senate representation. His Tennessee colleague, Joseph Fowler, had been seated the previous day while the Judiciary Committee examined the case. Edgar Cowan, Republican of Pennsylvania, argued that the Senate could expel Patterson with a two-thirds vote after he was seated, but that it was unwise to exclude him from his seat on a simple majority vote when he met all constitutional requirements. Others, however, believed the committee should review the case to determine whether Patterson, having served as a judge under the Confederacy, could properly take the ironclad test oath of loyalty 
required by the Act of July 1862. Under that Act, all future officials of the U.S. government must swear that they had not given aid or encouragement to the enemy, nor exercised the functions of any office under an authority in hostility to the United States. After considerable discussion, the Senate voted 26 to 14 to refer the matter to the Judiciary Committee. On July 27, 1866, a divided Judiciary Committee reported back that it accepted the facts of Patterson's support for the Union, but members differed on whether he should be seated. James R. Doolittle, Republican of Wisconsin, had championed Patterson's loyalty, stating that it had not faltered in the face of constant harassment and repeated arrests by the Confederate Army. Patterson held the judicial post when the war began and ran for re-election only because his East Tennessee Unionist friends greatly feared the other candidate, an aggressive Confederate. Although victorious, Patterson had difficulty pursuing his career as a judge, for he spent most of his days in hiding, unable to convene the court with regularity. Further, Doolittle added, quote, His house was the home of the fleeing men who sought their way through the mountains from North and South Carolina. His fortune was at their disposal. He organized a system by which the men of East Tennessee ran into Kentucky and flocked to our armies by thousands upon thousands, unquote. Patterson's personal suffering on behalf of the Union convinced the majority of the Judiciary Committee that he had subscribed to the Confederate oath simply as an expedient. In order to be in a position to help protect Union supporters in that part of Tennessee from civil disorder and violence by bands of armed rebels. Patterson had also been in touch with leaders of Union forces in the area, providing them with information on rebel movements. In light of his evident dedication to the Union, the panel recommended that Patterson be seated. While committee chairman Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, concurred in these sentiments and sympathized with Patterson's plight, he maintained that Patterson could not honestly swear that he had never accepted any office in a government hostile to the United States. Trumbull objected to seating a member who knowingly swore a false oath particularly since Republicans worried that many Southern states were still trying to send to Congress known rebels who might not hesitate to swear that they had been loyal during the war. As a possible solution, Trumbull offered a joint resolution that would exempt Patterson from the troublesome portion of the oath. Other senators objected that the resolution would never pass the House, although they agreed that, if it did, President Johnson, who happened to be Patterson's father-in-law, could be depended upon not to veto it. The resolution, hastily drafted that day by Trumbull, passed the Senate 35 to 2. The Senate remained in session until 4 in the morning of the next day, when the body again addressed the subject of David Patterson. Exhausted by the late hour and informed that the House, bowing to pressure from Republicans who objected to tampering with the oath in any way, had tabled the joint resolution, the Senate reverted to the original recommendation from the Judiciary Committee. Trumbull continued to insist that the only way to administer Patterson the oath was to exclude the portion that referred to the acceptance of a Confederate office. Benjamin Wade, Republican of Ohio, blamed Patterson for creating his own predicament. Quote, no man can act as a judge under a rebel government and swear allegiance to it without committing an act of hostility and treason against his own government. If he is true to the Confederacy, he is a traitor to our government. 
If he is true to our government, he is false to that to which he has voluntarily sworn, unquote. Faced with this impasse and unwilling to see the oath intended to exclude rebels and secessionists become a weapon against a vigorous unionist, the Senate finally voted 21 to 11 with 18 senators absent to seat Patterson. He took his oath of office in the final hours of the congressional session on July 28. Conclusion Even after Patterson's seating, two concerns remain. He did, in fact, swear to the full oath, which his actions contradicted. And some senators could not shake the uneasy feeling that the oath itself represented an illegal addition to the constitutional qualifications for membership. Such dilemmas were to be repeated many times in the Senate throughout the troublesome era of Reconstruction. David Patterson, who had risked his life in support of the Union in Tennessee, remained in the Senate until the end of his term in 1869, when he retired from public life. He died in Tennessee in 1891. End of Case 48 and of Section 50Section 51 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 49, Philip F. Thomas, 1810-1890, to Maryland. Election Case, March 18, 1867, to February 19, 1868. Issues, Reconstruction, Qualifications, Ability to Honestly Swear to Test Oath, Chronology, Credentials Presented March 18, 1867, Referred to Committee March 19, 1867, Committee Report December 18, 1867, Senate Vote February 19, 1868. Result, not seated. Background. Philip Thomas, son of a prominent Maryland Whig family, abandoned his family's political affiliation and joined the Democratic Party. A lawyer who was active in both state and national politics, Thomas served as governor of Maryland and in the United States House of Representatives. He was Secretary of the Treasury under President James Buchanan for one month before resigning in January 1861 at the outset of the Civil War. A Confederate sympathizer, he spent the war years in retirement at his farm on Maryland's eastern shore. Thomas was elected to the United States Senate for a term to begin March 4, 1867. Statement of the Case the presentation of Thomas's credentials on March 18, 1867, launched the Senate on a year-long controversy. Jacob Howard, Republican of Michigan, spearheaded the Republican attack, demanding that the Senate send Thomas's credentials to the Judiciary Committee before permitting him to take the oath of office. He feared that Thomas could not truthfully swear the so-called ironclad test oath required by the Act of 1862 that he had not provided, quote, aid, countenance, counsel, or encouragement, unquote, to the enemy during the war. Reverdy Johnson, Democrat of Maryland, who was frequently at loggerheads with the Republicans on Reconstruction issues, denounced Howard's challenge to his Maryland colleague and longtime friend as incomprehensible. It could not, Johnson hoped, be because Republicans gave any credence to unfounded rumors that surrounded Thomas's tenure as Secretary of the Treasury. Radicals, in a barrage of accusations, quickly made it clear that this was but one of the many charges they would level at Thomas. There were two principal allegations against the senator-elect. 
that he had resigned as a member of President Buchanan's cabinet because he opposed the reinforcement of Fort Sumter, and that as Secretary of the Treasury, he had transferred a substantial sum of federal money from New York to New Orleans once he knew rebels controlled the Louisiana bank and could easily seize the funds. Reverdy Johnson, defending his colleague, provided detailed information to refute this latter charge. Unexpected support for Thomas came from Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who argued that senators were bound by the Constitution to admit members who appeared with the correct qualifications. If the matter were referred to his committee, he inquired, what is there for the committee to investigate? He cited precedents in his own case, see Case 28, and that of James Harlan, see Case 29, that in such challenges, the senators were usually seated and then an investigation was conducted into the charges against them. Trumbull told his colleagues, quote, it will not do to assume the position that every person who disagrees with us politically is an enemy of his country, unquote. William P. Fessenden, Republican of Maine, agreed with Trumbull and suggested that Thomas take his oath. Then, if the Senate had evidence that he committed perjury, he should be expelled through the traditional means. Fessenden recalled only two cases, both involving charges of disloyalty during the war, cases 41 and 48, when he had urged investigating the serious allegations first. The objections to Thomas intensified after John Sherman, Republican of Ohio, read aloud a newspaper account of a speech that Thomas made to the Maryland General Assembly immediately after his senatorial nomination, in which he said, quote, The men now assembled at Washington before the war occurred were bent upon dissolving the Union and were now bent upon the establishment of a military despotism, unquote. According to the report, he had declared that those in the Congress, quote, are now and always were traitors to the Union. Unquote. Democrats questioned the accuracy of the newspaper story, but the damaging impression remained. In response to these objections, the Senate sent Thomas's credentials to the Judiciary Committee on March 19, 1867. Response of the Senate On December 18, 1867, the committee returned a report without recommendation. After examining the evidence it had collected, the committee found no reason to prevent Thomas from taking his seat, with the possible exception of the fact that his son served in the Confederate Army. For a judgment on whether that circumstance should disqualify him, the committee referred all the evidence to the full Senate. On January 6, 1868, the Senate began debating the matter. Reverdy Johnson led the effort to seat Thomas, defending his Maryland colleague at length. Thomas, he said, had spent months unsuccessfully trying to dissuade his young son from joining the Confederate Army. Once the young man was actually leaving to cross into Southern territory, Thomas gave him $100 in case he was captured and needed money in prison. After the son left, the father refused to communicate with him again. Republican senators opposed to seating Thomas focused particularly on the $100 gift to the soldier's son as evidence that Thomas had given aid and comfort to the rebel cause. Again, there was considerable procedural discussion over the recurring issue of whether the Senate should seat a challenged senator and then investigate the charges, or should conduct the investigation first and, if appropriate, deny him his seat. If after a senator was sworn in, an inquiry substantiated the charges, 
or the senator was found to have committed perjury when swearing the loyalty oath, the Senate could later expel him through a two-thirds vote. Judiciary Committee Chairman Trumbull, who, based on previous precedent, had urged seating Thomas when his credentials were first presented, changed his position and suggested that in the future it would be preferable for the Senate to conduct the investigation first, since there had been occasions in the past when a senator had been seated and served for a year or more before the Senate finally decided he was not entitled to a seat. In fact, he suggested adopting a Senate rule that, quote, no person about whose right to a seat there is a question should be admitted to be sworn until that question is settled, unquote. Charles Sumner, Republican of Massachusetts, expressed the continuing fear of many Republicans that the Senate was in danger of being overrun by former Confederates. Quote, everywhere in the rebel states, unquote, he said, quote, disloyal people are struggling for power, and now at the door of the Senate we witness a similar struggle. Disloyalty must be met at the door and not allowed to enter in, unquote. Many of the radical Republicans believed that Thomas's lack of active support for the Union was in itself evidence of disloyalty but other senators considered that mere sympathy for the rebels should not be disqualifying as long as Thomas had taken no overt action on their behalf. Trumbull, for example, did not believe that Thomas's gift of $100 to his son constituted encouragement to the enemy in the meaning of the oath. He therefore concluded that Thomas should be seated. After several more days of debate, the Senate on February 19th concurred with Sumner's view and voted 27 to 20 to deny Thomas his seat. The resolution as adopted read that Thomas, quote, having voluntarily given aid, countenance, and encouragement to persons engaged in armed hostility to the United States, unquote, was not entitled to be seated as a senator. Conclusion. The lengthy heated debate in this case helped to weaken the unity among Senate Republicans. On the day of the final vote, Jacob Howard and Lyman Trumbull hurled at each other angry charges of, quote, perverting the evidence, unquote. Trumbull, Fessenden, and several other Republicans broke with their colleagues and voted in favor of Thomas a symptom of the deep-seated differences among Republican senators, some of whom could not shake the uneasy feeling that the required loyalty oath was an unconstitutional device designed to limit political opposition. Philip Thomas was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1875 and served one term. In 1878, he won a seat in the Maryland General Assembly. Thomas died in Baltimore in 1890. End of Case 49 and of Section 51. Section 52 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 50. John T. Jones, dates unknown, and Augustus H. Garland, 1832 to 1899, versus Alexander MacDonald, 1832 to 1903, and Benjamin F. Rice, 1828 to 1905, Arkansas. Election Case, June 23, 1868. Issues. Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect. Chronology. Credentials Presented, June 23, 1868. Senate Vote, June 23, 1868. Result. McDonald and Rice, Seated. Background. 
Even after the unsuccessful Senate bids of William Fishback, Elisha Baxter, and William D. Snow in 1864, see Case 44, Arkansas did not abandon efforts to have its representatives seated in the upper house. Undaunted by the Senate rebuff, the state legislature sent claimants in 1866 and 1867. In both cases, the credentials, one set for John T. Jones and one for Augustus Garland, Democrat, were ordered to lie on the table. Then, on June 22, 1868, after adopting a new constitution with the participation of black voters, Arkansas was readmitted to the Union under terms of the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. Statement of the Case The next day, on June 23, 1868, the credentials of Republicans Alexander McDonald and Benjamin F. Rice, elected under the new Constitution, were presented for the same terms claimed by Jones and Garland. A native of Pennsylvania who moved to Arkansas during the war, McDonald, a banker, was active in raising troops for the Union Army. Rice, originally from New York, lived in Kentucky and Minnesota before settling in Arkansas after serving with Union forces in the war years. Arkansas, having been unrepresented in the Senate since 1861, now had four sets of credentials under consideration. Neither of the earlier elected senators had attempted to claim his seat. Garland did not appear, and Jones had died. Nonetheless, Garrett Davis, Democrat of Kentucky, requested that the earlier credentials be read and that all four sets be sent to the Judiciary Committee for a determination as to which senators should be seated. Response of the Senate Jacob Howard, Republican of Michigan, objected to Davis's strategy, pointing out that in passing the 1867 Reconstruction Acts, Congress had already refused to recognize the provisional state legislature of 1865 that was responsible for the first election attempts. The reorganized state government had elected McDonald and Rice under a constitution in accord with national Reconstruction policy. As senators warmed to a debate on the fine points of procedure, Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, foresaw that his committee would be inundated with claimants to Senate seats from former Confederate states. With senatorial elections pending in North and South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, Trumbull recommended adoption of a rule to regulate the precise time when legislatures in the former rebel states were authorized to hold elections. By such a rule, Trumbull hoped to deflect charges that state legislatures elected senators before Congress granted the proper authorization. Additionally, Trumbull rejected a suggestion that the Arkansas senators should be required to draw lots for the length of their terms, arguing that even though the seats had been vacant for several years, the terms established when Arkansas entered the Union in 1836 had continued despite the secession period. Garrett Davis insisted on the need to refer the matter to the Judiciary Committee, reiterating his own Reconstruction philosophy, which denied to either the President or Congress the power to prescribe the terms of readmission. Davis contended that once a rebel state was defeated, quote, the Constitution restored them to the Union and enabled them to claim all their rights in the government as states of the United States, unquote. Thus, he believed the Arkansas seats properly belonged to Jones and Garland rather than to the new arrivals. Rejecting Davis's argument, the Senate by voice vote defeated the motion to refer the credentials to the Judiciary Committee. 
Alexander MacDonald and Benjamin Rice then stepped forward to take the oath of office and, for the first time in seven years, Arkansas had two senators. Conclusion Unlike the earlier claimants for Senate seats from the former Confederate states, there could be no question about the loyalty of MacDonald and Rice, both of whom had served in the Union Army during the war. The Reconstruction Acts and the formal readmission of Arkansas to the Union had set the ground rules, and the Republican-dominated Senate took the next step by swearing in the senators elected under the state's new constitution. MacDonald failed to be re-elected in 1870. A proponent of Western Railroad development, he died in 1903. Rice, an organizer of the Republican Party in Arkansas, remained in the Senate until 1873, after which he practiced law until his death in 1905. More prominent was Augustus Garland, who, after his rejection by the Senate, was elected governor of Arkansas in 1874. Known for his affable style, Garland became a United States Senator in 1876. From 1885 to 1889, he served as Attorney General of the United States, after which he practiced law until his death in 1899. End of Case 50 and of Section 52「Section 53 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 51. William Marvin, 1808-1902, versus Thomas W. Osborne, 1833-1898, Florida. Election case, June 30, 1868. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect. Chronology, Credentials Presented, June 30, 1868. Senate Vote, June 30, 1868. Result, Osborne seated. Background. In 1866, Florida's provisional state government elected two United States senators. But believing the state had not taken sufficient steps to protect the rights of the freedmen, the Senate tabled their credentials and took no further action. Then, in 1868, under provisions of the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, Florida adopted a new, moderate constitution that enfranchised black voters. Having ratified the 13th and 14th Amendments, the newly constituted legislature elected two United States senators, former Freedmen's Bureau Commissioner Thomas W. Osborne, Republican, and Adonija S. Welch, Republican. On June 25th, the state was readmitted to the Union, together with North and South Carolina, Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia. Statement of the Case Upon the presentation of Thomas Osborne's credentials on June 30, 1868, William P. Fessenden, Republican of Maine, aware that well-publicized political discord and violence continued in Florida, inquired whether the state had met all requirements for representation in Congress. Osborne's supporter, Timothy Howe, Republican of Wisconsin, responded that the confirming evidence, the ordinance ratifying the two constitutional amendments, had just been laid on the table. Charles Drake, Republican of Missouri, nevertheless urged that the credentials be referred to committee. Response of the Senate. Timothy Howe reminded his colleagues that the Senate had not referred the credentials of Arkansas's two senators to committee before swearing them in a week earlier under similar circumstances. See Case 50. 
Fessenden, however, reiterated his desire to know more about Florida's ratification of the 13th and 14th Amendments, since even the 1868 legislature was dominated by those favoring white supremacy. Others agreed that a committee should review the matter. Jacob Howard, Republican of Michigan, and Charles Drake questioned the use of the word adopted rather than ratified by the Florida legislature in accepting the 13th and 14th Amendments. They urged that the materials regarding ratification be referred to the Judiciary Committee. But the committee's chairman, Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, expressed little enthusiasm for the idea. I have looked at these papers, he declared, and I see no earthly object in referring them. We may as well act upon them now as tomorrow. Conservative Republican James R. Doolittle, Wisconsin, added a twist to the proceedings by submitting the credentials of another Florida senator, William Marvin, elected by the Provisional Legislature in 1866 for the same term claimed by Osborne. The Wisconsin senator had first presented the credentials of the racially conservative Marvin, who had served as Florida's provisional governor, on January 19, 1866. At that time, they were tabled by the Senate. Doolittle now argued that Florida had never actually been out of the Union. Since the war was over by 1866, the legislature therefore had had a right to elect U.S. Senators. Marvin, he believed, had first claim upon the seat, and his credentials should be sent to the Judiciary Committee along with those of Osborne. After extensive wrangling over whether Florida had properly ratified the two amendments and whether the question should be referred to committee, the Senate finally refused by a vote of 13 to 31 to postpone the matter and then voted 34 to 6 to seat Osborne. William Marvin's claim was disregarded because he had been elected before passage of the Reconstruction Acts and by a Florida legislature that did not meet the stringent standards for renewal of representation in Congress. Osborne then came forward and took the oaths of office. Conclusion Resolving the controversy over Florida's readmission and the seating of one senator cleared the way for the state's second senator to take his place. On July 2, 1868, Adonisha Welch joined Osborne in the chamber and took his oaths of office. Welch, a Michigan educator who moved to Florida after the war, served only until the end of his brief term in March 1869. Thomas Osborne, a native of New Jersey who parlayed his service in the Union Army during the Civil War into a powerful Florida political career, retired from the Senate in March 1873 at the completion of his term. He returned to Florida to practice law and in later years moved to New York City. He died in New York in 1898. William Marvin later returned to his native New York, where he remained until his death in 1902. End of Case 51 and of Section 53. Section 54 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 52, Richard H. Whiteley, 1830-1890, and Henry P. Farrow, dates unknown, versus Joshua Hill, 1812 to 1891, and H. V. M. Miller, 1814 to 1896, Georgia. 
Election Case, December 7, 1868 to February 1, 1871. Issues. Reconstruction. Challenge to legislature's authority to elect. Qualifications. Ability to honestly swear to test oath. Chronology. Credentials presented December 7, 1868. Referred to committee December 10, 1868. Committee reports January 25, February 17, 1869. Credentials presented July 15, 1870. Referred to committee December 13, 1870. Committee report January 23, 1871. Senate vote February 1, 1871. Result, Hill and Miller seated. Background. Resistance to granting blacks political equality in some southern states created a basic tension with the Radical Republican Congress in the late 1860s. This attitude, coupled with factionalism within the states and a suspicious and divided Congress, kept several Southern Senate election cases in uncertainty for inordinately long periods. Such political conflicts blocked the seating of Georgia's senators for over two years. By June of 1868, Georgia had adopted a new constitution conforming to the Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and elected a legislature that ratified the 13th and 14th Amendments. Since the state had met the necessary criteria, Congress on June 25th passed a law restoring Georgia to representation in Congress, along with North and South Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida. A month later, the five Georgia members were seated in the House of Representatives, and on July 28th, the state legislature elected to the state's two Senate seats Republican Joshua Hill, who had served in the U.S. House of Representatives before the war, and Democrat Homer V. M. Miller, a physician who had participated in the new Georgia Constitutional Convention. But then, in September, the situation changed dramatically when the white members of the Georgia legislature expelled 28 black representatives and senators in effect returning the legislature to rebel control. As a result, when Hill's credentials were presented to the U.S. Senate on December 7, 1868, at the beginning of the third session of the 40th Congress, the scene was set for a fight. Statement of the Case Even though Joshua Hill was known to have remained a loyal Unionist throughout the war, Charles Drake, Republican of Missouri, registered a protest upon the presentation of his credentials. Informing his colleagues that the white Georgia legislators had banded together and expelled all the black members, Drake asked the Judiciary Committee to investigate Hill's credentials. Drake's fellow Republican, John Sherman, Ohio, disagreed. Sherman maintained that Georgia had complied with all conditions imposed by Congress, the state had been readmitted to representation, and the governor inaugurated on July 18, 1868. Ten days later, the legislature had elected Hill by a large majority. Because the Democrats were so anxious to defeat his principal opponent, whom they violently disliked, that they unenthusiastically joined with Georgia Republicans to vote for him. The expulsion of the black Republican legislators after the election, Sherman declared, quote, is as much disapproved by the senator-elect as by any one of us. It was a gross outrage, a violation of the constitutional amendment, and a violation of the Reconstruction Act, unquote. Sherman concluded, however, that the Senate should not penalize Hill, a faithful Unionist who decried the behavior of the state legislature. 
Drake refused to abandon his opposition, stressing his belief that Congress retained its power over the reconstructed states even after a state government was reorganized and recognized. Claiming to have no objection to Hill personally, he stated, quote, I wish this matter to be investigated. I wish the facts to go before the country, unquote. In October 1868, a convention representing the black population of Georgia had sent to Congress a memorial describing the situation there. It set forth the circumstances under which the black legislators had originally been elected and noted that the white members had encouraged them to ratify the constitutional amendments. Then, once the state was safely restored to the Union, the white legislators declared that the black members were actually ineligible to serve and voted to expel them in a body after, quote, the Speaker ruled that none of the persons involved in the charge had the right to vote upon the question, unquote. The memorialists asked for redress from Congress to uphold their rights as citizens. According to John Thayer, Republican of Nebraska, the rebellion in the Georgia legislature occurred because the body had been, quote, composed in part of men who had been expressly disqualified, unquote, from holding public office under terms of the 14th Amendment's prohibition on service by anyone who had previously served in a federal or state government office and later engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States, contending that the illegal inclusion in the state legislature of these members undermined the legitimacy of the reorganized Georgia government the Nebraska Republican dismissed concerns that sending the credentials to committee would place Hill in a state of suspense. After all, Thayer said, quote, civil order is in suspense in Georgia. Loyalty is in suspense in Georgia. Human liberty is in suspense in Georgia, unquote. On December 10, 1868, the Senate decided to refer the credentials of Joshua Hill to the Judiciary Committee, together with the memorial of the black voters and a letter on the matter from the governor of Georgia. A month later, the Senate also sent to committee the credentials of the senator-elect for the second Georgia vacancy, Homer V. M. Miller. Response of the Senate on January 25, 1869, the Judiciary Committee returned majority and minority reports on the credentials of Joshua Hill. Most committee members agreed with Roscoe Conkling, Republican of New York, that Congress could not overlook outrageous irregularities in the organization of the Georgia legislature or the expulsion of its black members. According to the committee, an essentially rebel legislature controlled the civil government, and widespread persecution, assault, and murder were being perpetrated against black Georgians and others loyal to the national government. Concerned about these conditions in the state, Conkling and his associates decided that Hill should not be seated. The minority view espoused by Judiciary Committee Chairman Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, accepted a statement by Georgia's provisional governor that no ineligible members sat in the legislature. It therefore recommended that the loyal Unionist Hill should be seated. Trumbull believed that time and the influence of a new state administration would soon correct whatever of lawlessness and disorder now remain in the state, of which there had been conflicting reports. Before the Senate took further action on either senator-elect, the National Union Republican Association of Georgia submitted resolutions to the Senate condemning the expulsion of the black legislators and urging that Joshua Hill 
and H. V. M. Miller not be seated. These resolutions were referred to the Judiciary Committee, which recommended on February 17, 1869, that Miller not be seated. Shortly thereafter, Congress adjourned. Lyman Trumbull promptly reactivated the Hill and Miller case when the 41st Congress convened several weeks later in early March. But the Senate failed to take action during this brief first session, and reports of disorder in the state continued. In December 1869, at the start of the second session, Congress responded by passing an act setting additional requirements for Georgia's reconstruction, including reorganization of the state legislature. After complying with these provisions and ratifying the 15th Amendment, the state was again formally admitted to representation in Congress on July 15, 1870. That same day, credentials were presented to the Senate for two new senators, Richard H. Whiteley, Republican, and Henry P. Farrow, chosen by the reorganized legislature. In the early days of the third session of the 41st Congress, on December 13, 1870, the Senate referred these credentials to the Judiciary Committee. Once again, the committee was divided, issuing majority and minority reports in January 1871. On January 23, the majority report recommended that Joshua Hill be seated but that H. V. M. Miller, who had acted as a surgeon in the Confederate Army, should be denied his seat because he could not swear the required ironclad test oath of loyalty that he had not given aid to the enemy. In presenting the report, Lyman Trumbull expressed the view that the Senate was not in a position to investigate the eligibility of individual members of a legislature that elected U.S. Senators. All that the Senate of the United States can do, he asserted, is to ascertain whether there was a legislature duly organized with a constitutional quorum in each of its branches which has sent the member here. He reiterated that at the time Hill and Miller were elected, the Georgia legislature had been recognized by Congress along with those from the other states readmitted to representation in June 1868. The problem, he explained, had arisen from the subsequent action of that legislature in expelling the black members and replacing them with white men who had not been properly elected. On January 30, 1871, William M. Stewart, Republican of Nevada, presented the minority report, expressing his opposition to seating Hill and Miller in extensive floor remarks. The two claimants elected before the December 1869 law was enacted, he believed, were not entitled to their seats, and Whiteley and Farrow, having been elected by a duly recognized legislature, should be sworn in. By a vote of 19 to 36, the Senate defeated Stewart's motion to seat Farrow and Whiteley, but Stewart continued to press his position. He contended that in passing the December 1869 Act, Congress had repudiated the 1868 legislature as illegally constituted and thus not empowered to elect U.S. Senators. A majority of the Senate, however, rejected this view believing that the legislature had elected Hill and Miller in conformity with the law. On February 1, 1871, senators anxious to settle the case voted to seat Joshua Hill, and he came forward to take the oaths of office. Debate on Miller's credentials followed. Alan Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, introduced a joint resolution providing that Hill need not take the ironclad oath regarding his past actions and instead 
could simply swear future loyalty to the United States. Thurman argued that since other Southerners who aided the rebellion both militarily and politically had had their disabilities removed, it seemed illogical to turn away Miller, who, as a Confederate surgeon, had been a non-combatant charged with saving lives. The Senate referred the joint resolution to the Judiciary Committee and it was subsequently passed by both houses of Congress and signed by the president. On February 24, 1871, Miller took the oath prescribed by the resolution and was seated. His term of office expired less than two weeks later. Conclusion The questions raised by the stormy history of the 1868 Georgia legislature were not yet finally settled. Throughout 1871, the Senate also wrestled with the case of Foster Blodgett, elected to succeed Miller by the same reorganized legislature that selected Whiteley and Farrow, see Case 57. On February 27, the Senate voted compensation to Henry P. Farrow and Richard H. Whiteley for the 11 months they waited for a decision in the case. Both Joshua Hill and Homer Miller returned to Georgia on the completion of their terms, Hill in 1873 and Miller in 1871. Hill participated in Georgia's Constitutional Convention of 1877, after which he returned to private life. He died in 1891, and Miller died in 1896. End of Case 52, and of Section 54. Section 55 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 53. Adelbert Ames, 1835-1933, Mississippi. Election case, February 25, 1870, to April 1, 1870. Issues, Reconstruction, Qualifications, Residency. Chronology, Credentials Presented, February 15, 1870. Referred to Committee, February 25, 1870. Committee Report, March 18, 1870. Senate vote, April 1, 1870. Result, seated. Background. In 1867, Congress passed the first of the Reconstruction Acts, returning the former Confederate states, including Mississippi, to military rule. President Ulysses S. Grant, in 1869, selected Adelbert Ames as provisional governor and military commander of the district, a Maine native and West Point graduate who had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his valor during the Civil War. Ames proved an articulate and dedicated spokesman for the policies of radical republicanism, as befitted the future son-in-law of radical Republican representative Benjamin F. Butler. Concerned about the violence against African Americans that he saw in Mississippi and elsewhere in the South, Ames joined the Republican Party and championed the rights of Mississippi blacks. Despite bitter infighting that split the state's Republican Party into two factions, Mississippi succeeded in establishing a state constitution in January 1870, and on February 23rd of that year, the state was readmitted to representation in Congress. When the Republicans who dominated the legislature elected the 34-year-old Ames to the United States Senate, he resigned from the Army to take the post. As his colleague, the legislature chose Hiram Revels, the first black to serve in the Senate. See Case 54. Statement of the Case When the credentials of Adelbert Ames were presented to the Senate on February 25, 1870, 
Democrats questioned his qualifications, and the matter was referred to the Committee on the Judiciary. His opponents charged that at the time of his election, Ames held two military posts. He was commander of the Military District of the Mississippi, as well as the provisional governor of the same jurisdiction. Some senators therefore questioned whether Ames, who as provisional governor had signed both his own credentials and those of Revels, was in fact a legal resident of Mississippi. Response of the Senate On March 18, Roscoe Conklin, Republican of New York, submitted the report of the Judiciary Committee with a resolution unfavorable to Ames. The report included Ames's statement to the committee, explaining that when he decided to leave Army life, he made a public declaration of his intentions, began negotiations to purchase property in the state, and resigned his military office before the readmission of Mississippi to the Union. The committee, however, did not consider these actions sufficient and recommended that Ames not be seated because it believed the Constitution required a senator-elect to be an inhabitant of the state at the time of election and not merely upon the convening of the Senate. The committee maintained that Ames did not resign his military commission and announce his intention to remain permanently in Mississippi until after his election. Conklin spoke at length in support of the committee's interpretation of the constitutional wording. He began his remarks by praising the personal worth, military courage, and obvious integrity of the senator-elect. He hoped to see Ames in the Senate, but not on the basis of the election that had been held in January. Conklin was sure that once the Senate rejected these credentials, the Mississippi legislature would promptly re-elect Ames, who was now clearly eligible for the seat, and he could then be seated. Based purely on the technical facts of the case, the committee believed that Ames did not meet the legal requirement for residency at the time of the election. In support of this assertion, Conklin explained that one could not become a resident of a state by, quote, mere locality of existence, unquote, but must move there voluntarily and demonstrate a firm intention to remain there. Because Ames had gone to Mississippi in compliance with military orders and would have to leave if ordered elsewhere, he could not be said to have moved there voluntarily or to be in a position to plan to remain there permanently. The Judiciary Committee therefore ruled that he could not legally claim to have been an inhabitant of Mississippi at the time of his election. Senate Republicans, however, were not united on the issue, for most believe that Ames should be seated. Committee member Benjamin F. Rice, Republican of Arkansas, disagreed with the committee's recommendation. He contended that the intention to remain in Mississippi was enough to make Ames an inhabitant, an intention Ames had formed at the time he was elected. An extensive debate ensued, continuing on March 23rd and 31st and April 1st, with supporters and opponents of Ames citing various legal authorities to support their positions that Ames should or should not be considered an inhabitant of Mississippi in the constitutional meaning of the term. A more severe view was expressed by several Democratic senators who questioned the validity of the election itself. Garrett Davis of Kentucky charged that since Ames as military governor had overseen the election of the legislators who later elected him senator, Quote, that legislature, the men who composed it, were the creatures of General Ames, unquote. Will the Senate, he asked, enact the solemn farce of admitting here a man thus appointed by his own military chieftain and sent here by a legislature selected by himself, 
and whose action in the election of senator was controlled by himself. When word of the Senate's wrangling reached Mississippi, the legislature adopted a resolution, which arrived in Washington on March 31st, assuring the Senate that the election of Ames had been legal and urging that he be seated immediately. Perhaps convinced by this message, the Senate finally acted on April 1st. It first voted 40 to 12 to amend the Judiciary Committee's resolution, striking the word not, and then voted to seat Ames. He immediately came forward and took the oaths of office. Conclusion Differences among Republicans over Reconstruction continued to plague the party at both the state and national levels. In the Senate, five Republicans, including Conklin and Judiciary Committee Chairman Trumbull, cast their votes against Ames, thus reflecting the widening breach among party members over Reconstruction policies. Adelbert Ames served until 1874, when he resigned from the Senate and returned to Mississippi to become governor. There, his efforts to guarantee civil rights for all citizens met with tragic defeat. In 1875, a rejuvenated Democratic Party in the state used terror and violence to recapture the legislature. Threatened with impeachment by the hostile legislators, Ames resigned, left the state, and retired from politics. Returning to New York and Massachusetts, he accumulated great personal wealth, yet seemed always haunted by his experiences in Mississippi. Ames lived until 1933. End of Case 53 and of Section 55. Section 56 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 54, Hiram R. Revels, 1827 to 1901, Mississippi. Election case, February 23, 1870, to February 25, 1870. Issues, Reconstruction, Qualifications, Citizenship. Chronology, Credentials presented February 23, 1870. Senate vote February 25, 1870. Result, seated. Background. When the credentials of Hiram Revels, Republican of Mississippi, were presented to the Senate on February 23, 1870, the occasion marked the first time that a black American entered the chamber to serve as a United States Senator. In earlier years, Revels, an ordained minister in the AME Church, distinguished himself with his educational work among slaves. Born into a free black family in North Carolina, Revels traveled widely as a teacher and chaplain in a variety of states. At the close of the Civil War, Revels moved to Mississippi, where he became active in Republican politics in 1868, serving in local government and then in the state legislature. In preparation for the state's readmission to the Union, which occurred on February 23, 1870, the Mississippi legislature elected Revels to a brief, unexpired term ending on March 3, 1871. For the other Senate seat, the legislature chose Adelbert Ames, Republican, who had been serving as the state's military governor. His credentials, too, were challenged. See Case 53. Statement of the Case. Revel's arrival in the Senate precipitated intense responses from two political camps. Radical Republicans, led by Henry Wilson and Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, warmly welcomed Revels. A second group, led by Democratic Senators Willard Salisbury of Delaware, Garrett Davis of Kentucky, and John Stockton of New Jersey, 
launched a bitter attack upon Revel's credentials. Response of the Senate. At the outset, the debate was cloaked in technical arguments. The challengers argued that Adelbert Ames, the provisional governor of Mississippi who had signed Revel's credentials, could not legitimately certify an election. This claim was quickly answered by senators pointing out that such provisional governors had signed election certificates for senators from a number of the recently reconstructed states. Opponents also contended that since the Supreme Court's 1857 Dred Scott decision ruled that those of African blood were not U.S. citizens, Revels had only become a citizen upon ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868. Thus, he had not held citizenship for the nine years required for a Senate seat. Revels' supporters countered that both the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 14th Amendment stated that all persons born in the United States are citizens. In addition, Henry Wilson pointed out that, quote, as a citizen of Ohio more than 20 years ago, Revels was a voter and voted in that state, unquote. The nature of the discussion quickly shifted from these technicalities to the subject of Revels' race. Senators exchanged stinging rounds of racial insults and inflammatory rhetoric stretching over two days of debate. Although badly outnumbered in the Senate, the small band of Democrats argued fiercely against seating the Mississippi senator. Finally, on February 25, 1870, the Senate voted not to refer the matter to the Judiciary Committee, and by a second party-line vote of 48 to 8, accepted the credentials of Hiram Revels. He then came forward to take the oaths of office and took his seat as the first black member of the United States Senate. Conclusion Hiram Revels made his initial Senate speech less than a month later, on March 16, 1870, in opposition to a bill readmitting Georgia without sufficient protection for the rights of black citizens. The galleries overflowed with black people who came to hear the historic first oration of the Mississippi senator. For the rest of his term, Revels was a quiet worker on the Committees on Education and Labor and the District of Columbia, supporting such issues as integration of the D.C. public schools. When his term expired in March 1871, Revels returned to Mississippi to become president of Alcorn University. He died in 1901. End of Case 54 and of Section 56. Section 57 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 55. Ossian B. Hart, 1821 to 1874, versus Abijah Gilbert, 1806 to 1881, Florida. Election case, April 1, 1870 to April 28, 1870. Issues. Reconstruction. Challenge to legislature's authority to elect. Right of a challenger in contested election to address the Senate. Chronology. Credentials presented April 1, 1870. Referred to committee April 1, 1870. Committee report April 13, 1870. Senate vote April 28, 1870. Result, Gilbert retained seat. Background. Successful maneuvers in 1868 to seat Florida's first two post-Civil War senators did not end the controversy over that state's representation in Congress. 
Shortly after selecting Adonijah Welch and Thomas Osborne, see Case 51, the Florida legislature picked Abijah Gilbert, Republican, for the full term beginning in March 1869. He would succeed Welch, whose term was to expire seven months after he arrived in Washington. Gilbert was a New York businessman and committed abolitionist who moved to Florida after the Civil War because of poor health. There, he participated actively in Reconstruction efforts. The Senate therefore seated him without incident in March 1869. All three Florida Senate elections took place after the passage of the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, but before adoption of the June 1868 Act declaring Florida entitled to representation in Congress. Political opponents took advantage of this latter fact to challenge the validity of Gilbert's election. In January 1870, the legislature, splintered by political factionalism, decided to vote again for the term that had begun in March 1869. This time, it bypassed the main contenders and elected Florida Supreme Court Justice Ossian B. Hart, Republican, a native Floridian who, although a former slaveholder, was a staunch advocate of black suffrage. An opponent of secession, Hart had suffered persecution for his views. Statement of the Case on April 1, 1870, Florida Senator Thomas Osborne presented the credentials of Ossian B. Hart for the seat already held by Abijah Gilbert. In his remarks, Osborne indicated that, while he believed Gilbert had been elected legally to the Senate, some Florida officials expressed doubts about that 1868 election. Hart and his supporters based their protest upon alleged irregularities in the observance of the 1866 law regulating senatorial elections. The Senate referred the challenge to the Judiciary Committee. Response of the Senate On April 13, 1870, the Judiciary Committee returned a report favorable to Abijah Gilbert. The committee ruled that when Congress recognized the Florida state government, it validated any actions that government had taken since the time of its organization. In electing Gilbert, the committee determined, the legislature had acted in conformity with the procedures established by Congress in the 1866 Act regulating the times and manner of holding elections for senators in Congress. This report failed to resolve the matter. On April 15, Judiciary Committee Chairman Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, presented a petition from Ossian Hart, contending that the Judiciary Committee's report did not correctly present the facts and requesting an opportunity to appear before the Senate to plead his case. Although he submitted the petition as a favor to Hart, Trumbull declined to participate further in the matter because he disapproved of the precedent set in an 1851 election challenge from Florida when the claimant, David U. Lee, was granted two hours to address the Senate, see Case 24. The question of a claimant's right to speak on the Senate floor generated a brief debate about the difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives, which permitted claimants to address the members. Because representatives were chosen by popular vote, cases there were often more complicated and the contestants needed a chance to explain. In the case of Senate elections, the necessary information was usually incorporated in the documentation of the state legislature's action. At the conclusion of the discussion, the Senate took no further action until April 28, 1870. On that day, Trumbull again read the report of the Judiciary Committee. 
deciding that the Florida problems were caused by ambiguities in the law and by the confusion of Reconstruction, the Senate permitted Abijah Gilbert to retain his seat. Ossian Hart received mileage and the pay of a senator for one month. Conclusion Abijah Gilbert served until the end of his term in 1875. He then returned to his birthplace in New York, where he died in 1881. Ossian Hart retained his seat on the Florida Supreme Bench. In 1872, Hart, who managed to establish good relations with both black Republicans and white conservatives in Florida, was elected governor. Having injured his health during the campaign, however, he died in 1874. End of Case 55 and of Section 57. Section 58 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 56, George Goldthwaite, 1809-1879, Alabama. Election Case, February 6, 1871, to January 9, 1872. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect. Chronology, Credentials Presented, February 6, 1871. Referred to Committee, March 13, 1871. Committee Report, March 20, 1871. Senate Vote, January 9, 1872. Result, Seated. Background. The rancor and mistrust that divided Congress during the Reconstruction period gathered force as the years passed, and many senators greeted with suspicion and hostility those arriving with credentials from former Confederate states. Boston-born George Goldthwaite moved to Alabama as a young man and built a career there as a lawyer. During the Civil War, he served as the state's adjutant general. In 1870, the legislature elected him as a Democrat to the United States Senate. Statement of the Case George Goldthwaite's credentials were presented on February 6, 1871, for the term to begin March 4. Before he could be seated, however, members of the Alabama legislature submitted a protest charging that the legislators voting for Goldthwaite included some who had been fraudulently elected, one who had no certificate of election, and several who were still under political disabilities. On March 13, 1871, the Senate sent the credentials with the petition of protest to the newly established Committee on Privileges and Elections, which also received contests from Georgia, Texas, and North Carolina that same day, cases 57, 58, and 59. Response of the Senate. Convinced that the circumstances surrounding the contested election in Alabama were identical to the case of Georgia's Floster Blodgett, see case 57, and, acutely conscious of the workload of cases it faced, the committee on March 20th reported jointly on the two cases, explaining that there was not sufficient time remaining in the brief congressional session that would end on April 20th to conduct a proper investigation into the charges. The committee recommended that both Goldthwaite and Blodgett be permitted to take their seats while the investigation continued, since they presented proper credentials and were not under any disability for pre-war and wartime activities. This proposal prompted a lengthy and convoluted debate as senators spoke about both the Goldthwaite and the Blodgett elections. Committee member Alan Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, who wanted the cases considered separately, argued for seating Goldthwaite. 
He complained that the state legislators appeared to have extended their challenge beyond the election of George Goldthwaite to contest the election of every member of the Alabama legislature. The questions they raised regarding procedural legalities, election conduct, and qualifying certificates threatened to embrace the entire voting population of Alabama and delay a decision in the case for the next six years. Thurman stressed the long-standing precedent that where a member of this body is elected by a legislature competent to elect him and presents proper credentials, the Senate would accept this as prima facie evidence of his right to a seat, seating the claimant so that the state would not be deprived of representation. The investigation could then be pursued afterwards. Thurman believed that the Democrat, Goldthwaite, was clearly elected by the appropriate body and thus should be allowed to take his seat. At the same time, he argued that Georgia's Blodgett, a Republican, had not been elected by a legislature with the power to elect for that term and thus should not be admitted. Republican senators, however, expressed concern about the political conditions in Alabama portrayed in the legislators' protest. John Sherman, Republican of Ohio, cited the allegation that, quote, by organized force and violence extending over large regions of the state of Alabama, the local authority was subverted and that no elections were held in certain counties, unquote. On April 11th, the Senate tabled the matter until the next session. When Congress reconvened in December 1871, the arrival of a properly elected senator from Georgia paved the way for the Senate to refuse to seat Foster Blodgett. With that case eliminated, the Senate was able to move ahead on the credentials of George Goldthwaite. On January 9, 1872, the Senate agreed to accept Goldthwaite's credentials while the committee continued its investigation, and he took his seat on January 15, 1872. The committee made no subsequent report on the matter, and the Senate took no further action. Conclusion the attempt to consolidate challenged elections from different states proved a failure in the cases of George Goldthwaite and Floster Blodgett. With the Senate already confused and divided, combining the cases only complicated the floor debates. Not until it disposed of the Blodgett credentials by seating a different claimant could the Senate resolve the Alabama case. George Goldthwaite served in the Senate until 1877 and died two years later. End of Case 56 and of Section 58. Section 59 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 57, Thomas M. Norwood, 1830-1913, versus Foster Blodgett, Jr., 1826-1877, Georgia. Election case, March 2, 1871, to December 19, 1871. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect, Qualifications, Corruption. Chronology. Petition received March 2, 1871. Referred to Committee March 13, 1871. Committee Report March 20, 1871. Credentials presented Norwood, December 4, 1871. Referred to Committee December 11, 1871. Committee Report, December 18, 1871. Senate Vote, December 19, 1871. Result, Norwood seated. Background. 
as governance of the South under Reconstruction became mired in factionalism and political and economic corruption, emotional charges and countercharges often overwhelmed the legal issues. The Senate, splintered by disagreements about Reconstruction policies, found the disputes surrounding senatorial elections both tedious and frustrating. In one effort to expedite matters, a Senate committee in 1871 decided to link debate about two election cases, one from Georgia and one from Alabama. Rather than ensuring a speedy resolution, however, this approach simply confused the proceedings. Statement of the case. On January 20, 1871, the credentials of Georgian Foster Blodgett, Jr., Republican, were presented for a term to begin March 4, 1871. In late February, Homer V. M. Miller, Democrat, who had defeated Blodgett in the 1868 election, was seated after two years of delay for the few days remaining in the term that ended on March 3rd. Thus, the discussions in the Blodgett case followed soon after those in the long-running Georgia case of Miller and Joshua Hill, Republican, who finally took his oath for the other Georgia seat on February 1st. See Case 52. In response to a March 2nd petition from members of the Georgia legislature protesting Blodgett's claim, he was not sworn in and his credentials were ordered to lie on the table. The petition cited three formal grievances against Blodgett, that he was chosen by a legislature not competent to elect, that he was elected at a time not in accord with the legal election schedule, and that there was no quorum present in the State House of Representatives at the time of the voting. On March 13th, shortly after the new Congress convened, the Senate sent the credentials and the protest to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, which had been established three days earlier, to relieve the Judiciary Committee of the growing burden of reviewing such contests four of which were referred to committee on this same day. See cases 56, 58, and 59. Response of the Senate. One week later, on March 20th, the committee, concerned about the volume of cases and pleading lack of time to conduct a full investigation, issued a report recommending that both Foster Blodgett and George Goldthwaite of Alabama see Case 56, be seated while the investigations continued, since their credentials were in proper form. Combining the two cases, however, only complicated the debate, when committee members Joshua Hill, the other Florida senator, and Alan Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, urged separate consideration of the two claims because they supported seating Goldthwaite but not Blodgett. Thurman argued that Blodgett had not been elected by the legislature closest to the time of the vacancy. Hill spoke at length in opposition to seating Blodgett. He charged that the legislature elected in 1868 had deliberately usurped authority that should belong to the one elected in December 1870 by postponing the convening of the new legislature from January until November 1871. The delay was designed to prevent election of a U.S. senator for the term beginning in March 1871, thus allowing Blodgett, the candidate chosen by the old legislature, to be seated. Hill considered this an outrageous power grab against the incoming legislature, which he noted had been chosen in a peaceful election. Blodgett had been elected by the same 1868 legislature, as reorganized in January 1870, that had also sent Richard Whiteley and Henry Farrow to the Senate 
as unsuccessful claimants for the seats of Miller and Hill in the earlier Georgia case, Case 52. Joshua Hill then submitted a series of documents from Georgia challenging Blodgett's fitness to serve in the Senate. It was charged that when the 1868 legislature reorganized, as required by the December 1869 federal law, Blodgett had manipulated the process to block the seating of those unlikely to vote for him as U.S. Senator and to replace them with others favorable to him. The documents also attacked the Georgia Republicans' record during and after the Civil War. They claimed that Blodgett, the mayor of Augusta in the early 1860s, had served voluntarily as a captain in the Confederate Army. Then, in 1865, he had secured the office of postmaster by swearing the required post-war test oath that he had never borne arms against the United States. When Blodgett was indicted for perjury, he denied having taken the oath, and his lawyers managed to have the indictment quashed for lack of evidence by postponing the trial until after the death of the official who had administered the oath. Blodgett explained that he had actually been able to obtain the post without swearing because federal authorities, confused by the name similarity, had administered the oath to his son, E.F. Blodgett. Blodgett's detractors further insisted that $940,000 of state funds had disappeared during his administration of a state-owned railroad and that he had bribed legislators to vote for him in the Senate election. Calling the charges the most extraordinary attack I have ever heard made on any individual in this body before, William Stewart, Republican of Nevada, countered that they were simply political fabrications invented by Blodgett's enemies because he had boldly supported the unpopular Republican Reconstruction policies throughout Georgia. Many senators were clearly uncomfortable with having such defamatory remarks aired on the Senate floor and quickly reverted to discussing the legality of the election. On April 20th, the short first session of the 42nd Congress ended and the Blodgett affair was tabled until the next session. When Congress reconvened on December 4, 1871, the controversy intensified with the presentation of credentials for Thomas M. Norwood, Democrat. The Georgia legislature that was elected in 1870 had finally convened in November 1871 and had elected him to the same Senate term claimed by Blodgett. A Georgia native, Norwood was a lawyer and state legislator. On December 11th, the Senate referred the new credentials to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, which returned its report a week later. Avoiding the allegations lodged against Blodgett personally, the committee focused on the clear-cut issue of the legality of the election. The election law passed by Congress in 1866 stated that a U.S. senator should be elected by the state legislature that was chosen next preceding the expiration of the previous senator's term. Foster Blodgett was elected on February 15, 1870, by a legislature that had been elected in April 1868. A new legislature was elected in December 1870, prior to the March 1871 expiration of the previous Senate term, making it the legislature with the legal right to choose the next senator. This legislature had elected Thomas Norwood, and the committee therefore recommended that Norwood be seated. The Senate agreed, and Thomas Norwood took the oaths of office on December 19, 1871. Conclusion. 
because the Senate had been reluctant to reject Blodgett and leave the state with a vacant seat, it had become enmeshed in endless legal arguments about the validity of the legislature that elected him. The arrival of a new claimant, clearly chosen in conformity with the letter of the 1866 election law, provided a non-controversial escape from the dilemma. It also relieved the Senate of the need to consider the charges against Blodgett's character. On January 9, 1872, the Senate agreed to pay Foster Blodgett the per diem and mileage of a senator for the nine months he waited for a decision. Blodgett, who had managed a political metamorphosis from Confederate officer to radical Republican, became an outcast when the Democrats returned to power in Georgia. In 1876, he was arrested for embezzlement tied to his administration of the state railroad. He died in 1877. Thomas Norwood served in the Senate until 1877, and in 1885 he was elected to the House of Representatives. An advocate of rebuilding the economy of the South through industrial growth, Norwood led the movement for the construction of the Southern Pacific Railroad. He died in 1913. End of Case 57 and of Section 59. Section 60 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 58. Joseph J. Reynolds, 1822-1899, to versus Morgan C. Hamilton, 1809-1893, to Texas. Election case, March 3, 1871, to March 18, 1871. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect. Chronology, Credentials Presented, March 3, 1871. Referred to Committee, March 13, 1871. Committee Report, March 18, 1871. Senate Vote, March 18, 1871. Result, Hamilton seated. Background. In November 1869, Texas ratified a new state constitution that permitted blacks to vote, and on March 30, 1870, Congress readmitted the state to representation for the first time since 1861. The next day, Credentials were presented for Morgan C. Hamilton, Republican, elected to fill the vacancy in the term ending on March 3, 1871. Hamilton, whose brother, Andrew Jackson Hamilton, had served as provisional governor until the election of 1870, was sworn in without incident for the brief term. His Texas colleague, James W. Flanagan, Republican, was also seated. On the same day it conducted the two Senate elections, the legislature also elected Hamilton to the full Senate term beginning March 4, 1871. Statement of the Case When Morgan Hamilton's credentials for the new term were presented on July 13, 1870, the Senate tabled them until the beginning of the next Congress. On March 3, 1871, the day before Hamilton's new term began, the credentials of Joseph J. Reynolds were presented for the same seat. The legislature had elected him at its second session in January 1871. Reynolds, who as military commander of Texas had manipulated the 1870 gubernatorial election to ensure the defeat of A.J. Hamilton by the radical Republican candidate, claimed that the legislature elected Morgan Hamilton before the passage of the act declaring Texas 
entitled to representation, thus making the selection illegal. On March 13th, the Senate sent both sets of credentials to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, along with contests from Georgia, Alabama, and North Carolina, cases 56, 57, and 59. Response of the Senate. Unlike some other contested Reconstruction elections, the Texas dispute came to a speedy conclusion. On March 18th, the Committee on Privileges and Elections returned a report favorable to Hamilton. The committee dismissed Reynolds' argument that his later election by the State Assembly superseded Hamilton's, basing its conclusion upon the precedent set in the similar case of Florida Senator Abijah Gilbert, see Case 55. In that instance, the Senate had determined that the act admitting the state to representation ratified the actions previously taken by the legislature it approved. A relieved Senate quickly accepted the Florida precedent and adopted the committee's recommendation by voice vote without debate. Hamilton took the prescribed oaths and was seated on March 20, 1871. Conclusion Morgan C. Hamilton served only one term in the Senate. After traveling extensively, he settled in Brooklyn, New York. He died in 1893. End of Case 58 and of Section 60section sixty one of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases seventeen ninety three to nineteen ninety by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case fifty nine Joseph C. Abbott eighteen twenty five to eighteen eighty one versus Zebulon B. Vance eighteen thirty to eighteen ninety four and Matt W. Ransom. 1826 to 1904, North Carolina, election case, March 7, 1871 to April 24, 1872, issues, reconstruction, qualifications, disability under 14th Amendment, challenge to legislature's authority to elect, Senate refused to seat losing candidate if winner disqualified, chronology, Abbott versus Vance, Memorial presented March 7, 1871. Referred to committee March 13, 1871. Committee report February 28, 1872. Senate vote April 23, 1872. Result not seated. Ransom. Credentials presented February 5, 1872. Referred to committee February 5, 1872. Committee report April 24, 1872. Senate vote April 24, 1872. Result seated. Background As the Reconstruction era waned and the dominance of the radicals declined, Senate Republicans began increasingly to splinter over the treatment of senators elected from the former Confederate states. This factionalism became particularly apparent during Senate consideration of a contested North Carolina election. New Hampshire native Joseph C. Abbott, a former brigadier general in the Union Army and steadfast Republican, settled in North Carolina after the war. When the state first returned to Congress in 1868, he was elected to the United States Senate. A hard-working advocate for North Carolina, particularly for the Wilmington Harbor area, Abbott nonetheless had political strength only among the state's black voters. By 1870, white supremacy groups had so far suppressed black suffrage that the state legislature easily chose Zebulon B. Vance, Democrat, who had been the state's governor during the Civil War, over Abbott for the Senate term beginning in March 1871. Statement of the Case Abbott immediately challenged the results of the election, 
pointing out that Vance was still hampered by political disabilities imposed under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution because of his support for the Confederacy. Abbott maintained that if the electors knew that the winning candidate was disqualified from serving in the Senate, then those votes should be voided and the election granted to the person with the next highest count. No credentials were presented for Vance, a North Carolinian who had served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1858 to 1861 and then fought for the Confederacy before being elected governor of the state in 1862. Vance had received a pardon in 1867 under President Andrew Johnson's amnesty program, but the 14th Amendment, adopted in 1868, prohibited service in Congress by anyone who had been a member of Congress and then engaged in rebellion against the United States. Vance had not been relieved of this disability at the time of his election. On March 13, 1871, the Senate referred Abbott's complaint to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, together with contests from three other states, cases 56, 57, and 58. Response of the Senate. Nearly a year later, on February 28, 1872, a divided committee returned a report recommending that Abbott was not entitled to a seat in the Senate since he had received only a small minority of the votes cast in the state legislature. In the meantime, apparently convinced that Congress would not remove his political disability, Vance had submitted his resignation from the Senate on January 20, 1872. Abbott and his supporters had drawn upon examples in English law applicable to contested elections, in which the votes for an ineligible candidate were not counted, and the candidate with the next highest number of votes was declared elected. The committee pointed out, however, that the practice in the United States was to declare such an election void, rather than to grant the seat to a competitor. In addition, the 14th Amendment gave Congress the power to remove the disabilities from an individual elected to office and thus permit him to take his seat. As precedents, the majority report cited such previous Senate qualifications cases as those of Albert Gallatin, Case 1, and James Shields, Case 32, to show that when the Senate ruled the claimants ineligible, it called for a new election, rather than giving the election to the defeated candidate. Committee member John A. Logan, Republican of Illinois, noted that even in the case of David U. Lee, Case 24, where U. Lee received half the votes of the Florida legislature and the other half were blank, the Senate refused to seat Yulee and called for a new election. Yulee had claimed victory because he had a majority of the non-blank votes, but under a rule of the Florida legislature, a majority of all the votes was required to elect. Logan also pointed out that even if the North Carolina legislators voting for Vance knew he was disqualified, they also knew that Congress had removed the disabilities from the state's governor and several other officials after they were elected, and they could therefore reasonably assume it would do the same for Vance. Even John Poole, Republican, the other North Carolina senator, was under the impression that Congress would remove Vance's disabilities. According to Logan, under the 1866 election law, a candidate must receive a majority of all the votes cast in each house of the legislature, even if some votes were for an ineligible person. Abbott, he declared, had received less than one-third of the votes in the North Carolina House and less than one-fourth of the votes in the Senate and thus clearly had not been elected by the North Carolina legislature. Abbott supporters Matthew R. Carpenter, Republican of Wisconsin, 
and Benjamin F. Rice, Republican of Arkansas, submitted a minority report asserting that under federal election law, a candidate needed only to receive a majority of the votes cast in each house of the legislature, rather than the votes of a majority of the legislators present. Thus, if the votes for Vance were disqualified, Abbott, having received a majority of the remaining votes cast in each house, should be considered elected, even without receiving the votes of a majority of the full legislature as required by the 1866 election law. The minority report dismissed as irrelevant the previous qualification cases cited by the majority because in the Gallatin and Shields cases, the legislators voted for the candidates in the belief that they were eligible. The legislators voting for Vance, however, knew that he was ineligible and thus were deliberately throwing away their votes. The minority report therefore recommended that Abbott be seated. The debate continued for several days in April as complex discussions about the meaning of majority and minority candidates, equal suffrage, blank votes, and voided votes, frayed senatorial tempers and further divided the Republicans. Underlying the legal arguments was the strong suspicion by some Republican senators, as George F. Edmonds of Vermont complained, that, quote, the legislature of North Carolina intended to pronounce an insult upon the people of the United States who did not agree with them in politics by electing the particular person the majority voted for, unquote. In fact, Matthew Carpenter cited affidavits stating that North Carolina legislators had heard Democratic and conservative members declare Quote, we vote for Vance because his disabilities have not been removed. We have eaten dirt long enough, unquote. North Carolina Republican John Poole reinforced this view, reporting that, quote, members were allowed seats in the legislature who were notoriously and confessedly under the disability imposed by the 14th Amendment, unquote. Many citizens of the state, he believed, would be delighted to have Abbott seated as a rebuke to the legislature, and a number of Senate Republicans agreed. On April 23, 1872, the Senate finally accepted the committee report, agreeing that, as Joseph Abbott did not have a majority of the votes cast in the North Carolina Assembly, he could not claim the seat. The Senate did, however, vote him compensation and mileage for the year he had waited for a decision. Conclusion In denying the seat to Abbott, the Senate accepted the premise that, if it chose, it could have removed the disabilities of Zebulon Vance after his election, a procedure that had been followed for officials elected by several other southern states. On February 5, 1872, while the Senate was still wrestling with the dilemma of turning out the well-liked and effective Abbott, Matt W. Ransom, Democrat, had appeared with credentials for the disputed seat, having been elected to replace Vance. Unlike Vance, Ransom, a former brigadier general in the Confederate Army, had not served in Congress before the war and thus was not hampered by the same disability. The Senate referred his credentials to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. On April 24, 1872, the committee reported that Ransom's credentials were in order. He was immediately seated and granted his pay from the beginning of the term in March 1871. All three of the North Carolina politicians in this case continued to serve in public life. Joseph Abbott, who earlier demonstrated his concern for the harbor at Wilmington, accepted an appointment as inspector of ports under President Rutherford B. Hayes. Abbott died in 1882. 
Zebulon Vance eventually came to the Senate in 1879 and served until his death in 1894. Matt Ransom remained in the Senate until 1895 and died in 1904. End of Case 59 and of Section 61. Section 62 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 60, Powell Clayton, 1833 to 1914, Arkansas. Censure Case. January 9, 1872 to March 25, 1873. Issues. Charges of corruption prior to members' Senate term. Chronology. Referred to committee, January 9, 1872. Committee report, February 26, 1872. Senate vote, March 25, 1873. Result. Not censured. Background. Arkansas had elected Pennsylvania native and former Union officer Powell Clayton as governor under the new Constitution a few months before the state re-entered the Union in 1868. After first using the militia to restore order in the state, Clayton over the next three years built a record of achievement. His administration funded the state debt, expanded the railroads, and overhauled the public school system, incorporating special provisions for deaf and blind students. He was also, however, a highly partisan and controversial politician. During Clayton's Reconstruction governorship, the Arkansas Republican Party splintered into at least three factions the dominant radical carpetbaggers of his regime, a dissident faction of reformers, and the native unionists known as liberal Republicans. When Clayton was elected to the United States Senate in 1871, the bitterness engendered by this local factionalism followed him to Washington. Statement of the Case Powell Clayton, Republican, began his Senate service on March 4, 1871. The following January, the Joint Select Committee to inquire into the condition of the late insurrectionary states notified the Senate that it had heard testimony raising questions about Clayton's behavior and integrity as governor. The committee judged the issue to be beyond the scope of its jurisdiction and turned the matter over to the Senate for disposition. A former United States District Attorney had testified to the Joint Select Committee that in April 1871, after Clayton became a U.S. Senator, a grand jury had indicted him. The charge was that as governor, Clayton had issued fraudulent election credentials for the U.S. House of Representatives to John Edwards, liberal Republican, whose opponent had allegedly received the most votes. Since Clayton and Edwards supported opposing factions in the Republican-dominated legislature, the district attorney speculated that Governor Clayton had traded political favors in return for votes from his opponents in the election for U.S. Senator. In response to these allegations, Clayton contended that in eight precincts there had been two separate sets of polls, one set overseen by authorized judges and the other under the unauthorized auspices of the Reform Faction. The state Supreme Court, made up of Clayton supporters, had ruled that the legal election had been conducted at the authorized polling places and that the returns from the others were fraudulent. As governor, Clayton had then discarded the returns from the bogus election and certified the candidate who won with the genuine votes. The opposing candidate, Thomas Bowles, Republican, 
successfully contested the election, however, and on February 9, 1872, he replaced Edwards in the House. Response of the Senate At Clayton's request, the Senate on January 9, 1872, appointed a special three-member committee to investigate the events in Arkansas. On June 10, after taking testimony for five months, questioning 38 witnesses, and generating 5,000 pages of transcript, the committee issued a partial report asserting that fairness to Clayton demanded that a response be given before the session closed. The committee indicated that the testimony received appeared not to sustain the charges against Clayton, but that the committee members would need to review the testimony more thoroughly and issue a final report in the next session. According to the committee report, the charges came from Clayton's bitter political opponents. The committee noted that the indictment against Clayton had subsequently been dropped for lack of evidence. After the preliminary report, the committee continued its investigation and, on February 26, 1873, issued a final report declaring that the testimony failed to sustain the charges against Powell Clayton. There was no evidence that Clayton had any fraudulent intent in certifying the election of Edwards as directed by the state Supreme Court. Another allegation had declared that when Clayton was first elected to the Senate in January 1871, he had declined to serve because he would have been succeeded as governor by James M. Johnson, the lieutenant governor, who was a political opponent. After failing to oust Johnson from his post, Clayton, it was charged, then arranged for the Secretary of State of Arkansas to resign so that Johnson could be appointed Secretary of State a more lucrative position. Thus, when Clayton was again elected to the Senate in March 1871 and stepped down as governor, he was succeeded by the Republican president pro tempore of the state Senate, one of his supporters, rather than by the former lieutenant governor. According to the committee majority, this arrangement to keep the governorship in politically friendly hands was neither criminal nor corrupt. The committee also reported that the evidence reviewed did not establish any conspiracy regarding Clayton's election to the Senate. Thomas Norwood, Democrat of Georgia, submitted a lengthy minority report setting forth in detail the background of the charges against Clayton. Norwood contended the evidence showed that Clayton had, in fact, secured votes from legislators by giving them lucrative offices and that he had paid the Secretary of State to resign in order to make possible the appointment of Johnson. The Senate took up the report on March 24, 1873 voting down a Democratic effort to delay consideration until the next session because of the massive volume of evidence. During the special session of the 43rd Congress, the Senate had already been occupied with a lengthy case of electoral misconduct, Case 61, that had left little time for other matters. On March 25th, Thomas Norwood took the floor to reiterate his concerns, especially about the payment made to the Secretary of State after he resigned. George G. Wright, Republican of Iowa, the chairman of the special committee, responded that Clayton's supporters held a large majority in the legislature, making bribery or official influence unnecessary to secure his election. He also noted that the Secretary of State received nothing from Clayton in return for resigning. The charge had arisen because Clayton had passed along to the former secretary funds raised by others to compensate him for financial losses incurred when he alienated some business associates in the course of his official duties.
Convinced by Wright and by Clayton's own testimony, the Senate voted 33 to 6 to accept the committee's resolution that the charges affecting the official character and conduct of Powell Clayton were not sustained. Nine senators, most of them Democrats, announced that they would abstain from voting because they had been given insufficient time to review all the testimony. Conclusion The crumbling of the Arkansas Republican Party enabled the state's Democratic conservatives in 1874 to gain sufficient power to prepare and have ratified a more conservative state constitution. When Democratic representatives elected under the new constitution arrived in Washington, Powell Clayton demanded an investigation in an unsuccessful effort to prevent their seating. Clayton completed his Senate service in 1877 and returned to Arkansas. From 1897 to 1905, he served as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. He died in Washington, D.C. in 1914 and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. End of Case 60 and of Section 62. Section 63 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990 by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 61. Samuel C. Pomeroy, 1816 to 1891, and Alexander Caldwell, 1830 to 1917, Kansas. Election case, expulsion case. March 5, 1872 to March 24, 1873. Issues, electoral misconduct, bribery, and corruption. Chronology, Pomeroy. Resolution submitted March 5, 1872. Referred to committee, April 8, 1872. Committee report, June 3, 1872. Referred to committee, February 10, 1873. Committee report, March 3, 1873. Result, not expelled, Pomeroy's term ended. Caldwell, referred to committee May 11, 1872. Committee report, February 17, 1873. Resignation, March 24, 1873. Result, not expelled, Caldwell resigned. Background, in Kansas during the 1860s and 1870s, commercial and political interests remained closely entwined, as they had been in the territorial period. The free-wheeling style of Kansas politics affected the United States Senate, as rumors of bribes and corruption marred the senatorial elections of Samuel C. Pomeroy, Republican, in 1867, and Alexander Caldwell, Republican, in 1871. Pomeroy, who had been born and educated in Massachusetts, settled in Kansas in the 1850s. A powerful, radical Republican and a friend to railroad interests, he had represented the state in the U.S. Senate since its admission to the Union in 1861. Caldwell was a wealthy railroad entrepreneur and a political novice at the time of his election. Statement of the Case In 1872, Samuel Pomeroy became aware that within a few weeks, the Kansas legislature planned to submit to the Senate its findings in an investigation of his 1867 election. On March 5th, he moved that all such communications be forwarded to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. On April 8th, the anticipated documents relating to his election in 1867 and Caldwell's in 1871 arrived and were sent to the committee. The charges were essentially the same against both Pomeroy and Caldwell. 
witnesses accused each of using money to secure votes. Pomeroy's opponents maintained that he paid members of the state legislature to vote for him, while Caldwell's detractors declared that he both bought votes and paid other candidates to remove themselves from the contest. On May 11, 1872, the Senate authorized the committee to investigate the charges and to call the necessary witnesses. Response of the Senate On May 21st, the committee convened to begin its hearings, but before they could start, Alexander Caldwell appeared and requested an early disposition of his case. Pleading insufficient time remaining in the congressional session to investigate both cases, the committee, however, chose to deal first with the charges against Pomeroy. Pomeroy. On June 3, the Committee on Privileges and Elections reported in favor of Samuel Pomeroy. It found no evidence to support the allegations and asked to be discharged from further inquiries into Pomeroy's election conduct. The session of Congress concluded on June 10th with no consideration of the Caldwell case. The cloud of scandal still hung over Pomeroy, however. When he unsuccessfully sought re-election in January 1873, he faced renewed allegations of bribery and corruption from both houses of the Kansas legislature and was actually arrested for bribery. When Pomeroy returned to Washington in February 1873, having had his trial postponed, he publicly denied any wrongdoing. At his request, the Senate on February 10th established a special five-member committee to investigate the new charges against him. The committee conducted a week of public hearings, calling a parade of witnesses from Kansas. The testimony received related a melodramatic tale of a midnight rendezvous in Pomeroy's private suite at a Topeka hotel, attended by the senator and state legislator Alexander M. York, a $2,000 down payment for York's vote, a locked valise stuffed with a $5,000 post-vote installment, and an emotional anti-Pomeroy speech delivered by York as he displayed the cash to members of the state convention during the senatorial election. York testified that he had conspired with four colleagues to defeat Pomeroy by accepting a bribe from the senator and then exposing the action to the legislature just prior to the vote for U.S. Senator. The plot had succeeded, for the legislators responded by changing their votes and electing another candidate. Pomeroy did not deny giving the money to the legislator, but claimed that York, a longtime political opponent, was going to deliver it to a mutual friend who was establishing a bank at Independence, Kansas. As the inquiry progressed, testimony from both the defendant and his accusers became shrouded in contradictions, evasions, and faulty memories. The only clear fact to emerge was that the 1873 Kansas elections had been conducted under unsavory circumstances. Newspapers across the country covered the story in all its lurid detail, fueling the public's perception that Congress was rife with corruption. With all the witnesses tainted, the special committee remained uncertain about its verdict. When it issued its report on March 3rd at the conclusion of the 42nd Congress, the three Republican committee members, Frederick Frelinghuysen, New Jersey, William Buckingham, Connecticut, and James L. Alcorn, Mississippi, dismissed the entire transaction as a concerted and successful plot to defeat Pomeroy. Democrat George Vickers of Maryland did not find Pomeroy to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. 
He argued that the charges against Pomeroy should not be sustained because the accuser's deceit cast doubt on the accuracy of his testimony. Only Alan Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, submitted a brief minority report pronouncing Pomeroy guilty of making corrupt offers to secure votes. Thurman declined to elaborate, noting that the report was being issued on Pomeroy's final day in office. His defeat in the election saved him from discipline by his colleagues, and the Senate took no action on the committee's report. Caldwell. No brighter picture of Kansas election procedures greeted the Senate when it turned its attention to the report of the Committee on Privileges and Elections in the case of Alexander Caldwell. The most damaging testimony came from Sidney Clark, Caldwell's personal and professional foe. Prior to the election, Clark had been informed by Caldwell's associates that the candidate was determined to have the seat and was prepared to pay $250,000 for it. The only other serious candidate, Thomas Carney, a former governor of Kansas, admitted to the committee that he had accepted $15,000 to leave the race and assist in Caldwell's election. Even Caldwell's friends and political cronies acknowledged that after the election, the senator-elect told them the contest had cost him over $60,000. Caldwell did not enhance his position when he adopted an arrogant attitude toward the committee. Caldwell insisted that the charges were made by disappointed and ambitious politicians who were maliciously seeking his downfall. He then imprudently asked under what authority the Senate presumed to investigate him, to which the committee responded by returning a report that condemned the fraudulent manner in which Caldwell captured his seat. On February 17, 1873, the committee submitted a well-documented report unanimously concluding that Caldwell had bribed legislators to vote for him. After debating whether Caldwell's crimes warranted expulsion or a declaration of avoided election, the committee opted for the latter. It declared that Caldwell had not been duly and legally elected to the Senate. The many issues involved in the case, election procedures, party factionalism, expulsion, guaranteed a vigorous and lengthy floor debate when the special session of the new Senate convened on March 4th. Ultimately, it was Oliver H.P.T. Morton, Republican of Indiana, who destroyed Caldwell's already shaky defense. Morton pointed out four flaws in Caldwell's excuses. He had called his bribe to an opponent a private arrangement of no concern to the Senate. He claimed that bribery of state legislators was not a criminal offense. He doubted the Senate's right to make the inquiry, and he denied that the Senate could expel a member for actions taken before he entered that body. Morton's summary indicated how poorly Caldwell understood the Senate. He had sealed his doom by challenging the right of the Senate to govern its own affairs. He had apparently misjudged the situation from the outset. As the committee report noted in explaining, though not condoning, his actions, quote, he was a novice in politics and evidently in the hands of men who encouraged him in the belief that senatorial elections in Kansas were carried by the use of money, unquote. The focus of the debates shifted to the two options available to the Senate, expulsion or invalidation. Alan Thurman explained his view of the dilemma. Quote, I believe that this election is an invalid election. But, sir, my believing that does not preclude my voting to expel upon the same facts. 
because the turpitude of the member is equal in either case, and the expulsion will be for good cause and will be in the exercise of the legal discretion of the Senate. Unquote. Alexander Caldwell belatedly appeared to understand the power of the United States Senate. On March 24, 1873, before a vote could be taken, he resigned his seat. Conclusion The two cases illustrate the type of corruption much of the country believed to be widespread in the Reconstruction Congress. The Pomeroy case in particular was so dramatic that it even found its way into fiction. When Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner included a thinly disguised version of the story in their novel, The Gilded Age, published in December 1873. Samuel Pomeroy's Kansas trial for bribery was postponed several times until the prosecution finally dropped the case in 1875. Pomeroy remained in Washington for several years before returning to Massachusetts, where he died in 1891. Alexander Caldwell returned to his substantial business interests in Kansas. He became president of the First National Bank of Leavenworth in 1897 and died in 1917. End of Case 61 and of Section 63section 64 of united states senate election expulsion and censure cases 1793 to 1990 by ann m butler this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by joanne turner case 62 francis w sykes 1816 to 1883 versus george e spencer 1836 to 1893 Alabama. Election case, December 13, 1872 to May 20, 1876. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect, Rival Legislatures. Chronology, Credentials Presented, December 13, 1872. Referred to Committee, December 8, 1873. Committee Report, April 20th, 1874, Senate vote, May 28th, 1874, referred to committee, December 16th, 1875, committee report, May 20th, 1876, no Senate action, result, Spencer retained seat. Background. In 1872, Intense political fights in Alabama produced two separate bodies claiming to be the proper legislature, each of which elected a United States senator. One group, called the State House Legislature because it met in the state capitol, elected Democrat Francis W. Sykes, a physician. The action of this legislature was recognized by the outgoing Democratic governor, Robert B. Lindsay, although he did not sign any credentials. The second group, the Courthouse Legislature, elected Republican George E. Spencer, a native of New York and a former Union Army officer who had been serving in the Senate since 1868. This latter election was recognized by the incoming Republican governor, David P. Lewis, who signed the credentials for Spencer. Once again, intrastate discord in the wake of Reconstruction set the stage for dissension in the United States Senate. Statement of the Case At the special session of the Senate in March 1873, George Spencer and Francis Sykes claimed the same senatorial seat. When Spencer stepped forward to be sworn in on March 6th, James A. Bayer, Jr., Democrat of Delaware, objected, asking that both sets of credentials be sent to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Republican Roscoe Conkling of New York, however, urged the Senate to continue its usual practice 
of seating a senator who presented credentials that were on their face valid, and then allow the Committee on Privileges and Elections to conduct an investigation. Bayard insisted that the credentials for Sykes should be read to the Senate, along with those of Spencer, even though they were not in the proper form and not signed by the governor. Not all Democrats agreed, however, for others urged that Spencer be seated while the committee carried out its investigation so that Alabama would not be deprived of her right to representation upon the floor of the Senate. They felt particularly strongly in light of the recent case of Alabama's other senator, George Goldthwaite, Democrat, who had waited almost a year before finally being seated. See Case 56. Precedents were cited by senators to support each approach. After considerable debate, the Senate agreed to have the clerk read the credentials of Sykes, which were in the form of a memorial signed by the President of the Senate and Speaker of the House of the Legislature that elected him. During the debate, information arrived from Alabama that the state Supreme Court had recognized as the legitimate legislature the Courthouse General Assembly that elected Spencer. On March 7th, after further discussion, the Senate rejected two motions by Bayard that consideration of the case be postponed for another day, or that both sets of credentials be referred to a special five-member committee. George Goldthwaite, still smarting from the months he had been forced to wait before being sworn, supported the claim of Francis Sykes, urging that, at the very least, the two sets of credentials should be referred to a committee. The Senate, however, ignored his plea, and George Spencer came forward to take the oath of office. But the controversy continued. When the 43rd Congress convened in December 1873, John Gordon, Democrat of Georgia, requested that the memorial of Francis Sykes and the appropriate documents be referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Aware of continuing discord in Alabama, the Senate agreed. Response of the Senate On April 20, 1874, a divided committee submitted majority and minority reports. The committee had attempted to identify which of the two Alabama legislatures was the legitimate one, so that the seat could go to the senator it had elected. The State House body included a number of Democratic members who had election certificates, even though they had not been elected, while the courthouse group included the Republicans who had in fact, been elected to those seats, but had no certificates. Without the questionable members, the State House legislature would have had no quorum, and with those actually elected who had no certificates, the courthouse legislature did have a quorum. Subsequently, a compromise had been reached under the auspices of the U.S. Attorney General in which the conflicting legislatures were merged and the Republican legislators from the contested counties seated. According to the majority report, supported by all the Republicans on the committee, quote, were the Senate to hold Sykes's election to be valid, it would follow that erroneous certificates delivered to men conceded not to be elected had enabled persons who, in fact, ought not to vote for a senator to elect a senator to misrepresent the state for six years, unquote. The situation thus required them to choose between the form and the substance, arguing that the incoming legitimate governor, Lewis, recognized only the courthouse legislature the majority of the committee upheld the right of George Spencer to his place in the Senate. The two committee Democrats, Eli Salisbury of Delaware and William T. Hamilton of Maryland, 
protested vehemently, asserting that without the necessary qualifying certificates, the courthouse legislature constituted nothing more than an illegal gathering. They pointed out that although the two competing legislatures had subsequently been merged, that action had occurred a week or more after the elections for U.S. Senator were completed and should have no bearing on the validity of those elections. They also stressed the failure of those without certificates to take the appropriate steps to contest the election of those in the State House legislature. If the Senate granted the seat to Spencer, they hinted, it would raise suspicions of partisanship. During the ensuing debate, the background on the dual legislatures emerged. Oliver H.P.T. Morton, Republican of Indiana, the chairman of the Privileges and Elections Committee, charged that there had been a conspiracy to obtain a Democratic majority in the legislature. Among the details, an official in one county had issued an injunction against counting the votes for legislative candidates from that county. The uncounted votes were sufficient to have elected Republican candidates from that area, and the lack of those votes led to the election of their Democratic opponents. The Secretary of State promptly issued certificates of election to these Democratic legislators. Two days later, the injunction against counting the ballots was lifted, and county officials reported the Republican candidates as elected, but the Secretary of State refused to correct the certificates. There were allegations in other counties that large numbers of Republican votes had been illegally thrown out. After considerable emotional debate, the Senate acted on May 28, 1874. After defeating by a vote of 11 to 33, an amendment declaring that George Spencer had not been elected, the Senate by voice vote agreed with the majority report and permitted Spencer to retain his seat. But Spencer's troubles with his Senate seat did not end there. On December 16, 1875, Spencer asked the Senate to investigate charges made by a new and hostile Alabama legislature that he had secured his seat through corrupt means, and the Senate referred the matter to committee. On May 20, 1876, the Privileges and Elections Committee dismissed as worthless hearsay the allegations that Spencer offered money or any object of value in return for votes in the legislature. The committee asserted that those who claimed to have received money for their votes did not appear before it, and the admission of the second-hand testimony could only contribute to scandal while proving nothing. Although complaints of Republican malfeasance in the southern states multiplied during the Reconstruction years, in this instance, the committee did not consider them sufficiently substantiated to act upon. Conclusion In March 1876, at the recommendation of the Committee on Privileges and Elections, the Senate granted Francis Sykes the compensation of a senator from March 1873 to May 1874, while the case had been under consideration. That decision had been delayed for two years because some senators objected to the existing precedent that those unsuccessfully contesting a senatorial election should receive compensation, fearing it might encourage frivolous election challenges. Some also believed that Spencer and other senators who successfully defended their seats deserved to have their expenses paid as well, although such payments had never been made in the past. Sykes continued to live in Alabama until his death in 1883. In 1885, George Spencer sought and received more than $7,000 from the Senate 
as compensation for his expenses incurred during the corruption investigation. Spencer remained in the Senate until 1879, after which he became commissioner of the Union Pacific Railroad. Later involved with ranching and mining in Nevada, Spencer died in 1893 in Washington, D.C. End of Case 62 and of Section 64. Section 65 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 63, Louisiana Cases. John Ray, 1816-1888, versus William L. McMillan, dates unknown. William L. McMillan, dates unknown, James B. Eustis, 1834-1899, and Robert H. Marr, 1819-1892, versus PBS Pinchback, 1837-1921, Henry M. Spofford, 1821-1880, Thomas C. Manning, 1825-1887, versus William P. Kellogg, 1830-1918. Election cases, January 22, 1873, to December 7, 1880. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect, Challenge to Governor's Authority to Appoint, Rival Legislatures. Chronology, Ray v. McMillan. Credentials presented January 11, 1873. Referred to committee January 22, 1873. Committee report February 20, 1873. No Senate action. Result not seated. McMillan Eustis Marr v. Pinchback. Credentials presented January 21, 1873. Referred to Committee, December 4, 1873. Committee Report, February 8, 1875. Senate Vote, December 10, 1877. Result, Eustis seated. Spofford Manning v. Kellogg. Credentials presented January 20, 1877. Referred to Committee, March 7, 1877. Committee Report, November 26, 1877. Senate Vote, November 30, 1877. Result, Kellogg seated. Complaint of Corruption, May 7, 1879. Referred to Committee, May 7, 1879. Committee Report, March 22, 1880. Senate vote to postpone, June 11, 1880. Credentials presented, Manning, December 7, 1880. Result, Kellogg retained seat. Background. Reconstruction politics battered Louisiana as furiously as any natural hurricane had ever done. Improper election conduct, corruption, Blatant disregard for legal procedures and open violence by members of both parties left the state government in shreds. This turbulence even reached the United States Senate when, between 1873 and 1880, eight different men claimed the right to be seated for Louisiana. The resignation on November 1, 1872, of radical Republican William P. Kellogg, who had represented Louisiana in the Senate since the state's readmission to the Union in 1868, launched three separate election challenges, leading to several Senate investigations and intense floor debates on the subject of Reconstruction. Senate concern in each case focused on the persistence of severe domestic disorder in Louisiana, 
culminating in the establishment of two legislatures led by rival governors. Statement of the Case, Ray v. McMillan. On January 22, 1873, soon after Kellogg's resignation to run for governor, two claimants, John Ray, Republican, and William L. McMillan, Democrat, appeared with certificates of election for the unexpired six weeks of Kellogg's term. Ray was elected by one legislature with credentials signed by Kellogg as governor, while McMillan, chosen by the rival legislature, was certified by acting governor PBS Pinchback. The Senate quickly referred the matter to its Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate. The committee heard a confusing chronicle of abuses, among them that during the election for state assembly members, 10,000 Louisiana blacks had been denied the right to register, while an additional 3,000 had been turned away at the polls. In addition, the committee learned that the two rival legislatures came into existence because after the election and before the ballots were counted, the governor at the time, H.C. Warmoth, dissolved the existing election board responsible for counting ballots. A former radical Republican who supported the Democratic gubernatorial candidate, Warmoth approved a new state law governing election procedures and appointed a new board. Meanwhile, the original board went ahead and counted the ballots, announcing the election of a Republican legislature and Kellogg as governor. The new board, for its part, declared that a Democratic legislature had been elected with John McInerney as governor. Then, ruling in a suit between the two parties, a federal judge ordered the U.S. Marshal to take possession of the State House to, quote, prevent all unlawful assemblage, quote, there, of the Democratic legislature, which he considered to be fraudulently elected. Under the judge's order, carried out with the aid of federal troops, the Republican-dominated legislature was declared elected and permitted to assemble with Kellogg as the future governor. This legislature promptly voted to impeach Governor Warmoth for dissolving the original elections board and creating a new one. During Warmoth's trial, the Republican lieutenant governor, PBS Pinchback, served as acting governor, thus becoming the first black governor of any state. When the Senate committee reported on February 20, 1873, the majority of its members recommended that Congress order a new election in Louisiana. They also proposed that the Senate adopt two resolutions, declaring that, quote, there is no state government at present existing in the state of Louisiana, unquote, and that, quote, neither John Ray nor W. L. McMillan is entitled to a seat in the Senate, neither having been elected by the legislature of the state of Louisiana, unquote. The senators reached this conclusion even though they strongly disapproved of the judge's action as inexcusable and overstepping the powers of the federal government. Three members of the committee filed minority reports. Joshua Hill, Republican of Georgia, and Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois, supported McMillan's claim, while committee chairman Oliver H.P.T. Morton, Republican of Indiana, expressed concern at the idea of overturning the state government. With less than a month remaining in Kellogg's term, the Senate rejected the committee's proposal to call a new election. It took no further action on the committee's report, and neither candidate was seated. Five years later, in 1878, the Senate voted to pay $1,000 each to Ray and McMillan 
in compensation for their expenses during Senate consideration of their claims. Pinchback versus Macmillan, Marr, and Eustace. Since the two competing legislatures still existed in Louisiana, both assemblies returned new claimants to the vacant seat for the term beginning on March 4, 1873. Almost three years passed before the Senate untangled the dilemma. In the meantime, four different men presented credentials signed by various Louisiana governors. The first to arrive on January 21, 1873, was Pinckney B.S. Pinchback, who had been Louisiana's acting governor. Elected by the Republican legislature to the new Senate term, he presented credentials signed by Governor Kellogg. Soon after, William McMillan appeared to claim the same seat, with credentials signed by Governor McInerney. In May 1873, President Ulysses S. Grant had recognized Kellogg as the legitimate governor. Still, on December 4, 1873, an uneasy Senate sent the credentials of both Pinchback, a black Republican, and McMillan, a white Democrat, to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. After attempting vainly to reach a resolution, the committee reported on December 15, 1873, that it was evenly divided on the question and referred the matter back to the full Senate. The Senate, in turn, after considerable debate, returned the credentials to the committee, and on February 8, 1875, the committee submitted a new report. The Republican majority, led by committee chairman Oliver Morton, argued that Pinchback's claim was valid and he should be sworn in. The two Democratic committee members objected, however, and denounced the entire 1872 election in Louisiana as a, quote, crime against our civilization and a blot upon our free institutions, unquote. The Senate still took no action, continuing to waver on the issue until December 9, 1875, when a weary William McMillan withdrew his claim. The McMillan faction in Louisiana promptly replaced him with a new candidate, Robert H. Marr. A month later, on January 18, 1876, the papers of James B. Eustis, a Democrat, were presented for the same seat, thus replacing Marr as the Democratic claimant. The Senate referred Eustis credentials to the Privileges and Elections Committee. Within 10 days, the harried committee reported that no vacancy existed since Pinchback had been elected to that seat. It therefore recommended that Eustis papers be laid on the table. The Senate then, on March 8, 1876, voted 32 to 29 not to seat Pinchback although it later did grant him salary and mileage for the three years of the dispute. A year later, at the request of Ohio Democrat Alan G. Thurman, the Senate in March 1877 agreed to reconsider the claim of J.B. Eustis and referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. The committee submitted its report on December 1, 1877. Reflecting the Senate's confusion and embarrassment over the lengthy dispute, the report asserted that Eustace had been legally elected by the lawful legislature of Louisiana, although the election took place at a time when Pinchback was already claiming the same seat. The committee argued that the Senate's 1876 action in refusing to seat Pinchback should be considered the final ruling in that case. In order to end the long vacancy, it recommended that Eustace be seated, even though it acknowledged an apparent conflict with an 1834 Senate decision. 
In that case, the Senate had determined that the Rhode Island legislature had unlawfully elected Elisha R. Potter to the seat of Asher Robbins when no vacancy existed, see Case 14. The committee explained that Pinchback's case differed from the earlier one in that Robbins had already been seated at the time he was challenged. On December 10, 1877, the Senate voted 49-8 to to seat J.B. Eustis, and he took the oath of office. Still, some senators continued to be troubled by the decision to turn away Pinchback when he almost certainly had a prima facie claim to the seat. Kellogg versus Spofford and Manning In 1877, a controversy was also raging over the other Louisiana Senate seat for the term to begin March 4, 1877. PBS Pinchback, who had endured public racial abuse throughout his long struggle to secure his seat, anticipated that Louisiana would elect him to this new Senate term. Once again, he faced disappointment as his former ally, William Kellogg, reportedly through the use of lavish bribes, secured the certificate of election. When Kellogg arrived to take the oath of office, however, objection was raised to seating him, and the Senate, on March 7, 1877, referred his credentials to the Privileges and Elections Committee. In fact, the election of 1876 in Louisiana created even greater controversy than the previous ones. Not only did conflicting claims over the state's electoral votes complicate the presidential race between Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat Samuel J. Tilden, but the state again found itself with two governors and two rival legislatures. This situation, in turn, meant two claimants for the Senate seat, as Henry M. Spofford arrived in October 1877 to challenge Kellogg. His credentials, too, were sent to the Privileges and Elections Committee. On November 26, the committee's Republican majority reported in favor of Kellogg. The committee found that because Democrats had used violence and intimidation to prevent blacks from voting in some legislative districts, election officials had thrown out the results and declared the Republican candidates elected from those districts. The resulting Republican-dominated legislature had elected Kellogg. The three committee Democrats filed a minority report complaining that the committee had refused to receive evidence gathered by Spofford and failed adequately to investigate the Louisiana election. They pointed out that as part of the agreement that resolved his disputed election, even Republican President Hayes had recognized the legitimacy of the Democratic legislature. His withdrawal of the federal troops that had been keeping the peace in Louisiana had led to the collapse of the Republican legislature, so that by April 1877, when Spofford was elected, only the Democratic legislature remained. On November 30, 1877, the Senate, still narrowly under Republican control, voted 30 to 28 to seat Kellogg. Spofford, undaunted, continued to press his claim in the next Congress, since Democrats had become the majority party in the Senate. On May 7, 1879, the Senate voted 26 to 17 to direct the Committee on Privileges and Elections to investigate the reports of corruption in the 1876 Louisiana elections. On March 22, 1880, after holding extensive hearings both in Washington and in Louisiana, 
questioning nearly 150 witnesses and gathering 1,200 pages of testimony, the committee reported that it had learned of fraudulent and corrupt practices by Kellogg in the election. It accused him of deliberately misleading the committee in its earlier investigation so that his seating was based on false information. The committee majority therefore recommended that Kellogg be unseated and replaced by Spofford. The three Republican committee members charged that no new evidence had been obtained and that the only change since the earlier investigation was the change in party control of the Senate, placing the Democrats in a position to oust Kellogg. Debate on the proposal moved slowly until Congress adjourned in mid-June. Then, in August of that year, Spofford died. Thomas C. Manning, Democrat who had been a justice on the state Supreme Court, appeared as a replacement on December 7, 1880, but he had no success in supplanting Kellogg, who served out his term. Conclusion these election cases demonstrate the extent to which post-war disorder in Louisiana, exacerbated by local factionalism, federal mismanagement, personal dishonesty, and deep-seated racial biases, had an impact on the U.S. Senate. PBS Pinchback, although prevented from becoming the second black United States senator, lived out his life in affluence. He remained in Louisiana for many years, but eventually retired to Washington, D.C., where he died in 1921. In 1882, the Senate agreed to reimburse William Kellogg more than $9,000 for the expenses incurred in defending his seat. He remained in the Senate until 1883 and then served one term in the U.S. House of Representatives before retiring in Washington, D.C., where he lived until his death in 1918. The Louisiana legislature did not re-elect James Eustis at the conclusion of his term in 1879, but did return him to the Senate again in 1885. He served until 1891, became ambassador to France in 1893, and died in 1899. Robert Marr served on the Louisiana Supreme Court from 1877 to 1880. Thomas Manning also served on that court during the same period, and again from 1882 to 1886, when he was appointed U.S. Minister to Mexico. The Senate in 1882 granted Manning $1,000 to cover his expenses in claiming the seat. Henry Spofford's heirs also received compensation from the Senate for the three years he had spent in contesting the Louisiana election. End of Case 63 and of Section 65《Section 66 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 64. Credit Mobilier Scandal. James W. Patterson, 1823-1893, New Hampshire. William B. Allison, 1829-1908, Iowa. James A. Bayard, Jr., 1799-1880, Delaware. George S. Boutwell, 1818-1905, Massachusetts. Vice President Shulier Colfax, 1823-1885, Indiana. James Harlan, 1820-1899, Iowa. John A. Logan, 1826 to 1886, Illinois, Roscoe Conklin, 1829 to 1888, New York, and Henry Wilson, 
1823 to 1885, Massachusetts. Expulsion case, February 4, 1873 to March 26, 1873. Issues, bribery and corruption. Chronology, referred to committee, February 4, 1873. Committee report, February 27, 1873. Senate vote, March 26, 1873. Result, not expelled. Background. Rumors of financial scandal clouded the national celebrations over completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. Three years later, these suspicions were confirmed when a select committee of the House of Representatives uncovered a fraudulent relationship between the Union Pacific Railroad and the Crédit Immobilier of America Corporation which had been formed to supervise the contracts to build the Union Pacific. A common group of stockholders secretly managed both companies, a scheme that permitted the construction firm to charge the railroad, and ultimately the government, $2 million more than the actual building expenses. The major sensation of the expose proved to be that many of the Crédit Mobilier stockholders were highly respected Republican members of Congress. The revelation shocked the nation and significantly weakened the Republican Party's leadership. Statement of the Case The House investigation focused on the conduct of Representative Oakes Ames, Republican of Massachusetts, for many years an ardent spokesman for the railroad industry. In 1865, Ames permitted himself to be drawn into the machinations of the Crédit Mobilier. Since the secret organization of one group of stockholders under two different titles was questionable at best, and since the government had initially granted the railroad exceedingly generous land and loan privileges, Thomas C. Durant, former president of the Crédit Mobilier and mastermind of the scheme, persuaded Ames to dispense company shares to his congressional associates in order to deter any formal investigations into the shady dealings. In September 1872, a New York newspaper, acting upon a tip from a disgruntled Ames crony, published the names of congressmen reported to have profited from the company's largesse. Unable to ignore the rising furor, the House of Representatives assembled a committee of inquiry chaired by Representative and former Senator Luke P. Poland, Republican of Vermont. By December of that year, the stunned Poland committee had received allegations against almost every important committee chairman of the House of Representatives, several senators, and Vice President Schuyler Colfax. Oakes Ames, the source of these charges, added to the confusion by rambling erratic testimony that relied upon a complicated set of records kept on scraps of paper or in inscrutable ledgers. Nor were matters helped by Ames' repeated assertion that he was never very good at remembering dates. By February 1873, the House had become convinced that the Senate should be presented with the information. The House offered no recommendations to the Senate, but simply made available all the testimony it had gathered. In this manner, the names of Senators William B. Allison, Republican of Iowa, James A. Bayard, Jr., Democrat of Delaware, George S. Bowell, Republican of Massachusetts, Roscoe Conklin, Republican of New York, James Harlan, Republican of Iowa, John A. Logan, Republican of Illinois, James W. Patterson, Republican of New Hampshire, Henry Wilson, Republican of Massachusetts, and Vice President Schuyler Colfax, Republican of Indiana, formally came to the attention of the Senate. Response of the Senate 
On February 4, 1873, James Patterson asked the Senate to appoint a select committee to investigate the charges. When Vice President Colfax excused himself from appointing the committee, the task fell to Henry B. Anthony, Republican of Rhode Island, who chose Lot M. Morrill, Republican of Maine, to chair the group of five. Two Democratic committee members, John P. Stockton of New Jersey and John W. Stevenson of Kentucky, promptly asked to be replaced, claiming that they were already excessively burdened by their other Senate obligations, but their colleagues refused to excuse them from serving. In its preliminary meeting on February 8, 1873, the Morrill Committee tried to limit the scope of the investigation to ensure that the report would be completed before the close of the 42nd Congress on March 3rd. Since less than a month remained for the committee to review all the evidence from the Poland Committee, interview witnesses, and hold public hearings, the thoroughness of the inquiry came into question from the outset. William B. Allison, who had served in the House until 1871 and entered the Senate in 1873, described his financial association with Oakes Ames as a casual one, which he terminated by returning the Crédit Mobilier certificates when his Iowa constituents severely criticized him for holding any type of railroad stock. The Morrill Committee made no mention of Allison in its final report. He continued to serve in the Senate and was chairman of the Appropriations Committee when he died in 1908. James A. Bayer, Jr., who had left the Senate in 1869, submitted a letter disavowing knowledge of the nature of the corporation or personal acquaintance with Ames. As the 74-year-old Bayard no longer served in the Senate, the Morrill Committee gave only scant attention to the charges against him. His name was not included in the final report, and the elderly senator lived quietly until his death in 1880. George S. Bodwell, one of the original founders of the Republican Party, and Secretary of the Treasury under President Ulysses S. Grant, also received little notice from the Morrill Committee, which did not mention him in its report. Oatwell's connection to Ames stemmed from their joint service in the House of Representatives in the late 1860s, a tie that all witnesses agreed was tenuous. Boatwell did not actually enter the Senate until March 1873, after the investigation was completed. He served only one term and later was appointed to codify the statutes at large. Active in the field of international law, Boatwell died in 1905. Roscoe Conklin also escaped the scandal unscathed. Conkling, a former member of the House of Representatives and a senator since 1867, had been alluded to briefly during the House hearings. Based on Conkling's testimony and that of other witnesses, the Moral Committee report specifically dismissed all charges against him as entirely unfounded. An aggressive and powerful senator, Conkling remained an influential member until his dramatic resignation from the Senate in 1881 in a dispute with President James A. Garfield over patronage. He died seven years later. James Harlan, an outspoken supporter of railroad construction throughout the West, fared less well, even though he had a prestigious reputation having served in the Senate before and during the Civil War, and as Andrew Johnson, Secretary of the Interior. The Morrill Committee was concerned to discover that in 1865, while he was Secretary of the Interior, 
Harlan had accepted a $10,000 contribution toward a future campaign for the Senate from Thomas Durant, the notorious former president of Crédit Mobilier, who was at the time a vice president of Union Pacific, declaring that, quote, the use of large sums of money to influence either popular or legislative elections strikes directly at the fundamental principle of a Republican government, unquote. The committee suggested that such action deserved censure, although it found no evidence that Harlan had permitted the money to influence his behavior as a senator. Time saved Harlan from the possibility of formal censure, for his term expired on March 3, 1873, before further action could be taken. Harlan's subsequent campaigns for senator and governor proved unsuccessful. He died in 1899. John Logan, who had served in the House before and after the Civil War and entered the Senate in 1871, was completely exonerated by the committee report. In a straightforward account of his dealings with Ames, Logan explained that he refused Ames' original offer, but that a few months later, the Massachusetts congressman presented him with a $329 check for his dividends. A reluctant Logan accepted the check, cashed it at the sergeant of arms' office, held the money for two days, and then returned it to Ames with $2 interest. Logan's detailed testimony convinced the committee that the episode, which occurred while Logan served in the House, required no further action by the Senate. Logan's long public service was interrupted briefly when he was not re-elected at the conclusion of his term. But in 1879, Illinois again sent him to the Senate where he remained until his death in 1886. In 1884, he was the Republican nominee for vice president on the ticket with James G. Blaine. A more serious case was that of James Patterson, who had served in the Senate since 1867. He testified that on separate occasions he had given Ames $3,000 and $4,000 to invest for him. The $4,000 was invested in Union Pacific and the $3,000 in Crédit Mobilier. Patterson had told the House Committee that since Ames gave him no receipt in writing, he was unaware that he owned the Crédit Mobilier stock. Ames, however, contradicted Patterson on this point, producing a receipt signed by the senator that specified the stock as Crédit Mobilier. Patterson attributed the contradictions between his testimony and that of Ames to a faulty memory and his ignorance of financial matters. He also asserted strongly that there was no reason he should not own stock in that corporation. The Senate committee, however, concluded that Patterson, as a U.S. senator, knowingly arranged with Representative Ames, quote, for the purchase of 30 shares in the stock of the Crédit Mobilier of America at rates greatly below its esteemed value, unquote, obtained the stock received the dividends on it, and later bought and sold Union Pacific stock, knowing about the relations between the two companies and about Ames' involvement in them. He also knew that Ames' goal was to influence his actions as a senator in relation to the two companies. The committee therefore charged in its February 27, 1873 report to the Senate that Patterson gave false testimony to both the House and Senate committees. It unanimously recommended that he be expelled. On March 3rd, the day his term expired, Patterson asked the Senate to take up the committee's resolution 
so that there would be a full discussion of the case. The Senate, however, pleading the press of of end-of-session business, decided not to consider the recommendation until the next session of Congress. On March 14, 1873, during the special session of the new Senate, Henry B. Anthony submitted a resolution declaring that inaction on the committee's resolution should be interpreted neither as approval nor disapproval. The resolution would also have permitted Patterson to submit a statement to be published in the congressional record, which just days earlier had begun publication as the official proceedings of Congress and the successor to the privately produced Congressional Globe. After a lengthy discussion, the Senate on March 26 amended the resolution to state only that a pamphlet prepared by Patterson in his defense would be printed, bound, and distributed with the report of the committee. The Senate adopted the amended resolution believing that this would be the fairest way to give Patterson a chance to state his defense, since he had had no opportunity to defend himself on the Senate floor. At the same time, this approach avoided setting the dangerous precedent of permitting someone who was no longer a member of the body to place a statement in the official congressional record. The unrepentant Patterson, whose friends felt he deserved expulsion no more than several other members, returned to New Hampshire, where he served in the state legislature and later as state superintendent of public instruction. He died in 1893. Henry Wilson offered the committee the most original explanation for his connection with Ames. He related that in 1865, his wife had received a monetary gift of $3,800, 1,000 of which she then lost through an unfortunate investment Wilson recommended. Wilson reimbursed her for this loss from his own money. Then, anxious to provide his wife with a successful investment, he turned to the Crédit Mobilier Corporation. He had learned about the company from dinner table conversation with Ames at their Washington boarding house. Mrs. Wilson, placing undeserved trust in her husband's financial skills, did purchase the stocks, although she never received the certificates. Wilson later had second thoughts about the propriety of the business deal and asked Ames to refund his wife's money which Wilson returned to her. Out of his own pocket, he added the $814 that Ames told him would have been the profit on the transaction. Thus, Wilson told the committee, he was, quote, and ever shall be, $1,814 poorer than I should have been had the investment with Mr. Ames not been made, unquote. The Moral Committee agreed that these actions in no way benefited or tainted Wilson, who in March 1873 had become Vice President of the United States after the political ruin of Schulier Colfax through his part in the Crédit Mobilier scandal. The Moral Committee report did, however, mildly reprimand Wilson for insisting vehemently and erroneously during his election campaign, that he had never known anything of the infamous company or any person connected with it. Wilson, who, unlike many of his colleagues, was a poor man, having been a shoemaker before entering politics, died in office in 1875. Schuyler Colfax, the bright and popular vice president under Grant, had previously served in the House for 14 years, six of them as Speaker. He contributed to his own downfall by delivering an impassioned speech, asserting his innocence in the scandal, shortly before the House convened the Poland Committee. 
the resulting testimony implicated Colfax so clearly that his political credibility never recovered. Colfax tried to cloak each new revelation with respectability, but he could not explain away a $1,200 canceled check in his name that Ames held. Colfax's status as president of the Senate made his position slightly different from that of the charged senators. Neither the Poland Committee nor the Moral Committee reports discussed the allegations against him. On February 20, 1873, a resolution introduced in the House called for the impeachment of Colfax. But four days later, the House Judiciary Committee rejected the measure. Again, time aided the accused. Before further action could be taken in either the House or the Senate, Congress adjourned and the term ended for Colfax, who had failed to be renominated for vice president. No formal adjudication resolved the Colfax scandal. Although he remained active in politics and gave many speeches, his brilliant career was destroyed. Colfax died in 1885. Conclusion The Moral Committee completed its work in less than three weeks. Given the complexity and the seriousness of the charges, many believed the investigations in both the House and the Senate had been little more than cosmetic cover-ups. Political observers wondered how many other politicians had escaped undetected. Still, the reputations of several leading Republicans and, indeed, of the entire party suffered from the scandal. In spite of efforts to limit the damage, it became clear that the Crédit Mobilier affair had seriously undermined the Republican Party. End of Case 64 and of Section 66Section 67 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 65. Louis V. Bogey, 1813-1877, Missouri. Election Case, March 17, 1873, to March 25, 1873. Issues Electoral Misconduct, Allegations of Bribery and Corruption. Chronology Memorial Received March 17, 1873. Referred to Committee March 17, 1873. Committee Report March 25, 1873. Senate Vote March 25, 1873. Result, retained seat. Background. Caught between the pull of Southern cultural traditions and the attraction of frontier opportunity, post-Civil War Missouri opted for the wealth promised by commercial development. Thus, Reconstruction politics brought only a mild stir to Missouri, as the state concentrated on the industrial growth encouraged by a new constitution friendly to corporate ventures. When the Missouri legislature elected Louis V. Bogey, Democratic president of the St. Louis City Council, to the United States Senate in 1873, the dispute over that election proved mild in comparison to the violent contests that characterized the states of the Deep South. Statement of the Case on March 4, 1873, Louis Bogey took his seat in the Senate. On March 17, the Senate received and referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections a memorial from several members of the Missouri legislature charging that Bogey had secured his seat through bribery and corruption. The following day, Bogey demanded that the Senate move promptly to investigate the matter. It is true, he said, our contests in the West for this distinguished position 
as is known to Western senators upon this floor, are always attended by heat and animation, and success is no easy matter. He insisted, however, that an inquiry by the state legislature had already exonerated him from any wrongdoing, although it had uncovered some attempts at bribery by another candidate. Boji contended that the memorial sent to the Senate by his political opponents offered no new evidence, but simply complained that the investigation by the Democratic legislature had been hasty and incomplete. He requested speedy action by the Committee on Privileges and Elections, pointing out that he did not consider it appropriate for him to vote on any of the other election cases pending before the Senate, while he himself was under investigation. Response of the Senate A week later, on March 25, 1873, the Committee on Privileges and Elections reported that the evidence in the Missouri Memorial was vague and unworthy of further Senate consideration. The Missouri complainants had not presented sufficient information to convince the committee that the Senate should launch its own investigation. That same day, the members agreed without debate and discharged the committee from further consideration of the subject. Boji thus retained his seat. Conclusion The Senate was glad to dispose quickly of one contested election in an era when an abundance of other challenges required its attention. Once his case was resolved, Boji took an active part in the debates over the Louisiana elections, see Case 63, as a critic of the Republican governor's tactics. Boji remained in the Senate until his death in 1877. End of Case 65 and of Section 67. Section 68 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 66, David T. Corbin, 1833-1905, versus Matthew C. Butler, 1836-1909, South Carolina. Election case, February 13, 1877, to February 25, 1879. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect, Rival Legislatures, Allegations of Electoral Misconduct, Intimidation of Voters. Chronology number one, Credentials presented, February 13, 1877. Referred to committee, March 7, 1877. Senate vote, November 30, 1877. Result, Butler seated. Chronology number two. Petition presented, December 13, 1877. Referred to committee, March 26, 1878. Committee report, February 4, 1879. Senate vote, February 25, 1879. Result, Butler retained seat. Background. South Carolina did not escape the heated dissension that marked Reconstruction politics throughout the South. Manipulation of voting districts, establishment of inaccessible polling places, and violent disruption of political gatherings typified the conduct of resurgent Democrats seeking to regain political control of the state from the radical Republicans. At the same time, the composition of the United States Senate was also changing, as an influx of new Democratic members at the beginning of the 45th Congress in 1877 reduced the margin of Republican control to a slim 38 to 34, with one independent who generally voted with the Democrats. 
The closeness of the party division also contributed to the intensity of the struggle over these election cases. Statement of the case. After the November 1876 election, the upheaval in South Carolina led to the formation of two rival legislatures. One faction organized itself into a body called the Wallace House of Representatives, which acted alone as a legislature without any state senate, while the other legislature consisted of a state senate and a House of Representatives known as the Mackey House. Each claimed to be the lawful body, and promptly elected a United States Senator for the term beginning March 4, 1877. The Mackey House, dominated by Republicans, elected David T. Corbin, whose election was certified by the outgoing Republican Governor, D. H. Chamberlain, while the Wallace House, named Matthew C. Butler, Democrat, whose credentials were signed by the incoming Democratic governor, Wade Hampton. A native South Carolinian, Butler was an attorney and had served as a general in the Confederate Army. Corbin was the Republican U.S. attorney in South Carolina. All too familiar with the convoluted, time-consuming arguments associated with contests between dual state legislatures, The Senate on March 7, 1877, sent the credentials of both David Corbin and M.C. Butler to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate. On November 20, 1877, Alan Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, asked that the committee be discharged from further consideration of Butler's credentials. He pointed out that five weeks after the Senate had reconvened in mid-October, the committee had still not reported, leaving South Carolina without full representation in the Senate. Thurman questioned the value of waiting for a committee report since the facts were all on the record, both candidates had submitted statements, and neither wished to call witnesses. Because the full Senate would want to discuss the case anyway, he thought the debate should start as soon as possible. He chided his colleagues for their failure to work diligently to find solutions to the three contested elections facing the Senate at that time. The new chairman of the Privileges and Elections Committee, Bainbridge Wadley, Republican of New Hampshire, responded that although the full Senate had been holding brief daily sessions, the committee had been putting in long hours on two election cases from Louisiana, see Case 63, which had been referred to it before the Butler-Corbin case. He suggested that Thurman's eagerness to remove the South Carolina case from the committee might indicate that there was something in the case which will not bear the scrutiny of the committee. Waldley, who had succeeded to the chairmanship after the death of Oliver Morton, Republican of Indiana, on November 1st, observed that he and the other Senate Republicans had not yet had a chance to study the issues involved in order to make an informed decision between the two claimants. On November 26th, Committee Chairman Waldley, having in the interim looked into the Corbin-Butler case, reminded the Senate that a special committee sent to South Carolina to investigate the 1876 election was due to produce a report very soon. The evidence collected by that committee, Waldley declared, supported Republican Corbin's position and implicated Democrat Butler in some of the violence and intimidation, so that, quote, his path to this chamber is slippery with blood, unquote. Thus, he contended there was ample reason for the Privileges and Elections Committee to review the case. 
Waldley then insisted on having the clerk read to the Senate excerpts from the evidence gathered by the committee investigating the situation in South Carolina, particularly portions regarding a massacre of black militiamen that occurred in the town of Hamburg in July 1876. Some testimony regarding the incident at Hamburg indicated that M.C. Butler had been a leader of the white mob that fired on the town armory where members of the black militia were taking shelter, and later murdered a number of militiamen when they tried to escape. Black witnesses were convinced that the idea was to kill the principal black men of the area and intimidate enough black voters to enable the Democrats to carry the election. According to Waldley, quote, Mr. Corbin contends that in two counties in South Carolina at the last election, there was such an enormous amount of violence, intimidation, and crime from the date of this Hamburg massacre up to the time of the election that nobody who wished to vote the Republican ticket could feel safe in so doing, unquote. This intimidation of black voters led the Republican legislature to invalidate the election in two South Carolina counties. Without the representatives who claimed election from those counties, the Wallace House that elected Butler would have had no quorum. In a lengthy session that continued all night and into the next day, November 27th, Democratic senators countered by demanding that Butler's testimony to the special committee be read as well. Butler had told the committee that he saw no evidence of violence during the election campaign, as the Democratic candidates sought the support of black voters. He did, however, acknowledge that at his precinct in one of the disputed counties, five or six hundred black citizens were prevented from voting. Regarding the Hamburg massacre, Butler complained that he had been unfairly treated in Governor Chamberlain's report on the incident. He had been in the town when the riot began, but soon saw that he could not control the white mob and therefore left before the murders took place. Finally, a closely divided Senate voted 29 to 27 in favor of Thurman's motion and discharged the Privileges and Elections Committee from further consideration of the credentials. Although the vote was generally along party lines, two Republicans, John J. Patterson of South Carolina and Simon B. Conover of Florida, joined the Democrats in voting for the discharge. Both offered lengthy explanations of their action in response to charges from their party colleagues regarding possible corrupt bargains for their vote. Patterson, known as Honest John, had been charged in South Carolina with bribing legislators in his 1872 election. Rumor and a newspaper story claimed that in return for Patterson's support, Butler had promised the senator would not be prosecuted. Patterson, however, assured the Senate that he was simply representing his constituents, since both Democrats and Republicans in South Carolina now wanted Butler to be seated. On November 30, 1877, the Senate voted 29 to 28 to seat M.C. Butler, but that action did not conclude the controversy. On December 13, Angus Cameron, Republican of Wisconsin, presented David Corbin's petition for a review of his right to the seat, which was eventually referred to the Privileges and Elections Committee on March 26, 1878. After taking nearly a year to review the complicated South Carolina election, the committee issued a majority and a minority report on February 4, 1879. The committee's Republican majority determined that 
in the November 1876 election, the members of the state Senate were duly elected and that body legally organized. The report also found that on December 12th and 13th, 1876, the Senate and the Mackey House, consisting of 59 Republicans, voted for U.S. Senator and elected David T. Corbin. Governor Chamberlain signed Corbin's credentials before leaving office on December 14th. On December 19th, the Wallace House, composed of 57 Democratic representatives, plus eight from the two counties where the election was invalidated because of violence, elected M.C. Butler as U.S. Senator. The state Senate as a body never participated in this latter election, although 11 of its members did. The committee majority noted that the Wallace House appeared to recognize that it had no legal standing, for it never attempted to pass any legislation or take official action other than electing a U.S. senator. In addition, the majority declared that since Corbin was elected on December 12th, there was no vacancy in the office of U.S. Senator when Butler was elected on December 19th. The Butler election was completely invalid because the state Senate did not participate, and the Wallace House had no quorum when it held the election for Butler. The Mackey House, on the other hand, had had a quorum of the 116 House members certified as elected, even if not of the 124 members authorized by the state constitution. Citing numerous precedents for accepting this approach, the committee majority therefore concluded that Corbin had been duly elected. In a minority report, the three committee Democrats argued that the matter had been finally settled by the Senate's decision in November 1877 to seat Butler, since the body had also reviewed information from Corbin at that time. Since then, Corbin had presented no new facts, and there were thus no grounds for reopening the inquiry. They stressed as crucial the point that the Mackey House did not have a quorum of all 124 House members when it elected Corbin. Having been in the Senate for more than a year, Butler had accumulated sufficient support among his colleagues that on February 25, 1879, a resolution to consider the report of the committee failed on a vote of 25 to 36, and he retained his seat. Conclusion Corbin's claims suffered not only from the narrowness of the Republican margin in the Senate, but also from the backlog of cases that prevented the Privileges and Elections Committee from moving promptly to investigate the election thus providing the opportunity for Butler's supporters to discharge the matter from committee and press for an immediate Senate vote. The Senate debate then focused on Butler's fitness to serve, depending on what his role had been in the Hamburg massacre, rather than directly on the election. Only when Corbin subsequently insisted did the committee carefully examine the events of the election. By the time the committee majority decided that Corbin had in fact been elected, the Senate was unwilling to reopen the matter. On February 28, 1879, David Corbin withdrew his claim to the seat, and on March 3rd, he was reimbursed $10,000 for his expenses in contesting the election. In 1882, the Senate granted M.C. Butler $3,500 to cover the costs of his defense. Butler served in the Senate until 1895. Upon completion of his senatorial career, he practiced law in Washington, D.C., and then participated in the Spanish-American War. Butler died in Washington in 1909. 
end of case 66, end of section 68. Section 69 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 67. L.Q.C. Lamar, 1825-1893, Mississippi. Election Case, March 5, 1877, to March 6, 1877. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to a Legislature's Authority to Elect, Electoral Misconduct, Voter Intimidation, Chronology, Resolution Submitted, March 5, 1877, Senate Vote, March 6, 1877, Result, Seated, Background. In 1862, L.Q.C. Lamar withdrew from the United States House of Representatives to serve as a colonel and diplomat for the Confederacy. In 1873, his political disabilities removed, Lamar returned to the House. There, on the death of Charles Sumner in 1874, Lamar delivered a brilliant eulogy honoring the late radical Republican that did much to heal sectional wounds. On the other hand, Lamar was also a leader in the 1875 Mississippi campaign, in which the Democrats, by both wooing and intimidating black voters, succeeded in regaining control of the state. This Mississippi plan of carefully orchestrated violence and fear served as a model for the next year's winning Democratic campaign in South Carolina. See Case 66. In 1876, Lamar was easily elected to a United States Senate seat as a Democrat. Statement of the Case Even though the Civil War had been over for a dozen years by March 1877, no former high-level official of the Confederacy had yet been admitted to the U.S. Senate. When L.Q.C. Lamar arrived to take his seat, George Spencer, Republican of Alabama, sought to prevent his admission. To demonstrate that Lamar drew his credentials from an illegal legislature, Spencer proposed to read the report of a select committee from the previous Congress regarding force, fraud, and intimidation in the 1875 Mississippi election. The spontaneous response of, oh no, from his colleagues, made clear the waning congressional interest in the progress of Reconstruction. Response of the Senate. When Alan G. Thurman, Democrat of Ohio, urged that Lamar should be seated since his credentials were in order, Oliver H. P. T. Morton, Republican of Indiana, chairman of the Privileges and Elections Committee, balked. He recalled that in identical circumstances the previous year, Thurman had insisted that Louisiana's black Republican senator-elect, Pinckney B. S. Pinchback, not be seated until his credentials had been reviewed by the committee. See Case 63. Thurman objected that there was a major difference between the two cases. Quote, the defect in Pinchback's case was that, according to the testimony, that body which elected Pinchback was not the legislature of Louisiana, unquote. Countering that the legislature that chose Mr. Lamar was not a lawful legislature, Morton charged that, quote, from my knowledge of what took place in Mississippi in 1875, it presented a field of carnage, that that election was a fraud from beginning to end, the most monstrous fraud that was ever practiced in this country, unquote. Spencer prevailed in his proposal, and the clerk began to read descriptions of the 1875 campaign to terrorize black voters in Mississippi. 
The few senators remaining in the chamber heard the testimony that had been received from several black women about the whippings and murders of their husbands. At one point, John Gordon, Democrat of Georgia, interrupted the litany of fear and intimidation to point out that no one was listening, but Spencer insisted that the reading continue. When the clerk finished, the Senate debated the matter briefly before voting 57 to 1, with 12 members absent, to seat LQC Lamar. Among those voting to seat Lamar was his Mississippi colleague, Blanche K. Bruce, a black Republican, whose support proved influential with many Republicans. Even Oliver Morton voted with the majority once he had made the point that Democrats had acted from partisanship rather than principle in the Pinchback case. Conclusion At the beginning of the 45th Congress, the Senate was confronted with a number of other electoral challenges. See cases 63, 66, 68, and 69, related to the end of Reconstruction. The perfunctory attention given to the Lamar case, even in the face of outrages committed in Mississippi, demonstrated the Senate's weariness with the entire question of violence and disorder in the former Confederate states. A talented and skillful politician, Lamar served in the Senate until 1885, when he resigned to become Secretary of the Interior for President Grover Cleveland. In 1887, Cleveland appointed him Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, where he served until his death in 1893. End of Case 67 and of Section 69— of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joanne Turner. Case 68, John T. Morgan, 1824-1907, Alabama. Election Case, March 5, 1877, to March 8, 1877. Issues, Reconstruction, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect. Chronology, Resolution Submitted, March 5, 1877. Senate Vote, March 8, 1877. Result, Seated. Background. As the Reconstruction era drew to a close, Alabama Democrats effectively solidified their position in the state government. The party took advantage of the infighting among Republicans to gain control of political institutions throughout the state. Although the Senate had taken three years to resolve an earlier contested Alabama election during Reconstruction, see Case 62, there was far less difficulty in 1877 when the state sent to Washington John T. Morgan. Democrat, a former general in the Confederate Army. Statement of the Case On March 5, 1877, an objection was raised to seating John Morgan, and his credentials were ordered to lie on the table. The protest came from Alabama's other senator, Republican George E. Spencer, who charged that in 1876 state Democrats had succeeded in altering apportionment, setting registration requirements and changing election laws in ways that effectively disenfranchised Republicans and black voters. Response of the Senate On March 8, Spencer again took the floor to deplore the government's indifference in failing to protect the rights of black people. He concluded forcefully, Let the Senate of the United States, by its rejection of this applicant, give to the good citizens of Alabama the assurance that the color line, the conflict of race, will rapidly disappear 
to be replaced by political issues which will tend only to the improvement and the happiness of the people. While agreeing with Spencer that the 1876 election had been fraudulent, Oliver H. P. T. Morton, Republican of Indiana, chairman of the Privileges and Elections Committee, explained that he could not support Spencer because, in his judgment, Morgan had a sound prima facie case and therefore, according to Senate precedents, should be seated. Any questionable matters could be investigated subsequently. Morton nevertheless quoted extensively from an investigative report the senators had received that morning that had uncovered widespread fraud in the Alabama election. He wryly noted that if the current investigation received the same response the Senate had given to a similar report on 1873 voting frauds in Louisiana, Morgan would not be seated. Recognizing the changed mood of the Senate, however, he acknowledged Morgan's clear claim to the seat. The Senate agreed by voice vote, and Morgan was sworn in. Conclusion The seating of John T. Morgan marked the end of a particularly vitriolic era in Senate debate, the reconstruction of the southern states. The composition of the Senate was changing, and a new generation of senators was turning its attention to other matters. John Morgan belonged to the new era, a powerful advocate of American expansionism who fought to build a canal across Central America. He served in the Senate until his death in 1907. End of Case 68 and of Section 70「Section 71 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 69, Lafayette Grover, 1823-1911, to Oregon. Election Case, March 7, 1877, to June 15, 1878. Issues, Electoral Misconduct, Allegations of Bribery and Corruption. Chronology, Petition Presented, March 7, 1877. Referred to Committee, March 17, 1877. Committee Report, June 15, 1878. No Senate Action. Result, Retained Seat. Background. When the 1876 Samuel J. Tilden, Rutherford B. Hayes presidential contest failed to produce a victor, partisans of both sides feverishly attempted to manipulate electoral votes in several pivotal states, one of which was Oregon. There, Democratic Governor Lafayette Grover cooperated with plans to assist Tilden, his party's candidate. Using some technical pretext, Grover disqualified a Republican elector and substituted a Tilden man on the state's electoral commission. In a complex series of events, which included the illegal delivery of voting lists and certificates of election, the Democrats established a fraudulent electoral commission and cast their votes for Samuel Tilden. Ultimately, a National Electoral Commission voided the unlawful proceedings and gave the three Oregon votes to Hayes, but the role played by Governor Grover left bitter feelings among many Oregon citizens. Statement of the Case When Lafayette Grover was elected to a term in the Senate to begin March 4, 1877, his opponents in Oregon immediately prepared formal protests. Before Grover could be sworn in, his Oregon colleague, John H. Mitchell, Republican, presented a petition charging the senator-elect with bribery and corruption to secure his office. The petition also alleged that Grover had lied to the Senate's Committee on Privileges and Elections 
about granting the certificate of appointment to the substitute presidential elector. Democratic and Republican senators alike, weary of the constant investigations of credentials, resisted denying Grover his seat. Even staunch Republican Roscoe Conkling of New York called for Grover's admission. During the debate on March 8, 1877, he pointed out that there was a prima facie case for seating Grover and conducting any investigation afterwards. Oregon met all the conditions. The state was in the Union and had a single legislature that had carried out the election for U.S. Senator. There was one undisputed governor who had issued unchallenged credentials to the senator-elect, and there was no question regarding the individual's qualifications. The Senate agreed that Grover should be seated, and he took the oaths of office that day. On March 9th, Grover asked the Senate to investigate the charges against him. A reluctant Senate, convinced the investigation would be both time-consuming and expensive, finally voted on March 17th to send the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. It authorized the committee, if necessary, to send a subcommittee to Oregon to collect testimony and spend up to $10,000 for that purpose. Response of the Senate. On June 15, 1878, the committee report reaffirmed the hesitancy members voiced 15 months earlier when Grover requested the investigation. The committee stated that it found no evidence to sustain the charges against Grover. Concurring in this view, Eli Salisbury, Democrat of Delaware, a member of the subcommittee that had held hearings in Oregon, added a statement including some of the testimony to demonstrate that it vindicated Grover. Apparently convinced that no evidence had been found to support the charges, the Senate took no further action on the matter. Conclusion Lafayette Grover completed his Senate term in 1883 and returned to the practice of law. He died in 1911. End of Case 69 and of Section 71. Section 72 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 70. Stanley Matthews, 1824 to 1889, Ohio. Censure case, June 5, 1878 to March 1, 1879. Issues. Allegations of corruption before Senate term. Chronology. Request for investigation, June 5, 1878. Referred to committee, June 5, 1878. Committee report. March 1, 1879. No Senate action. Result, not censured. Background. The contested 1876 Rutherford B. Hayes Samuel J. Tilden presidential election left in doubt the critical electoral votes from three states, among them Louisiana. Soon after the November election, with a political stalemate threatening the future of the country, both Republicans and Democrats sent influential citizens to observe the counting of disputed votes in the pivotal three states. Ohio Republican Stanley Matthews was selected, along with other political luminaries, to travel to New Orleans to supervise the vote counting for presidential electors amid wheeling and dealing by both parties. When the election was still undecided by February 1877, Congress established a special bipartisan electoral commission composed of five senators, five representatives, and five Supreme Court justices. Stanley Matthews served as counsel before the commission on behalf of Rutherford B. Hayes, 
who was ultimately declared to have been elected president. Subsequently, in March 1877, the Ohio legislature elected Matthews to the United States Senate to fill a vacancy in the term ending March 3, 1879, and he took his seat without incident. Statement of the case. On June 5, 1878, Stanley Matthews asked the Senate to investigate allegations that during his stay in New Orleans, he had acted in a fraudulent manner or had offered illegal rewards to any official in exchange for a Republican vote during the electoral count. The Senate agreed to Matthews' request and established a select committee of four Republicans and three Democrats to look into the matter. The allegations against Matthews stemmed from charges made by a Louisiana citizen, James E. Anderson, testifying in the House of Representatives. Anderson claimed that Matthews had offered him a government job in return for concealing his fraudulent actions in the presidential election. Response of the Senate The Select Committee was frustrated in its efforts to take direct testimony from Anderson. At his first appearance on June 13, 1878, he presented a note from the chairman of the House Committee asking that he be excused because he was needed at hearings in that body. When summoned on a second occasion, Anderson refused to give any evidence because the committee denied him the right to have counsel present. The obdurate Anderson turned aside every question and would not even give his age or occupation. Despite the rising agitation his stubborn demeanor caused among committee members, he then dared to bargain for his testimony. Anderson offered to cooperate if, in turn, Stanley Matthews would testify before the House committee. Indignant that Anderson should attempt to negotiate terms for his testimony, the committee members were doubly annoyed because the Senate had adjourned the previous day, leaving the committee without the power to cite Anderson for contempt. When the committee again turned its attention to the inquiry in December 1878, it received a wire from Anderson in Nevada stating that he would testify if summoned. The committee instead decided to obtain a transcript of Anderson's House testimony and to examine Stanley Matthews in person. In contrast to Anderson's evasiveness, Matthews cooperated fully. He recalled every detail of his brief stay in New Orleans and recounted his conversations with clarity and precision. He said he hardly knew Anderson and had agreed to recommend him for a federal post such as customs officer or a consul, simply as a kind gesture to someone in need. Anderson told him he had been active as a loyal Republican over several years in Louisiana, but had somehow incurred the enmity of party leaders in the state, forcing him to seek other employment. According to Matthews, Anderson did not say that he had committed illegal acts on behalf of the Republican cause in Louisiana or ask for any reward for such acts. He did, however, give to Matthews for safekeeping a document he had prepared that falsely described such illegal acts, having changed his mind about using it to threaten a local official. Matthews had provided the document to the House Committee investigating Anderson's charges. On March 1, 1879, the Select Committee reported to the Senate on the Matthews investigation. It unanimously found that Matthews had no connection with any real or supposed frauds in the election in Louisiana and had not engaged in any corrupt conduct. The committee did, however, call Matthews' efforts to obtain federal employment for Anderson 
in spite of his apparently questionable character, wrong and injurious to the public interest. The Senate, anxious to waste no further time on the 1876 election intrigues, took no action on the matter. Conclusion Stanley Matthews' Senate term ended two days after the committee reported. In 1881, President James A. Garfield appointed him to the Supreme Court, but the appointment encountered considerable Senate opposition because of Matthews' close ties to corporations and railroad interests. He was eventually confirmed by a vote of 24 to 23 and served on the court until his death in 1889. End of Case 70 and of Section 72. Section 73 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 71, Charles H. Bell. 1823 to 1893, New Hampshire. Election case, appointment, March 18, 1879 to April 10, 1879. Issues, right of governor to make appointment to a term not previously filled by a legislature. Chronology, credentials presented March 18, 1879. Referred to committee March 19, 1879. Committee report, April 2, 1879. Senate vote, April 10, 1879. Result, seated. Background. In 1878, New Hampshire adopted a new state constitution that became effective in October of that year. As a result, the state conducted elections for two legislatures in one year. The first, chosen in March 1878 to serve from June 1878 to May 1879. The second, elected in November 1878, to serve from June 1879 to June 1881. During the 45th Congress, New Hampshire officials asked the United States Senate for an advance ruling on which of these legislatures would have the authority to select a senator. The Committee on Privileges and Elections declared, and the Senate agreed, that under the 1866 election law, only the legislature chosen in November 1878 could elect a senator since it would be the legislature elected next preceding the expiration of the senatorial term. This decision led to controversy in the Senate when one New Hampshire senator's term expired on March 3, 1879, three months before the legislature elected in November was due to meet in June. To fill the vacancy until the legislature could convene and hold an election, the state's governor appointed Charles H. Bell, Republican. Statement of the case. Charles Bell's credentials were presented to the Senate on March 18, 1879, on the first day of the new 46th Congress. In a Senate under Democratic control for the first time in nearly 20 years, William Wallace, Democrat of Pennsylvania, promptly challenged the legitimacy of the New Hampshire Republicans' claim. Wallace argued that the governor had acted incorrectly when he appointed Bell to a vacancy caused by the expiration of a term of office. Supporters and opponents of the claimant prepared to dissect all previous Senate cases where gubernatorial appointment had been made after a vacancy occurred. George F. Hoare, Republican of Massachusetts, a member of the Committee on Privileges and Elections, suggested that, since members appeared to know the details of each earlier challenge, 
the Senate might save time by keeping the matter out of committee and devoting one day to floor debate on the subject. The Senate ignored his efforts at efficiency and sent the credentials to committee on March 19th. Response of the Senate On April 2nd, the Committee on Privileges and Elections reported that Charles Bell was not entitled to his seat. The new Democratic majority described the committee's advisory ruling in the previous Congress when the Republicans controlled the Senate as not important in the settlement of the question now presented. The majority argued that the power of a governor to make a temporary appointment was limited to vacancies in a term that had already been filled by the legislature. This precedent, they asserted, was established in the 1825 case of James Landman, see Case 12, and observed by the Senate in all subsequent cases. The Republican minority sharply disagreed, contending that the history of the Senate supported a governor's right to appoint when a legislature was unable to convene, and that the intent of the U.S. Constitution was that vacancies should be filled. The only occasion that deviated from this interpretation, the minority continued, was the case of James Landman cited by the majority. Although that case was so shrouded in confusion that members could not identify through available records the motivations behind the 1825 decision, one key point in the debate had been that the governor made the appointment before the vacancy actually occurred. That one case aside, the minority report argued, all precedents upheld the governor's appointment of Bell. The reading of the reports launched a lengthy and heated floor debate as members rehashed each earlier case of gubernatorial appointment. Former Supreme Court Justice David Davis, independent of Illinois, argued for following the precedent in the Landman case. He observed that, according to the memoirs of Thomas Hart Benton, who was in the Senate at the time, the Senate had ruled that governors could only fill unexpected vacancies. It could not apply to a foreseen event bound to occur at a fixed period, Benton wrote. Here, the vacancy was foreseen. There was no contingency in it. It was regular and certain. On April 10th, after two long days of debate, committee chairman Eli Salisbury, Democrat of Delaware, once more restated the majority's view that a governor could not make an appointment to a term the legislature had not yet filled by election. He stressed that this was an important constitutional point that should be recognized as precedent for future Senate action. On the other hand, he declared that during the debates he had developed a high regard for the character, respectability, and intelligence of Charles Bell. He also observed that, because of the substantial Democratic majority in the Senate, seating the Republican bell would be of little political consequence. Salisbury, therefore, while retaining his opinion about the policy issue, encouraged his colleagues in this case to accept the governor's appointment. With an ambiance of magnanimity established, a few Democrats joined with Republicans to seat Bell by a vote of 35 to 28. Conclusion In the first Congress since the Civil War to have both houses controlled by Democrats, the majority party could afford to be generous. Democrats outnumbered Republicans by nine in the Senate, and Bell did not pose a serious threat, for he would serve only for three months until the legislature met and elected a successor. He returned to New Hampshire, becoming governor in 1881. He died in 1893. 
End of Case 71. End of Section 73. Section 74 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 72, John J. Ingalls, 1833-1900, to Kansas. Election Case, March 19, 1879, to February 17, 1880. Issues, Electoral Misconduct, Charges of Bribery and Corruption. Chronology, Memorial Received, March 19, 1879. Referred to Committee, March 19, 1879. Committee Report, February 17, 1880. Senate Vote, February 17, 1880. Result, Retained Seat. Background. Although Kansas entered the Union in 1862, the internal organization of the state was not completed until 1888. Hotly disputed contests over the establishment of county seats and the marking of county borders kept political excitement high and affected all the business of the state legislature, including the selection of United States Senators. After helping the Republicans win the 1878 legislative election, incumbent Senator John J. Ingalls, Republican, returned to Washington to await the outcome of the January 1879 senatorial election. Statement of the Case When Ingalls won a narrow victory, his opponents charged election fraud. On March 19, 1879, the day after Ingalls took his oath for a second term, the Senate received a memorial from one faction of the Kansas legislature protesting irregularities in the January election. The Senate referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Late in March, the Committee received a report from the Kansas legislature on an investigation it conducted into the election. Armed with that material, the committee asked for and received authorization to carry out its own investigation. Ingalls then withdrew as a member of that committee, and the remaining members began the time-consuming task of summoning witnesses. Response of the Senate a brief Senate debate on the Ingalls case took place in January 1880, after several witnesses had been arrested and brought to the Senate chamber for failing to respond to the committee's summons. All three frontier residents were quickly relieved of charges of contempt when they explained their failure to appear earlier as do either to family emergencies or the fact that great distances and poor communications had delayed delivery of the summons. Finally, on February 17, 1880, the committee reported on the testimony gathered, both in Washington and at a subcommittee hearing in Topeka. Witnesses had described bribes and blackmail arranged at the Topeka Teft House, a favorite meeting spot for Kansas politicians. The tales of clandestine rendezvous among drunken legislators who schemed for Ingalls' election echoed the misconduct charges leveled in 1872 against then-Senator Samuel C. Pomeroy, which had led the legislature to choose Ingalls in that election. See Case 61. The committee majority stated that while, quote, bribery and other corrupt means were employed, unquote, in 1879 by those favoring Ingalls, no witness could conclusively tie Ingalls to the irregularities, and there was no proof that the questionable deals had altered the election results. A minority report agreed 
but added that Ingalls should be exonerated more forcefully, since the whole matter smacked of a plot to defeat the senator by falsely incriminating him. The Senate approved the majority report by voice vote that same day. Conclusion In 1882, the Senate adopted a resolution reimbursing Ingalls for the expenses of his defense. Perhaps reflecting the prevailing view of Kansas elections, John Ingalls, a decade later, made the widely quoted statement in an 1890 newspaper interview, quote, The purification of politics is an iridescent dream. Government is force. Politics is a battle for supremacy. The Decalogue and the Golden Rule have no place in a political campaign. The object is success, unquote. Renowned for his acid tongue, John Ingalls continued to serve in the Senate until 1891, the last four years as president pro tempore. He died in 1900. End of section 74 and of case 72. Section 75 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 73, Elbridge G. Lapham, 1814-1890, and Warner Miller, 1838-1918, New York. Election case, October 10, 1881, to December 13, 1881. Issues, election irregularities. Chronology, credentials presented October 10, 1881. Referred to committee, December 8, 1881. Committee report, December 12, 1881. Senate vote, December 13, 1881. Result, retained seats. Background. Republican Party infighting, halted temporarily for the 1880 presidential election, surfaced almost immediately when the victorious James A. Garfield in March 1881 seized control of patronage appointments from machine bosses. The president's actions particularly incensed Roscoe Conkling, Republican of New York, who, having supported Ulysses S. Grant against Garfield in the Republican convention, saw a bitter enemy appointed as collector of the Port of New York. In fury, Conkling and his New York colleague, Thomas C. Platt, Republican, decided to protest Garfield's disregard for the time-honored patronage system of senatorial courtesy by resigning from the Senate on May 16, 1881. Conkling convinced Platt that the New York legislature would support their gesture and rebuke Garfield by immediately returning them to the Senate. The once mighty Conkling, however, had misread the temper of his own state assembly which deadlocked on the vote until the 56th ballot. Much to the embarrassment of Conkling and Platt, the legislature in July 1881 finally chose two members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Elbridge G. Lapham, Republican, to fill Conkling's seat, and Warner Miller, Republican, for Platt's. Statement of the Case the fierce New York struggle moved to the Senate when the Conkling forces in the legislature submitted a memorial protesting the seating of Elbridge Lapham and Warner Miller during a special session on October 11, 1881. Despite a list of five specific charges against them, the Senate permitted the two to take their oaths of office without delay. Ten days later, the complainant submitted a second protest, charging procedural infractions in the election process 
and Personal Corruption by Lapham and Miller. At the start of the regular session on December 8, 1881, the Senate referred the petitions to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate. Four days later, on December 12th, Benjamin H. Hill, Democrat of Georgia, who had been a bitter antagonist of Conkling's, presented a brief oral report in which the committee upheld the validity of the New York election. Hill explained that none of the three procedural charges, relating to the date of the election and questions regarding the quorum, had sufficient merit to invalidate the balloting. Since no evidence supported the charges of bribery and corruption, the committee also dismissed the request for an investigation of Lapham and Miller. Without debate, the Senate on December 13, 1881, discharged the committee from further consideration of the matter. Conclusion In his anger, Roscoe Conkling had outsmarted himself. He retired from public life and practiced law in New York City until his death in 1881. Thomas Platt, who foolishly went along with Conkling's plan, returned to the Senate in 1897 and served until 1909. He died in 1910. Elbridge Lapham served until the conclusion of his term in 1885. He died in 1890. Thomas Platt managed to prevent Warner Miller from being re-elected to the Senate in 1886, but Miller remained active in state politics. He died in 1918. End of Case 73 and of Section 75. Section 76 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 74. Henry W. Blair, 1834-1920, New Hampshire. Election case, March 9, 1885 to March 10, 1885. Issues, right of governor to make appointment to a term not previously filled by a legislature. Chronology, credentials presented March 9, 1885. Senate vote, March 10, 1885. Result, seated. Background. In 1878, New Hampshire changed its state constitution, creating some confusion in the procedure for selecting United States senators. In 1879, the Senate, then controlled by the Democrats, debated and resolved issues regarding the gubernatorial appointment of New Hampshire Senator Charles Bell, Republican. See Case 71. When Henry W. Blair, Republican, who was elected in 1879 to replace Bell, was appointed by the governor in 1885 to fill a vacancy at the beginning of the new term, the Senate, now under Republican control, again debated essentially the same questions. Statement of the Case. Henry Blair's first term expired on March 3, 1885, but the legislature was not due to meet until June. On March 9, he presented credentials for an appointment by the governor to serve for the three months until the legislature could convene and hold an election. George G. Vest, Democrat of Missouri, who had opposed seating Bell, immediately protested that the earlier New Hampshire case had been decided incorrectly. He moved that the Committee on Privileges and Elections be charged to consider whether a governor had the right to fill a vacancy, not during a term, but at the beginning of a senatorial term. Response of the Senate Republicans quickly responded that the identical issue had been resolved in the 1879 Bell case 
and that Blair had a prima facie claim and should be seated. Democrats, on the other hand, even some who had voted to seat Bell in 1879, now insisted that the issue was important enough to be reviewed. George F. Hoar, Republican of Massachusetts, became the Republican champion in the debate, insisting that everyone understood that the governor's power of appointment did not encompass the full term, but lasted only until the next session of the legislature. He suggested that the real strategy behind the attempts to postpone Blair's oath was to create an interruption in his senatorial service so that he would lose the position on committees that he had earned by his previous service. Convinced by Hoare's arguments, the Senate then defeated the motion to refer to committee and, by a vote of 36 to 20, admitted Blair on March 10, 1885. Conclusion On June 17, the New Hampshire State Legislature met and re-elected Henry Blair to the full term ending in 1891. A supporter of education, woman suffrage, and disarmament, Blair, after his Senate service, practiced law in Washington, D.C., he died in 1920. End of Case 74 and of Section 76. Section 77 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 75, Henry B. Payne, 1810 to 1896, Ohio. Election case, April 27, 1886 to July 23, 1886. Issues, electoral misconduct, charges of bribery and corruption. Chronology, request for investigation, April 27, 1886. Referred to committee, May 11, 1886. Committee Report, July 15, 1886. Result, retained seat. Background. In the 1880s, three strong-willed Ohio Republicans, Senator John Sherman, Governor Joseph B. Foraker, and party boss Marcus Alonzo Hanna, warily sparred with each other for state and national influence. The state's Democrats took advantage of the simmering rivalries to capture control of the state legislature in 1884. When deposed Republicans saw they had no chance to elect one of their own in the coming senatorial election, several threw their support to Democratic candidate Henry B. Payne, whose protectionist tariff policies meshed well with Republican fiscal goals. Statement of the Case On March 4, 1885, Henry Payne appeared and, without challenge, took his oath in the United States Senate. After the next Ohio election, majority control of the legislature swung back to the Republicans, who instigated an inquiry into charges that bribery and corruption were used in securing the Democratic nomination for Payne over the then incumbent Democratic senator, George H. Pendleton. On April 27, 1886, one group of Ohio legislators submitted their committee's report to the U.S. Senate with a request for a full investigation into Henry Payne's 1884 election. The Senate referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections on May 11. Additional materials submitted by the legislature during the month of May were also referred to the committee. Response of the Senate On July 15, the committee returned three reports to the Senate. Two of these, although for different reasons, concluded that there was no basis for a Senate investigation. The majority report, 
signed by the four Democrats on the committee, noted that the original Legislative Committee report submitted in April simply transmitted to the Senate the testimony received without including any specific charge. Then in May, the legislature sent an additional resolution to the effect that since, quote, charges of bribery must be directly made, unquote, in order for the Senate to investigate, the legislature stated that the charges of corruption were true. The committee questioned the long delay between Payne's election and the submission of charges that had been common knowledge for more than two years. Since there was no question about either the Ohio legislature's authority to elect or the validity of Payne's credentials, the members feared that any credence the Senate gave to such naked, unsupported charges would only pave the way for future accusations and persecutions by any personal or political enemy of any senator. In the committee's view, quote, to deprive a sitting member of the Senate of his seat, the Senate must be satisfied by legal evidence that he was personally guilty of, unquote, or, quote, had personal knowledge of, unquote, the bribery. After examining the testimony provided, the Senate committee found no evidence personally inculpating Henry B. Payne or justifying further investigation by the Senate. The second report, signed by three committee Republicans, concurred with the first, but observed that a senator could be deprived of his seat if evidence showed that the number of votes tainted by bribery was sufficient to have affected the outcome of the election, even if the member himself was not personally involved. The report added that if bribery had occurred, it was up to the Ohio state government to seek indictments. Yet, after interrogating 55 witnesses, the state had sought no further action against either Payne or other possible culprits. One author of this report, John A. Logan, Republican of Illinois, explained during floor debate that in several previous cases where election bribery was charged, the Senate had refused to hold its own inquiry unless the legislature had already investigated the actions of its members, found evidence of wrongdoing, and prosecuted those responsible. As precedents, he cited the case of Humphrey Marshall in 1795, see Case 3, that of Louis Bogey, see Case 65, and the more recent cases of John J. Ingalls, see Case 72, and Elbridge Lapham and Warner Miller, see Case 73. Logan concluded by blaming an irresponsible press for making reckless, slanderous charges against many prominent politicians. The minority report, signed by two other Republicans, conceded that the investigation by the Ohio legislature failed to find any evidence that the briberies had changed the election results, but argued that the Senate should conduct its own investigation. During debate, Ohio's Republican Senator John Sherman and committee members George F. Hoar, Republican of Massachusetts, and William P. Fry, Republican of Maine, stressed the Senate's responsibility to ensure that justice was not denied, either to Payne or to the people of Ohio. In fact, Sherman expressed surprise that Payne himself had not asked for an investigation. On the question of jurisdiction, Sherman contended that only the Senate could determine whether sufficient votes had been affected by bribery to invalidate the election. Of particular interest among the charges was one that Oliver H. Payne, a tycoon of Standard Oil Company, and son of the embattled senator, 
had observed that his father's election had cost him $100,000. When Hoare brought the minority arguments to the floor debate, he urged a full investigation, declaring, I will not say that the adoption of this majority report will be a disgraceful fact. That would not be parliamentary or courteous or proper. But I do say it will be the most unfortunate fact in the history of the Senate. On July 23, 1886, the Senate disagreed with Hoare's assessment, voting 44 to 17 to drop any further investigation of Payne. Fifteen Republicans joined with 29 Democrats in opposing a Senate inquiry. Conclusion Henry Payne continued to serve in a Senate that was increasingly dominated by businessmen and the friends of corporate interests. He completed his term in 1891 and died four years later. End of Case 75 and of Section 77. Section 78 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 76, David Turpey, 1828-1909, Indiana. Election Case, February 10, 1887, to May 15, 1888, Issues, Electoral Misconduct, Chronology, Memorial Submitted, February 10, 1887, Referred to Committee, February 16, 1887, December 6, 1887, Committee Report, May 14, 1888, Senate Vote, May 15, 1888, Result, Retained Seat, Background, David Turpey's public career encompassed an era of national turbulence. In 1863, Indiana sent Turpey to the Senate as a replacement for Jesse Bright, expelled for his political indiscretion during the Civil War. See Case 40. After his brief Senate service, Turpey returned to Indiana, where he held a variety of state posts during the disorders of Reconstruction. In 1887, Indiana, a state that had seen its share of political party infighting and factionalism, sent Democrat David Turpey to the United States Senate for a second time. Statement of the Case On February 10, 1887, before the beginning of Turpey's term, members of the Indiana legislature submitted a memorial protesting his election. When Turpey's credentials for a term to begin March 4th were presented six days later, the Senate referred both sets of papers to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. The committee, however, asked to be discharged from consideration of the matter until it was reconstituted at the beginning of the new Congress, since the credentials and protest related to a Congress not yet in session. The Senate agreed. On December 6, 1887, at the opening of the 50th Congress, David Turpey appeared and was sworn in. That same day, his opponents filed a new protest, and all papers in the Turpey case were referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. The Indiana protest claimed that a lawfully elected Republican state senator had been ejected from the Democratic-controlled body and replaced by a Democrat for the express purpose of guaranteeing Turpey's election, and that a second ineligible Democratic legislator had voted in the election. According to Turpey's opponents in the legislature, the participation in the vote by illegally chosen members should invalidate Turpey's election. Response of the Senate. On May 14, 1888, the committee issued a report in favor of Turpey. 
stating that even if the charges were true, they were not sufficient to invalidate the election, since the body in question was the Constitutional Senate of Indiana. In the floor debates, George F. Hoar, Republican of Massachusetts, the committee chairman, rejected the Indiana arguments. Hoare made a distinction between a case like the recent one of Henry Payne in 1886, see case 75, in which there were allegations of bribery and corruption in the election itself, and the present situation, where the question related to the makeup of the state legislature. Although in the Payne case, Hoare had argued in vain that the Senate had a duty to investigate the charges of electoral corruption. In the current case, he believed that the U.S. Senate had no right to determine who could cast a vote in the legislature. Henry Teller, Republican of Colorado, supported Hoare, adding, It does not lie in the power of the Senate, and it was never intended by the framers of this government, that that question of the right of members of the Indiana State Legislature to sit in either body, there would ever be a subject of discussion in this body. On May 15, 1888, the Senate agreed. By voice vote, it discharged the committee from further consideration of the matter and dropped the inquiry. Conclusion In its report, the committee specifically did not preclude the Senate from refusing to admit a senator elected by a legislative body which is itself the result of fraud or crime, which has overcome the true will of the people. If such a case were to arise, it would be, quote, dealt with on its own merits, unquote. Such circumstances, of course, had occurred during the Reconstruction cases of the 1860s and 1870s, when the Senate did, in fact, scrutinize the composition of certain southern state legislatures to determine whether they met the criteria established in the Reconstruction Acts. By the 1880s, however, Reconstruction was over, and the Senate would generally seat the senator chosen as long as an election was carried out by a recognized state legislature according to the procedures set forth in the 1866 Election Act. David Turpey retired from the Senate in 1899 and died in 1909. End of Case 76, End of Section 78. Section 79 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 77, Daniel B. Lucas, 1836-1909, versus Charles J. Faulkner, 1847-1929, West Virginia. Election case, December 5, 1887, to December 14, 1887. Issues, Qualifications, Whether the Senate Should Consider Other Than the Constitutionally Mandated Qualifications to Serve, Challenge to Legislature's Authority to Elect, Chronology, Credentials Presented, December 5, 1887, Referred to Committee, December 12, 1887, Committee Report, December 14, 1887, Senate Vote, December 14, 1887. Result, Faulkner seated. Background. On March 5, 1887, West Virginia Governor E.W. Wilson called the state legislature into special session to consider a specific agenda. The governor's list of items to be covered did not include the selection of a United States senator a task the Assembly had failed to complete in its previous session. On the same day that he summoned the special meeting, Governor Wilson named Daniel B. Lucas, a poet, playwright, 
and staunch Democrat, to serve an interim term in the U.S. Senate until the next session of the West Virginia Legislature. Statement of the Case When the Senate convened on December 5, 1887, two claimants appeared for the West Virginia seat. The first credentials presented were those of Daniel Lucas, followed by those of Charles J. Faulkner, also a Democrat, who was elected by the West Virginia legislature on May 5, 1887, during the special session. The governor signed Faulkner's credentials, indicating that he had only appointed Lucas for the interim before the legislature could elect. Lucas, however, protested Faulkner's claim, arguing that at the time of his May election, Faulkner held a state judgeship. Under the West Virginia Constitution, such a position would prevent his assuming any other political office, although he resigned from the position on the day he was elected to the Senate. Lucas also claimed that the legislature was not empowered to hold an election because the state's constitution precluded a legislature called by the governor from conducting any business not specifically listed in the agenda for the special session. Because the conflicting credentials represented a challenge to the legality of the election and because one candidate might be disqualified, the Senate refused to seat either claimant until it resolved the matter. On December 12, 1887, the Senate referred the credentials and petitions to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, which promised to act promptly on the case. Response of the Senate. Two days later, the committee returned a unanimous report favorable to Faulkner. The committee determined that West Virginia's constitutional limitation on the matters a legislature could deal with during a governor's special session restricted only state and not federal business. According to the committee, state law had no power to prohibit a legislature from carrying out a duty imposed by the U.S. Constitution which specified that the legislature should fill a vacancy at its next meeting. Additionally, the committee interpreted West Virginia's restriction on the political offices that could be held by a justice to apply only at the state level. Any other interpretation, the committee argued, would allow a state to add to the U.S. Constitution's eligibility requirements for a United States senator, which the Senate had rigorously guarded since its formation. In support of this view, the committee cited the Senate's decision to the same effect in the 1855 case of Lyman Trumbull, see Case 28. Without debate, the Senate agreed by voice vote that Charles Faulkner was entitled to his seat, and he came forward to take the oath of office. Conclusion On December 20, 1887, Charles Faulkner offered a resolution seeking compensation for Daniel Lucas, and on January 25, 1888, the Senate agreed to pay Lucas $1,000 for his expenses in contesting the seat. In the Senate, Faulkner chaired the Committee on Territories. When he retired in 1899, he returned to the practice of law. He died in 1929. End of Case 77 and of Section 79. Section 80 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 78. William A. Clark, 1839-1925, versus Wilbur F. Sanders, 1834-1905. Martin McGinnis, 1841 to 1919, 
versus Thomas C. Power, 1839-1923, Montana. Election case, January 16, 1890, to September 30, 1890. Issues, challenge to legislature's authority to elect, rival legislatures. Chronology, credentials presented January 16, 1890. Referred to committee, January 16, 1890. Committee report, March 24, 1890. Senate vote, April 16, 1890. Result, Power and Sanders seated. Background. The organization of the Montana state government and the selection of the first United States senators was marked by acute political strife with charges of residency violations, fraudulent counting procedures, and drunken melees at polling places. Controversy over the makeup of the state legislature after the 1889 state election, in turn, cast doubt upon the legitimacy of senatorial credentials. Statement of the Case On January 16 and 23, 1890, the Republican-controlled Senate received credentials for two contesting pairs of newly elected Montana senators, Republicans Wilbur F. Sanders and Thomas C. Power, and Democrats William A. Clark and Martin McGinnis, the latter of whom had served six terms as Montana's territorial delegate to Congress. At the core of the problem lay the existence of two legislative delegations from Silver Bow County, the copper mining area around Butte, each claiming the right to sit in the Montana State Assembly and participate in the selection of senators. Well acquainted with the intricacies of state legislative disputes, the Senate quickly referred all the Montana papers to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. At the same time, without discussion or objection, the Senate granted floor privileges to all four claimants. Response of the Senate The Committee returned its report to the Senate on March 24, 1890. The committee's majority favored the seating of Republicans Wilbur F. Sanders and Thomas C. Power. The report explained that two bodies, each claiming to be Montana's lawful House of Representatives, had held separate elections for the state's first U.S. senators. One House, consisting of Republicans, had met with half the Senate and elected Sanders and Power. The other body, made up of Democrats, had met in a different location with the other half of the Senate and elected Democrats William A. Clark and Martin McGinnis. Each body was made up of representatives whose credentials were unchallenged, plus five who claimed to represent Silver Bow County. The legitimacy of the bodies thus turned on whether the Republican or Democratic Silver Bow claimants had been properly elected, and specifically on the validity of the election in the county's Precinct 34, a camp on a railroad line under construction. If the vote there was fair and proper, the five Democratic legislators were elected. But if the election was fraudulent and the votes from the precinct were thrown out, the winners were the Republican candidates. The county board of Silver Bow had excluded all the votes from that precinct as tainted, but a single judge later ruled that the votes should be counted. The dispute resulted in the two groups of five contesting legislators. During its inquiry, the committee encountered a tangle of political misconduct that included voting by unnaturalized aliens and secret rather than public ballot counting. It therefore rebuked the new state for the lawless and revolutionary methods 
employed in organizing the first state assembly, but nonetheless upheld the legitimacy of the Republican contingent from Precinct 34. Although tempted to refuse to seat any of the claimants as a way of teaching the state a lesson and displaying its disapproval of the rowdy conduct, the majority decided that these would be inappropriate reasons for rejecting the claims of Sanders and Power. The report of the minority and the ensuing floor remarks of its spokesman, David Turpy, Democrat of Indiana, painted a different picture of the questionable events in Silver Bow County. The minority report stated that voters had been qualified, ballots cast, and votes counted in an entirely proper manner in Precinct 34. The problem began, the minority believe, when the Republican-controlled Board of County Commissioners illegally ordered the returns from that precinct excluded from the count. If these votes had been included, the five Democratic legislators would have been elected. Since these legislative contestants had participated in the legislature that elected Clark and McGinnis, the minority contended that the Democratic senators should be seated. The debate continued through March and into April. At one point on April 9th, Turpy launched a scathing attack on Republican contestant Thomas Power, charging that the Montana politician had bartered with the canvassing judges to have the votes from Silver Bow County disqualified. When angry Republicans urged a prompt vote, Democrats insisted on further delay to allow other members to speak. The debate thus dragged on for another week, until April 16th, when the members voted 32 to 26 to seat Republicans Power and Sanders, who then came forward to take the oath of office. Conclusion In this case, the Senate reaffirmed that when prospective senators appeared who claimed to have been elected by rival legislatures, neither should be sworn in on the basis that their credentials were prima facie evidence of election. Instead, all the contestants should be granted floor privileges until the resolution of the case. Both William Clark and Martin McGinnis received compensation for their time and expenses. Power and Sanders each served only one term in the Senate. Sanders died in 1905 and Power in 1923. Clark subsequently served in the Senate in 1899 and from 1901 to 1907. See Case 89. End of Case 78 and of Section 80. Section 81 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 79, George L. Shoup, 1836 to 1904, and William J. McConnell, 1839 to 1925. William H. Claggett. 1838 to 1901 versus Fred T. Dubois, 1851 to 1930, Idaho. Election case, December 29, 1890 to March 3, 1892. Issues, election irregularities, form of credentials. Chronology. Credentials presented December 29, 1890. Referred to committee, December 29, 1890. Committee Report, January 5, 1891. Credentials Presented, December 7, 1891. Referred to Committee, December 8, 1891. Committee Report, February 2, 1892. Senate Vote, March 3, 1892. Result, Dubois retained seat. 
background. In December 1890, the first legislature for the new state of Idaho convened to vote for two United States senators. When the legislature appeared deadlocked, one of the candidates, Fred T. Dubois, Republican, inquired of the Senate Judiciary Committee whether the state would be permitted to elect three senators, one to fill the very brief term ending March 3, 1891, one to succeed him in that seat for the full term, and one to serve either a two- or a four-year term. The committee chairman agreed to this approach, and negotiations began among the candidates to determine who would fill which seat. Ultimately, the legislature chose Republicans George L. Shoup and William J. McConnell to draw lots between the six-week and four-year terms. The legislature then elected Dubois to replace whoever drew the short term. Statement of the case. Although Shoup, who had been the state's first governor, signed the qualifying credentials for himself and the other two senators, the Senate raised no objections on that point and focused instead on whether the Idaho legislature had inappropriately tried to anticipate the Senate's action regarding the classes of the two new senators. When, on December 29, 1890, the credentials for Shoup and McConnell were presented, the Senate referred them to the Committee on Privileges and Elections but also permitted George Shoup, who was present, to be sworn in. A week later, on January 5, 1891, the committee returned a brief favorable report recommending that William McConnell also be sworn in. McConnell, having arrived in Washington, came forward and was seated as the second Idaho senator. When the two drew lots to determine the length of term, Shoup won the four-year term, while McConnell was assigned to the brief term due to conclude on March 3, 1891. On December 30, 1890, Fred T. Dubois had presented his credentials for the full term to begin on March 4, 1891, which were also referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. The committee quickly responded that the Senate did not consider matters for a future Congress and recommended that Dubois' papers be placed on file. On January 10, 1891, a memorial arrived from some Idaho legislators contending that Dubois should not be seated and questioning whether a state legislature could elect a new senator before the Senate had determined when a term ended. The Senate referred this document to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. In February 1891, the Idaho legislature held a second vote and selected Republican William H. Claggett to fill the term beginning March 4, 1891. The stated reason for the second election was that the Senate would ultimately challenge the validity of Dubois' election, but an equally crucial factor was the insistence on representation in the Senate by the mineral-rich northern portion of the state, which had little in common with the agricultural South. Response of the Senate the Senate did not turn its attention to the contest between Claggett and Dubois until the latter appeared to claim his seat on December 7, 1891, at the beginning of the regular congressional session. Members, agreeing that Dubois' credentials appeared in order, admitted him on December 8, but referred the credentials of both claimants to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. On February 2, 1892, the committee returned a bipartisan majority report favorable to Fred Dubois with a resolution denying Claggett's claim. The majority ruled that Dubois had been legally elected and that his election predated Claggett's. 
a minority report submitted by two Democratic committee members, on the other hand, agreed with Claggett's assertion that the Idaho legislature had not been organized until Tuesday, December 9, 1890, rather than Monday, December 8. Thus, under the 1866 election law requirement that a Senate election be held on the second Tuesday after the meeting and organization of a legislature, the election should not have been held on Tuesday, December 16th, but a week later. The committee's majority rejected this claim, since at the time of the election, no protest was lodged in the legislature that the body was not sufficiently organized to conduct business. The first indication of a question had appeared in the January 10th memorial received by the Senate, followed in February by adoption of a legislative resolution stating that a new election would be held because the election of Dubois might not be valid. During the debate that followed, the Senate granted Claggett a seat on the floor and two hours to defend his claim. Given his opportunity to speak, Claggett asserted that he knew much about the admission process because, during his long life on the frontier, he had assisted with the entry of many new states. Despite his promise that this experience gave him a keen appreciation for the elements and purposes in the transformation from territorial to state government, Claggett only droned on about party pledges and trickery in Idaho. Dubois, from his advantageous position of sitting senator, reviewed the state legislature's 1890 decision to elect three senators at once, an action he insisted the Assembly thought had several precedents. On March 3, 1892, the Senate voted that Fred Dubois should retain his seat. The lengthy floor debate ultimately had required the Senate to rule on several related points. In the case of Shoup, the Senate, without objection, accepted credentials signed by a governor certifying his own election. The Senate did not delay the seating of McConnell and Shoup, even though the State Assembly's joint convention proceedings were not included in the credentials but submitted separately. The Senate examined the credentials of McConnell and Shoup because of a question about which vacancy was to be filled in the assignment of classes to senators from the newly admitted state. In the case of Claggett and Dubois, the Senate ruled in response to a point of order that an amendment offered to a resolution to declare a member entitled to a seat is out of order if the amendment consists merely of a declaration of principles and does not state whether a contestant is or is not elected. This was one of the very few occasions on which the Senate granted a claimant who had not been seated the opportunity to present his case on the Senate floor. The Senate also reiterated its traditional rulings on two other points. The Senate would not act upon credentials presented before the beginning of the Congress to which they apply, but would simply place them on file. And the Committee on Privileges and Elections would examine federal and state constitutions and statutes to determine whether a state legislature was properly organized at the time of a senator's election. Conclusion One month later, in April 1892, the Committee on Privileges and Elections recommended that William Claggett receive $4,000 and Fred Dubois $2,000 for expenses in prosecuting their claims to the Idaho seat. In 1895, Claggett again, unsuccessfully, sought election to the United States Senate. Fred Dubois lost his bid for re-election as a Silver Republican in 1896, but won in 1901, 
and then became a Democrat and served until 1907. From 1924 until his death in 1930, he served as a member of the commission that worked to prevent water boundary disputes between the United States and Canada. McConnell served in the Senate only until March 3, 1891, and then served four years as governor of Idaho. He subsequently held a post with the U.S. Immigration Service until his death in 1925. George Shoup was re-elected in 1894 and served in the Senate until 1901. He died in 1904. End of Case 79 and of Section 81. Section 82 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 80, Robert H. M. Davidson, 1832 to 1908, versus Wilkinson Call, 1834 to 1910, Florida. Election case, December 7, 1891, to February 4, 1892. Issues, Conduct of Election. Chronology. Credentials presented December 7, 1891. Referred to committee December 8, 1891. Committee report January 25, 1892. Senate vote February 4, 1892. Result. Call retained seat. Background. In 1865, the Florida legislature elected Wilkinson Call, Democrat, to the United States Senate. But the Senate, caught in the first confusion of early Reconstruction policies, denied him admission, and the state remained unrepresented in the Senate until 1868, when Florida again selected the former Confederate Adjutant General in 1879 a more amenable Senate, willing to forget his Civil War service, ceded Call. Statement of the Case Wilkinson Call's second term expired March 3, 1891, and on May 26 of that year, the Florida legislature re-elected him for the term that had begun on March 4. On December 7, 1891, Call's credentials were presented as were those of Robert H. M. Davidson, Democrat, a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives, for the same seat. Davidson's supporters contended that, when the Assembly voted for call, fewer than a quorum of the members of one House had been present for the joint session. Considering that no valid election had taken place, the governor had appointed Davidson to fill the vacancy. The Senate hesitated only a day before deciding upon its course of action. It permitted Wilkinson Call to take his seat and sent the credentials of both claimants to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate On January 25, 1892, the Committee returned a unanimous report stating that Call had been properly elected by the legislature and was entitled to his seat. Davidson had challenged the election on the ground that a quorum of the state Senate was not present at the time of the election. The committee pointed out that, under the 1866 Act governing Senate elections, the joint assembly of the two houses was a separate body to consist of, quote, a majority of all the members elected to both houses without any reference to a quorum, unquote, of either house. Fifty-two of the 100 members of the Florida legislature were present and voted. Of these, 51 voted for call, making a majority of the members of both houses. The committee therefore determined that, since the legislature had in fact elected call, 
no vacancy existed for the governor to fill. In the Senate debate on February 4, 1892, William E. Chandler, Republican of New Hampshire, presented a lengthy argument defending the constitutionality of the 1866 election statute. Following a discussion regarding various provisions of that law that did not relate to the present case, the Senate agreed with the committee that Wilkinson Call had been properly elected and should retain his seat. Conclusion In March 1892, the Senate agreed to pay Robert Davidson $1,250 for expenses he incurred while contesting the seat. Wilkinson Call served in the Senate until 1897 and then returned to Florida to practice law. He died in 1910. End of Case 80 and of Section 82. Section 83 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 81, Horace Chilton. 1853 to 1932, Texas. Election case, appointment, December 7, 1891 to January 27, 1892. Issues, challenge to governor's authority to appoint before vacancy occurred. Chronology, credentials presented, December 7, 1891. Referred to committee, December 7, 1891. Committee report, January 25, 1892. Senate vote, January 27, 1892. Result, retained seat. Background. Early in 1891, Texas Senator John H. Reagan, Democrat, resigned his seat effective June 10, 1891. Upon receipt of that resignation, the state's governor, J.S. Hogg, appointed Tyler lawyer Horace Chilton, Democrat, to fill the vacancy. Chilton, a Texas native and former newspaper publisher, presented himself to the Senate on December 7, 1891. Statement of the Case Although the Senate immediately seated Chilton, his credentials were challenged by George F. Hoare, Republican of Massachusetts. Hoare agreed that Chilton clearly had a prima facie right to the seat, but questioned whether a governor could make an appointment before the effective date of a senator's resignation. Chilton's credentials bore the date April 25, 1891, but Reagan had not vacated his seat for another several weeks. At Hoare's request, the Senate referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate. On January 25, 1892, the committee, composed of five Republicans and four Democrats, returned a unanimous report favorable to Horace Chilton. The committee had reviewed several similar cases that had occurred in earlier Congresses and found six precedents related to the Chilton appointment. In three of these cases, the appointees were admitted without question. In the other three, Uriah Tracy of Connecticut in 1801, see case 6, James Landman of Connecticut in 1825, see case 12, and Ambrose Sevier of Arkansas in 1836, see case 16, a question was raised. Tracy and Sevier were seated while Landman was refused admission. The Landman case was particularly perplexing because Senate records and contemporary documents did not fully clarify the basis for the Senate's decision. It was unclear whether Landman was not seated because the governor had acted in advance of the actual vacancy or because a governor could not fill a vacancy at the beginning of a new senatorial term. 
This question had been extensively discussed during Senate consideration of the 1879 case of Charles H. Bell, see Case 71, and the Senate had decided the motivation in the Landman case was too unclear to make it useful as a precedent. As a result, the committee concluded that these earlier unclear circumstances freed the 1892 Senate from any binding precedents. Committee member George Hoare reversed his earlier objections, explaining that he had thought previous cases had indicated a governor could not make such an appointment, but the committee had found this was not the case. He spoke sympathetically about the hardships inflicted on the distant western states if an executive was forced to wait until an actual vacancy before naming a replacement. In recent years, he noted, the Senate had generally resolved such doubtful questions in ways that would keep the body's seats full. For the good of the public interest, therefore, Hoare recommended that Chilton be permitted to retain his place. He cited the case of Bell and the 1885 case of Henry W. Blair, see Case 74, in both of which the Senate had decided that a governor could fill a vacancy at the beginning of a senatorial term if the legislature had failed to elect. Eugene Hale, Republican of Maine, asked whether a change in state executives between a resignation and its effective date would possibly place two claimants, each named by a different governor, before the Senate. Samuel Pasco, Democrat of Florida, added a yet more complicated hypothetical problem that might develop between the governor and the state legislature, or swept aside their objections asserting that they worried about dilemmas that might occur once in a thousand years. A rare contingency, Hoare concluded, should not dictate the usual. On January 27, 1892, the Senate agreed that if a senator resigned effective on some future date, a governor could anticipate the vacancy and name a replacement. Horace Chilton remained in the Senate. Conclusion Chilton served until a successor was elected in March 1892. Then, in 1894, the Texas legislature elected him to a full six-year term. After leaving the Senate in 1901, Chilton practiced law in Texas. He lived until 1932. End of Case 81, End of Section 83. Section 84 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 82, John B. Allen, 1845 to 1903. Washington, Asahel C. Beckwith, 1827-1896, Wyoming, Lee Mantle, 1851-1934, Montana, Election Case, Appointment, March 9, 1893 August 28, 1893, Issues, Right of Governor to Make an Appointment to a Term Not Previously Filled by a Legislature, Chronology. Credentials presented March 9, 1893. Referred to committee March 20, 1893. Committee report March 27, 1893. Senate vote August 28, 1893. Result. Not seated. Background. In the 1890s, Economically strapped Western and Southern farmers turned to the Populist Party in an effort to enhance their political influence. The party's power fragmented state politics in the West by cutting into both Democratic and Republican strongholds. As a result, three Western states, 
Washington, Montana, and Wyoming, adjourned their regular legislative sessions without managing to elect a United States senator for the term beginning on March 4, 1893. In each of these states, the governor proceeded to name an individual to fill the vacant Senate seat until the next meeting of the legislature. In the meantime, the country was struggling with the economic chaos created by the Panic of 1893. Statement of the Case On March 9, 1893, Lee Mantle, Republican of Montana, presented his credentials to the Senate. He was followed on March 15 by Asahel C. Beckwith, Democrat of Wyoming, and on March 20 by John B. Allen, Republican of Washington, who had been serving as a senator since his state's admission to the Union in 1889, but failed to be re-elected because of a deadlock in the legislature. The Senate seated none of the three Westerners, and referred the credentials to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Once again, the Senate questioned the right of a state executive to appoint a senator when the legislature had failed to elect. Since the three claimants were appointed under essentially identical circumstances, the Committee on Privileges and Elections handled the cases as one action. Response of the Senate on March 27, 1893, a bipartisan majority of the committee returned favorable reports on the three claims. The reports upheld the power of a governor to appoint if the legislature had failed to elect a senator on the constitutional principle that a state was entitled to be fully represented in the Senate. On the other hand, the committee's minority also made up of both Republicans and Democrats, contended that a governor had no right to make an appointment at the beginning of a Senate term, even if the legislature had not elected during its session. The Senate debate on the contested appointments began on March 29th and continued throughout April. Then, during the extraordinary session of Congress called in August 1893 by President Grover Cleveland to consider repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, the subject was again discussed. The lengthy arguments employed by both sides reiterated many of the points covered in earlier discussions of a governor's right to appoint including analysis of the constitutional intent of the Founding Fathers, discussion of parallel situations in the executive branch, and dissection of every previous Senate appointment by a governor. On this issue, the divisions were closely tied to the demonetization of silver and thus were chiefly sectional rather than running along party lines. In general, Easterners supported the President's call for repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, believing that if the government stopped buying silver, the drain on the nation's gold supply would be eased, helping to alleviate the panic. Those from southern and western states tried to block the change so that the government would continue buying silver for coinage. It was generally expected that if the three Western senators were admitted, at least some of them would vote against repeal. The conflict severely split the Democratic Party, but Republicans, too, were divided on the issue. During August, temperatures and tempers mounted as both sides charged each other with winding and turning and splitting of hairs. George F. Hoar, Republican of Massachusetts, champion of the contestants, eloquently argued that the Senate would corrupt popular liberty and Republican government if it disregarded its own precedents, which clearly favored the seating of the three. Opponents of admitting the claimants denied that the 1879 case of Charles Bell, C.K. 71, 
had set a new precedent for accepting senators appointed by a governor at the beginning of a term, since in that case, the legislature had not met and failed to elect, as in the Western cases, but rather was not scheduled to convene until several months after the term began. In responding to a suggestion by Orville H. Platt, Republican of Connecticut, that admitting the claimants could lead to some future hypothetical corrupt bargain with a governor, Hoare asked what corrupt influence could be greater than that which, quote, will be brought to bear on the minds of the members of this body to seat or unseat men who have a rightful title to seats here, according as they expect they will vote one way or the other on some exciting question pending, unquote. In spite of his impassioned conclusion, quote, I should feel myself degraded if I voted to keep them out because I do not like the votes they are expected to give, unquote. Hoare did not prevail. On August 28, 1893, the Senate voted 32 to 29 to deny Lee Mantle and John Allen their seats. Asa Hal Beckwith had withdrawn his claim on July 11, 1893, but on September 19 was granted $2,000 for his expenses. That same day, the Senate agreed that both Mantle and Allen should receive $2,500 in compensation for their expenditures. Conclusion Some senators continued to suspect that Mantle, Beckwith, and Allen had been turned away for political rather than constitutional reasons. On September 27, 1893, Fred T. Dubois, Republican of Idaho, expressed concern that his Western neighbors would not have full Senate representation during crucial silver and tariff discussions. He therefore submitted a resolution to postpone the votes on certain national financial issues until 1894, in order to give the three states time to fill their vacant Senate seats. Despite his plea, the Senate took no action on his resolution, and each of the three states had only one senator from March 1893 to early 1895. In fact, the three additional silver votes would have made no difference to at least one issue, for, at the conclusion of a Western filibuster, the Senate on October 30th voted by a comfortable margin of 43 to 32 to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. Of the three contestants, only Lee Mantle returned to the Senate, elected by the legislature in January 1895, to fill the remainder of the disputed term. In 1896, during his Senate term, he organized and became chairman of the Silver Republican Party, but returned to the Republican Party in 1900. An unsuccessful candidate for renomination in 1899, he entered the real estate and mining business in Butte, Montana. He died in 1934. John Allen practiced law in Seattle until his death in 1903. Asahel Beckwith continued his coal mining and stock raising businesses in Wyoming. He died in 1896. End of Case 82, End of Section 84. Section 85 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 83, Joseph W. 80, Dates Unknown, v. John Martin, 1833-1913, to Kansas. Election Case, April 3, 1893, to February 28, 1895. Issues. Challenge to legislature's authority to elect rival legislatures. 
Senate ruled on point of order. Chronology. Memorial received April 3, 1893. Referred to committee, April 3, 1893. No Senate action. Floor debate, February 28, 1895. Result, Martin retained seat. Background. Kansas politics remained in turmoil long after the state's admission to the Union. Counties viciously competed with each other to attract settlers, and rival railroads openly connived for control of politicians, especially during unsettled political periods like Reconstruction or the populist agitation of the 1890s. Thus, the predictable clashes erupted over the selection of a replacement for Republican Senator Preston B. Plum, who died on December 20, 1891. Gubernatorial appointee Bishop W. Perkins, Republican, filled the seat for a year until the Kansas legislature, on January 25, 1893, finally managed to elect Democrat John Martin to the vacancy. Martin entered the Senate at the beginning of the 53rd Congress, when the body was under Democratic control for the first time since 1881. Statement of the Case On March 4, 1893, John Martin presented credentials for the two years remaining in Plum's term. Since his papers were in order, the Senate admitted him without objection, although George F. Hoare, Republican of Massachusetts, raised the possibility of a contest when he noted, If there be any question as to his title upon the merits, the Senate can deal with it afterwards. On April 3rd, a memorial from Joseph W. Eighty, claiming to be the duly elected senator, arrived and was referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. A few weeks later, 77 members of the Kansas legislature filed a memorial that alleged the use of illegal procedures in John Martin's election and asserted that Joseph W. Eighty was the correctly chosen candidate. The Senate directed the Committee on Privileges and Elections to investigate the charges. Response of the Senate. The committee did not consider the Martin matter, either during the brief special session of the Senate or during the extraordinary session of Congress that President Grover Cleveland called in the summer of 1893 to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. By March 1894, both Martin and Eighty had provided the committee with records and other materials supporting their claims, but action was further delayed by the prolonged illness and death in April of committee chairman Zebulon B. Vance, Democrat of North Carolina, followed by a lengthy Senate adjournment from August to December. When the committee finally did consider the matter on January 29, 1895, the majority voted to postpone the case indefinitely. Infuriated by the extensive delay, and with only five weeks remaining in the disputed term, William E. Chandler, Republican of New Hampshire, on January 31st, attempted to jar the matter loose. In the midst of Senate debate on an appropriation bill, he offered a privileged resolution that declared Kansas had no properly organized legislature at the time of Martin's election. When a point of order was raised, Vice President Adelie E. Stevenson ruled that the motion was not privileged and thus could not interrupt the business at hand, and the Senate sustained the decision. On February 28, 1895, Chandler again raised the issue, chronicling the complicated events that surrounded the 1893 Kansas senatorial vote. When the Kansas legislature convened in January 1893, he explained, it consisted of a legal Senate and two competing houses of representatives. 
both the state senate and the governor recognized one of the houses, which joined with the senate in voting for Martin. In order to achieve a quorum, however, the presiding officer permitted two members of the rump house to vote, but refused to accept the votes of the remaining members of that house. Out of this hodgepodge assemblage, John Martin received an undisputed majority of ballots. The rump house then held its own session and voted for 80. Subsequently, the state Supreme Court ruled that the rump house was actually the legal one, and the other house disbanded. Chandler argued that these circumstances clearly indicated that Kansas had not had a properly organized legislature at the time of the election for U.S. Senator. In his intensely partisan speech, Chandler complained that the original Democratic Senate majority at the beginning of the 53rd Congress had been achieved by fraud and trickery. Again, objection was raised to Chandler's resolution as not being a privileged matter. But the Senate agreed to allow John Martin to respond and enter into the congressional record evidence in defense of his election. The angry Martin, however, used such bitterly intemperate language about the New Hampshire senator, saying that he ought to be in the penitentiary and calling him a buzzard who vomited forth his filth on every occasion, that the Senate had to cut short his remarks and formally call him to order. There, the matter rested. The Committee on Privileges and Elections produced no report on the question. The issue did not come to a floor vote, and John Martin retained his seat for the few days remaining in the term. The Senate did agree that Joseph Aidey should receive $2,000 and John Martin $1,000 for their expenses in the contest. Conclusion Considerable partisanship was evident both here and in the simultaneous effort to unseat William N. Roach, Democrat of North Dakota, for actions before he entered the Senate, because the narrow Democratic margin in the Senate appeared vulnerable. By the time of Chandler's February 1895 speech, deaths and other changes had brought enough Republicans into the chamber that unseating both Martin and Roach could have tipped the party balance. At that point, however, such machinations were hardly necessary, since the 1894 election had returned the Republicans to power in the new Senate that would convene on March 4, 1895. John Martin, who chaired the Committee on Railroads during his brief Senate service, returned to Kansas and became clerk of the state Supreme Court. He died in 1913. End of Case 83 and of Section 85. Section 86 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 84, Henry A. DuPont, 1838-1926, Delaware. Election Case, December 4, 1895, to March 1, 1897. Issues. Conduct of election, form of credentials, Senate refused to reverse previous action. Chronology number one. Petition submitted December 4, 1895. Referred to committee December 4, 1895. Committee report February 18, 1896. Senate vote May 15, 1896. Result not seated. Chronology number two. Petition submitted January 12, 1897. Referred to committee January 12, 1897. Committee report March 1, 1897. No Senate action. Result not seated. Background. For months in early 1895, 
the Delaware legislature had been deadlocked among three Republican candidates in its effort to elect a United States senator. Then, on April 8, Delaware Governor Joshua Marvel died, throwing the state legislature into an election dispute involving Henry A. DuPont, railroad president and scion of that state's prominent entrepreneurial political family. The central figure in the controversy proved not to be DuPont, but William T. Watson, former Speaker of the Delaware Senate, who ascended to the governor's chair upon Marvel's demise. On May 9, 1895, Watson, claiming he had never given up his state Senate seat when taking over the governorship, presided over and voted in the legislature's joint session in an effort to defeat any Republican candidate for U.S. Senator, of whom DuPont was the strongest. As a result, DuPont received 15 of the 30 votes cast in the Joint Assembly, one less than the majority needed for election. If Watson's vote against DuPont were disqualified, however, then DuPont had a majority of the 29 legitimate votes cast. Apparently believing this to be the case, one Republican senator declared DuPont elected. Statement of the Case On December 4, 1895, at the beginning of the 54th Congress, supporters of Henry DuPont entered a petition on his behalf, claiming that he had been elected to the Senate for the term beginning March 4, 1895. DuPont charged that Watson illegally performed dual functions, essentially destroying the traditional separation between the executive and legislative branches when, as governor, he participated in the Assembly's election. Although DuPont possessed no credentials signed by the governor, he submitted a certificate of election signed by the Speaker and the Clerk of the Delaware House. DuPont contended that he had won a majority vote if Watson's ballot was discounted. The Republican-controlled Senate referred DuPont's petition to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, together with several affidavits that arrived from Delaware during January 1896. Response of the Senate On February 18, 1896, a divided committee submitted its report. The Republican majority favored DuPont, holding that since Watson's action violated both the Delaware Constitution and U.S. laws, his vote should not count. Supporting DuPont's contention that he received a majority of the legally cast votes, the report declared that, of the two contradictory sets of evidence, the Assembly's official journal entries of proceedings should take precedence over individual affidavits submitted by DuPont's opponents. The opponents contended that, before the Senate entered the Joint Assembly for the U.S. Senate election, Watson had presided over legislative business and voted in the State Senate on May 9th without any objection being raised. The journal, on the other hand, showed no such legislative action by Watson. Before the Joint Assembly adjourned, the legislators who had voted for DuPont had vigorously objected to Watson's participation in the vote, but Watson officially declared that the legislature had failed to elect a U.S. senator. While reaffirming a legislature's right to judge the qualifications of its own members, the committee majority ruled that the power was irrelevant in this case because the Delaware Constitution forbade an individual to serve simultaneously as governor and member of the legislature. The majority report also asserted that DuPont did not need a certificate of election signed by the governor, since the Speaker and Clerk of the State House certified that he had received a majority of the legally cast votes. The minority report, filed by the committee's Democratic members, 
specifically contended that the two offices of governor and state senator were not incompatible under the Delaware Constitution because Watson, as Senate Speaker, was only exercising the office of governor and did not become governor. As precedent, the report cited the cases of three former Senate speakers who had temporarily exercised the authority of governor and had then returned to the Senate to complete their terms once a new permanent governor was chosen. The report also stressed that it was the exclusive prerogative of the Delaware Senate to determine the qualifications of its members, and the U.S. Senate had no right to even consider the matter. Thus, since the Delaware Constitution provided for 30 members in the combined houses of the legislature, and 30 votes had been cast in the election, the United States Senate could not subtract the vote of one senator when nothing in the state record showed he had been judged unqualified by his own assembly. In a Senate fiercely concerned with the delicate balance between parties and factions because of closely contested financial legislation, debates on the legitimacy of Republican Henry DuPont's claim proved lengthy and legalistic as the floor orations continued for almost three months. The minute dissections of the Delaware Constitution included repeated use of the terms vacancy, interim function, devolving duty, and exercise of office. Yet, when the matter came to a vote, the extensive constitutional analysis had done nothing to shift political loyalties. On May 15, 1896, by a party-line vote of 31 to 30, the Senate rejected DuPont's claim. Four populists and one silver party member joined with Senate Democrats to outvote the Republicans on the issue. The case did not end there, however. On January 12, 1897, Henry DuPont brought his contest back to the Senate. In a new petition, he charged that an error in the announced pairs in May 1896 had cost him a favorable decision and that the Senate had misunderstood the construction of the Delaware Constitution. This petition went to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, which reported on March 1, 1897. Even though a majority of committee members still believed that the Senate should have seated DuPont, they did not find that there had been any mistake in counting the pairs. Since the claimant thus had no new evidence to present, the entire committee considered that the Senate's action in the case had been final. In a strong closing statement, the report cautioned the Senate to resist the temptation to reverse its own judgments or to vacate and award seats according to changing political majorities. The Senate took no action on the second report. Conclusion DuPont's case, although unsuccessful for him, established several precedents. The Senate had agreed to investigate whether a claimant without credentials signed by the governor had a right to be seated. The committee determined that the journal of a state legislature, showing that a candidate had been properly elected, could serve as a substitute for such credentials. In addition, the committee ruled that once the Senate had rendered a judgment in a case, the matter could only be reopened upon the submission of new evidence. During the debate, opponents of DuPont forcefully restated the principle that the Senate had no power to determine that a state legislator who was accepted by his own body could not vote in an election for U.S. Senator. In January 1898, the Senate awarded DuPont $1,855.45 for his expenses. At the conclusion of his case, 
he returned to his duties as president and general manager of the Wilmington and Northern Railroad. In 1906, the legislature elected him to the United States Senate, where he served until 1917. DuPont died in 1926. End of Case 84, End of Section 86. Section 87 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 85, Henry W. Corbett, 1827 to 1903, Oregon. Election case, March 15, 1897, to February 28, 1898. Issues. Right of governor to make an appointment to a term not previously filled by a legislature. Chronology. Credentials presented March 15, 1897. Referred to committee March 15, 1897. Committee report January 26, 1898. Senate vote February 28, 1898. Result not seated. Background. In Oregon, the two major parties were closely matched from the state's admission in 1859 throughout the remainder of the 19th century, leading to frequent stalemates in the conduct of the state's business. This deadlock was particularly apparent during the 1897 meeting of the state legislature. When the contentious House finally achieved an organization on its second attempt, neither the Senate nor the governor would recognize the body. The two legislative houses gathered in a futile and unproductive joint convention and were finally forced to disband without transacting any state business or electing a United States senator. Statement of the Case After the Oregon legislature dispersed, the governor appointed Henry W. Corbett, Republican, a successful entrepreneur who had served a term in the Senate from 1867 to 1873, to fill the vacant Senate seat. When Corbett presented his credentials on March 15, 1897, the Senate refused to seat him and referred his certificate, along with several related documents, to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Once again, the Senate faced the issue of whether a governor could appoint a United States senator at the beginning of a term if the state legislature had failed to elect. Response of the Senate In the 55th Congress, Republicans held a majority of 10 in the Senate, but 12 members of three splinter parties the Populists, Silver Republicans, and the Silver Party, were sufficient to tip the balance against the mainstream Republicans on several issues. On January 26, 1898, a divided committee returned majority and minority reports. The committee's majority, made up of a Populist, a Republican, and several Democrats, opposed seating Henry Corbett, contending that the Oregon legislature deliberately refused to elect a U.S. senator. It also determined that the circumstances of Corbett's case were similar to those of several earlier claims, including that of Lee Mantle, see Case 82, in which the Senate had decided that the governor had no right to appoint when the legislature failed to complete an election at the beginning of a term. In support of this position, the report also cited the earlier cases of Kenzie Johns, see Case 2, and James Landman, see Case 12. The minority report, signed by four Republicans, including William E. Chandler, New Hampshire, the committee chairman, argued that the Constitution gave governors the right to fill vacancies even at the beginning of a Senate term. This report, however, failed to cite any Senate precedents for such a view. 
The Senate debated the matter from late January until the end of February. On February 3rd, Donaldson Caffery, Democrat of Louisiana, leader of the committee's majority, reiterated the Senate principle that under no circumstances can the governor appoint to fill an original vacancy commencing at the beginning of a term. In this case, he noted, the legislature had ample opportunity to fill the vacancy. If the Senate were to seat a claimant appointed by a governor in such circumstances, it would be encouraging legislatures to disregard their duty and deliberately prevent an election to give a governor a chance to appoint a senator. On February 7th, Henry Corbett wrote to his supporter, Committee Chairman William Chandler, and defended his appointment on the basis that all states are entitled to equal representation in the Senate. He vehemently denounced the suggestion that some legislators might have conspired with the governor to block a senatorial election for the purpose of guaranteeing him an executive appointment. Such conduct, Corbett asserted, would be unthinkable for a governor who had served with distinction on the state Supreme Court and who lived, quote, in a modest way in his little cottage, and all that he has is his good name and reputation, unquote. Corbett's letter failed to move his opponents. On February 9th, Edmund Pettus, Democrat of Alabama, again reviewed the precedents and reminded Republicans George F. Hoare, Massachusetts, and William Chandler that in the 1893 unsuccessful bid by Lee Mantle, Democrat of Montana, both of the New England senators had asked that the question of executive appointment be settled once and for all. Pettis concluded, If we are forever to treat this question in a partisan sense, if we are forever to debate it, then the debate will only work injury to the country at large. On February 26th, toward the end of the debate, Joseph B. Forak, Republican of Ohio, supported Corbett by contending that the Senate's decision in the Mantle case had been erroneous and should not be used as a precedent because it had been based more on the political circumstances of the effort to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act than on legal principles. Forake also charged that the Mantle case differed from Corbett's in that the Montana legislature had been organized and failed to elect, unlike the Oregon legislature, which never succeeded in organizing itself at all, and thus was in no position to hold an election. On February 28, 1898, the Senate, by an overwhelming vote of 50 to 19, denied Corbett a seat. Conclusion Henry Corbett's claim brought to the Senate two problems that promised to recur as long as the selection of U.S. senators lay in the province of state legislatures. How could the U.S. Senate determine that a state had a legally organized legislature, and how could the Senate define the appointive authority of a state governor? A weary Senate recognized that, with each succeeding election, disputes at the state level were requiring increasing amounts of senators' time. In that way, the Corbett case helped to move the Senate toward much-needed reform in the area of election procedures. Henry Corbett continued to pursue his business interests until his death in 1903. End of case 85 and of section 87. Section 88 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 86, Marcus A. Hanna, 1837 to 1904. Ohio. 
Election Case, May 28, 1898 to February 28, 1899. Issues, Electoral Misconduct, Charges of Bribery. Chronology. Petition received May 28, 1898. Referred to Committee, May 28, 1898. Committee Report, February 28, 1899. No Senate action. Result, retained seat. Background. When John Sherman, Republican of Ohio, resigned from the Senate in 1897 to become Secretary of State in the administration of President William McKinley, the Ohio governor appointed Marcus A. Hanna, Republican, the president's political patron and campaign manager, as his replacement. Hanna, a successful entrepreneur, took office on March 5, 1897, and, in January 1898, the Ohio legislature elected him to the remaining year of Sherman's term, as well as to the full six-year term, beginning on March 4, 1899. Statement of the Case Hannah took his oath of office for the new term without objection on January 17, 1898. Five months later, on May 28, a special committee of the Ohio legislature submitted to the Senate the results of an investigation into charges that several agents of Hannah had tried to secure the vote of one Ohio legislator through bribery. The Senate referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate On February 28, 1899, a majority of the committee reported in favor of Hannah and asked to be discharged from further investigation into the Ohio election. The committee members remained unconvinced by the meager evidence offered by Hannah's opponents and the failure to supply convincing witnesses. Although the state report made clear that an unsuccessful effort had been made to bribe the legislator, the attempt had been exposed before the election and the legislator voted against Hannah. There was no evidence linking Hannah to the individual offering the bribe. The report mildly rebuked Hannah and some of his Ohio associates for failing to respond to subpoenas from the state investigation, but declined to suggest the need for further inquiry within the Senate. Three committee Democrats signed a minority report that urged additional Senate action. In an era before federal wiretapping regulations, the minority report included incriminating transcripts Hannah's foes secured when a stenographer eavesdropped on a hotel extension telephone to write down what purported to be conversations between the agent accused of bribery and Hannah's campaign headquarters. Senators apparently agreed with the majority report, for the Senate ordered the reports to be printed and took no further action on the matter. Conclusion The issue reappeared briefly more than a year later on June 5, 1900, in the midst of a debate on antitrust legislation. Richard F. Pettigrew, a silver Republican from South Dakota, placed in the congressional record the majority and minority reports on the Hanna election case, as well as the records of the entire investigation by the Ohio Legislative Committee, running to 46 double-columned pages of fine print. Hanna, who was on the Senate floor at the time, denied any connection with the controversy and pointed out that he had offered to testify before the Committee on Privileges and Elections, but was assured it would not be necessary. He charged that not only had he not instigated the conspiracy, but that it was really, quote, a conspiracy on the part of the Democratic Party and a few traitors in the Republican Party to prevent Ohio from having another senator in the United States Senate, unquote. 
Election practices in the late 19th century deteriorated to the point where senators knew the charge of bribery could easily be hurled at nearly any member. Painfully aware of the proliferation of abuses in the state caucuses and assemblies in all areas of the country, senators were reluctant to press the inquiry into Hanna's election. Marcus Hanna continued to be a forceful presence in Republican politics and in the Senate until his death in 1904. End of Case 86 and of Section 88. Section 89 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 87. John T. McGraw, et al., dates unknown, versus Nathan B. Scott, 1842-1924, West Virginia. Election case, February 23, 1899, to April 27, 1900. Issues, Qualifications, Residency, Conduct of Election, Eligibility of State Legislators, Chronology. Memorials presented February 23, 1899, December 6, 1899. Referred to Committee, December 6, 1899. Committee Report, March 20, 1900. Senate Vote, April 27, 1900. Result, Scott retained seat. Background. In 1898, West Virginia joined a growing list of states whose internal political strife hindered the effective selection of a United States senator. As the state assembly gathered to choose a senator, for the term beginning March 4, 1899, the proceedings were overshadowed by rumors that the Republican minority in the House intended to withdraw, establish a separate body, and join with the Republican Senate to unseat various Democrats. This conflict was but the most recent in a series of state controversies that included charges of fraudulent election practices in the counties, certificates granted to unlawful assembly members, and the use of threats and intimidation by high-ranking state officials. To quell the rising ill will that threatened to halt all legislative business, five Democrats and five Republicans signed a joint agreement that limited controversies about membership in the legislature to four individuals who were contesting two seats, postponing a decision on those seats until after the election for U.S. Senator, in which none of the four contestants would vote. An imperfect solution at best, the document temporarily quieted seating challenges but it was in this still hostile legislative climate that a joint assembly of the two houses elected Republican Nathan B. Scott to the United States Senate. Statement of the Case Before Nathan Scott appeared to claim his seat, disgruntled Democratic West Virginia legislators, led by their defeated colleague, John T. McGraw, filed petitions on February 23rd and March 2nd, 1899, challenging the seating of the new senator. When Nathan Scott arrived on March 4th, 1899, with proper credentials signed by the governor, the Senate permitted him to take his seat. As the Senate appeared to have ignored the original complaints against Scott, his challengers prepared a new list of allegations and submitted another petition on December 6, 1899, shortly after the regular first session of the 56th Congress began. In their second attack, Scott's opponents listed several charges, apparently in the hope that the Senate would find at least one to be a disqualification. The petition stated that the joint agreement was illegal 
because it had been forced on the Democrats under threats of physical violence. According to the petitions, state Republicans had used this agreement to secure the election of Scott because under it, the two Democratic state legislative contestants who were eventually seated had not been permitted to vote for U.S. Senator. In addition, two Republican members of the state Senate, who should have been unseated, voted for Scott. As a final complaint, the West Virginia Democrats insisted that Scott failed to meet the state's residency requirements because he was an inhabitant of the District of Columbia. The Senate referred this lengthy petition and all the earlier papers related to Nathan Scott to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate On March 20, 1900, a majority of the committee returned a report favorable to Nathan Scott. Noting that Scott had been elected by a majority of the legislators who voted, and that a quorum of the Joint Assembly and a quorum of each House were present and voted, the report argued that the U.S. Senate could not review the decision of the West Virginia Senate on seating its members. The Senate also could not reverse the signed agreement among the West Virginia legislators. Had the complaining parties proved force or intimidation by revolutionary conspirators, the report asserted, the Senate could, as it had in the past, investigate charges of fraud and corruption. In the view of the committee majority, the West Virginia case simply did not represent such an extreme situation, particularly since the evidence showed that the five Democrats had signed and submitted the proposed agreement, which was then accepted by the Republicans, making it unlikely that the Democrats had acted under coercion by the Republicans. Regarding Scott's residence, the report noted that Scott lived in Washington, D.C. while discharging the duties of his office as U.S. Commissioner of Internal Revenue, but remained officially an inhabitant of Wheeling, West Virginia. All committee members agreed on this latter point. For all of these reasons, the committee's majority determined that Scott was entitled to his seat. In a strongly worded minority report, Edmund W. Pettus, Democrat of Alabama, vigorously dissented, complaining that the committee had refused to accept depositions from witnesses stating that a conspiracy interfered with the freedom of the West Virginia legislature's election of Scott. The floor debate continued until late in April. Scott's opponents urged that the Senate had a responsibility to scrutinize elections that involved charges of bribery and corruption. They bemoaned the Senate's seemingly frivolous attitude toward the West Virginia Constitution's eligibility qualifications. Scott's supporters countered that the journal entries for the legislative proceedings did not reveal threats or plots. They conceded that the records showed some members denied voting privileges, but this action, they contended, fell under the right of a state assembly to decide the eligibility of its own members. Despite repeated efforts by Pettus to delay action, the Senate on April 27, 1900, voted 52 to 3 to affirm Nathan Scott's right to retain his seat. Conclusion On May 25, 1900, the Senate agreed that John McGraw and Nathan Scott should each receive $2,850 in compensation for their expenses. Scott, whose earlier careers had included frontier miner and glass manufacturer, served in the Senate until 1911. He then engaged in banking in Washington, D.C., where he died in 1924. End of Case 87 and of Section 89.
Section 90 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 88, Matthew Quay, 1833-1904, Pennsylvania. Election Case Appointment, December 4, 1899-April to April 24, 1900. Issues. Right of governor to make appointment to a term not previously filled by a legislature. Chronology. Credentials presented December 4, 1899. Referred to committee December 4, 1899. Committee report January 23, 1900. Senate vote April 24, 1900. Result not seated. Background. Matthew Quay, Pennsylvania Republican political boss, first came to the United States Senate in 1887. With the powerful machine he built in his home state, Quay had no problem securing re-election in 1893. By 1899, however, the anti-Quay faction, which included state Democrats, insurgent Republicans, and wealthy businessman John Wanamaker, had sufficient strength in the legislature to block a new term for Quay. The struggle to select a senator overlapped with an unsavory trial that linked Quay to a mismanaged bank and the suicide of its cashier. Complaints from Quay supporters that the financial disclosures had been timed to coincide with the senatorial election in the state legislature, appeared valid, for the embezzlement case was sent to the jury the very afternoon that the deadlocked assembly adjourned. The next day, April 21, 1899, Quay was acquitted of any complicity in the scandal. Quay returned to Washington, convinced that the state's governor, controlled by his machine, could be depended upon to give him an interim Senate appointment. Statement of the Case Matthew Quay, who enjoyed a bipartisan popularity among his Senate colleagues, received a warm welcome, although many expressed immediate doubts that the expected gubernatorial appointment would be legal. Predictably, when Quay's credentials were presented on December 4, 1899, Julius Burroughs, Republican of Michigan, protested on the basis of numerous complaints he had received from Pennsylvania legislators. Quay was not seated, and the matter was referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. Response of the Senate. On January 23, 1900, a divided committee presented a majority and minority report. The committee's majority, made up of three Democrats, one Populist, and one Republican, declared that Quay was not entitled to the seat. The report cited earlier Senate election decisions in reaffirming that the governor had no right to make an appointment if the legislature had an opportunity to elect a senator and failed to do so. Four Republican senators signed a minority report contending that Quay was entitled to be seated until the next meeting of the legislature. They interpreted the language of the U.S. Constitution to mean that the governor could appoint whenever there was a vacancy in a Senate seat. They also believed that the previous Senate precedents cited by the majority did not apply in this case. The committee's conflicting reports launched a three-month debate on the subject of Quay's claim. On March 2, 1900, George F. Hoare, Republican of Massachusetts, one of those signing the minority report, emerged as the Senate expert on the subject of contested gubernatorial appointments, a matter he had studied extensively during his years as chairman of the Committee on Privileges and Elections from 1881 to 1891 
and again in 1897. In supporting Quay's claim and defending the gubernatorial action, Hoare contended that the Founding Fathers wanted to assure the continuity of representation for the states. Julius Burroughs, however, challenged Hoare's views, insisting that the Constitution and precedents showed clearly that the governor could not appoint if the legislature had failed to elect. His argument on April 12th, combined with considerable pressure from Pennsylvanians opposed to Quay, led the Senate to deny Quay his seat by a narrow vote of 33 to 32 on April 24, 1900. Conclusion The vote was not an easy one for many senators, who counted the Pennsylvanian as a close friend. Despite their feelings, however, constitutional issues, Senate precedents, and the national implications for the Republican Party carried the day. Quay continued to seek the Senate seat when the state legislature again addressed the issue in January 1901, and his state machine remained strong enough to ensure his election. Quay's reappearance in the Senate was subdued, for his health failed quickly. Unable to complete his term, he returned in 1904 to his Pennsylvania home, where he died on May 28th. End of Case 88 and of Section 90section 91 of united states senate election expulsion and censure cases 1793 to 1990 by ann m butler this librivox recording is in the public domain case 89 william a clark 1839 to 1925 montana election case december 4th 1899 to may 15th 1900 issues Electoral Misconduct, Bribery. Chronology. Petition received December 4, 1899. Referred to committee December 4, 1899. Committee report April 23, 1900. No Senate action. Result. Clark resigned, but later was again elected. Background. In 1890, Montana copper mining czar William A. Clark failed in his first effort to become a United States senator, C.K. 78. Undaunted, Clark continued to devote the full measure of his extensive economic and political power to achieving that goal. Enormous sums of money changed hands in Montana, as Clark and his chief rival, Anaconda Company copper magnate Marcus Daly sought to influence the economic structure of the state, the location of the capital, the direction of democratic politics, and the selection of a United States senator. The blatant business and political competition between the Clark and Daly factions was but a continuation of the turmoil that had marred Montana politics since the organization of the state government in 1889. Statement of the Case Nine years after his initial disappointment in 1890, William Clark won the Senate seat he so avidly desired, presenting his credentials on December 4, 1899. The Senate admitted him immediately, although on the same day his opponents filed a petition charging that Clark had secured his election through bribery. The memorial asserted that Clark had spent far more on his election than the $2,000 permitted by an 1895 Montana law aimed at controlling political corruption. The Senate referred the matter to the Committee on Privileges and Elections, which quickly asked for and received authorization to conduct a full investigation into Clark's election. Response of the Senate. On April 23, 1900, after hearing extensive testimony from 96 witnesses, 
the committee returned a report unanimously concluding that William Clark was not entitled to his seat. The testimony detailed a dazzling list of bribes, ranging from $240 to $100,000. In a high-pressure, well-organized scheme coordinated by Clark's son, Clark's agents had paid mortgages, purchased ranches, paid debts, financed banks, and blatantly presented envelopes of cash to legislators. In addition, the winning margin in Clark's election had been secured by the votes of 11 Republican legislators under suspicious circumstances. Clark did not enhance his position when he admitted that he had destroyed all his personal checks that dealt with campaign transactions. The committee cited a number of previous bribery cases, especially that of Samuel C. Pomeroy and Alexander Caldwell in 1872 to 1873, case 61, as precedents for declaring an election void if bribery on behalf of the winner could be proved even if no proof was found that the candidate knew of the actions. The report also noted the precedent from the Pomeroy case that if the winner clearly participated in any one act of bribery or attempted bribery, he should be deprived of his office, even if the result of the election was not thereby changed. While concurring in the committee's conclusion, Two members tried to reduce the impact of the anti-Clark testimony by pointing to the unlimited sums that his rival, Marcus Daly, had invested in an effort to block Clark's election. Rather than exonerating Clark, however, that observation simply confirmed the way in which corruption totally pervaded Montana politics. On May 15, 1900, as the Senate prepared to vote on Clark's right to retain his seat, the beleaguered senator rose to speak. Predictably, Clark complained about the procedures of the committee, the admissions and omissions of evidence, and the machinations of Marcus Daly. He contended that the Senate had lost sight of the principle of presumption of innocence and concluded lamely that the committee had not shown that bribery sufficient to alter the election results had occurred. At the conclusion of his remarks, Clark, clearly aware that he did not have the necessary votes to keep his seat, resigned. This did not conclude the Montana case, for on May 19th, the acting governor of Montana immediately appointed Clark to fill the Senate vacancy. When the governor learned of this action on his return to the state three days later, he telegraphed the Senate that Martin McGinnis would fill the Clark vacancy. Credentials for both Clark and McGinnis were presented to the Senate, which ordered them to lie on the table. Conclusion. In January 1901, a newly elected Montana legislature in which most of the winning candidates had received financial support from William Clark, elected him to the Senate for the same term he had filled earlier. Marcus Daly had died in November 1900, and this time no charges of corruption were raised. On March 4, 1901, Clark appeared and was seated without objection. In this case, the Privileges and Elections Committee stressed that the Senate had a duty to itself and to the country to demonstrate by its action that senators cannot retain seats procured by corruption. It also saw an equal duty to Montana because the state had adopted the 1895 law in an effort to end corruption in its elections. William Clark having finally achieved his great ambition, served one term as United States Senator. He retired from the Senate in 1907 and returned to his far-flung business ventures. 
while remaining notorious for the corruption of his 1899 election, Clark continued to add to his vast fortune. He died in 1925. End of Case 89 and of Section 91. Section 92 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 90, John L. McLaren, 1860-1934, and Benjamin R. Tillman, 1847-1918, South Carolina. Censure case, February 22, 1902, to February 28, 1902. Issues, breach of comedy, Senate's power to suspend a member. Chronology, altercation on floor, February 22, 1902. Referred to committee, February 22, 1902. Committee report, February 28, 1902. Senate vote, February 28, 1902. Result? Censured. Background. In 1896, South Carolina junior Senator John L. McLaren, Democrat, entered the Senate, joining his longtime close friend Benjamin R. Tillman, Democrat of South Carolina, who, as governor and political boss of the state, had helped to foster his career. Despite their political connection of many years, McLaren, a man of somewhat erratic temperament, turned away from his old mentor and permitted himself to be courted by Senate Republicans. He may have been motivated by a desire to see South Carolina participate more fully in the nation's industrial progress, but his behavior infuriated the outspoken Tillman. Statement of the Case On February 22, 1902, the Senate debated a bill relating to the Philippine Islands. Benjamin Tillman, known to be less than courteous on the Senate floor, used the occasion to direct scathing remarks toward John McLaren's empty chair, charging that his colleague had succumbed to improper influences in changing his position on the treaty to annex the Philippines. Tillman accused McLaren of treachery for casting his vote with the Republicans to approve the treaty after publicly speaking against it. In return, Tillman charged, the majority Republicans had allowed McLaren to control government patronage in South Carolina and granted him committee positions as a Republican. Word of Tillman's remarks quickly reached McLaren in a committee meeting, and, incensed, he dashed into the Senate chamber and denounced Tillman's statement as a willful, malicious, and deliberate lie. In response, the 54-year-old Tillman jumped from his place and physically attacked McLaren, who was 41, with a series of stinging blows. Efforts to separate the two combatants resulted in misdirected punches landing on other members. Such a blatant physical assault had not occurred during a Senate session since Henry S. Foote, Democrat of Mississippi, and Thomas Hart Benton, Democrat of Missouri, had accosted one another in 1850, see Case 22. Response of the Senate. Immediately, the galleries were cleared, and the Senate went into closed session to discuss the altercation. After a two-hour debate, in which both South Carolinians were unanimously declared in contempt of the Senate, the matter was referred to the Committee on Privileges and Elections. When the Senate returned to open session, the President pro tempore, William P. Fry, Republican of Maine, noted that, as long as the senators were in contempt, neither could be recognized to speak on the floor except at the request of another senator. At this point, a senator asked that they be permitted to speak, and Tillman and McLaren apologized to their colleagues. 
They did so, however, in such unpleasant and bitter terms that the ruckus threatened to explode anew. The clash occurred during a Saturday session. On the following Monday, as their behavior was considered in the committee and widely criticized in the press, the two senators found that, until the matter was resolved, their names were also to be omitted from roll-call votes. A piqued Tillman registered a written protest about this procedure in the congressional record on February 26th, charging that it was unconstitutional to deprive South Carolina of its vote in the Senate. The following day, both names were restored because the president pro tempore believed that the full Senate, rather than the presiding officer, should make such a serious decision. The culprits did not have long to wait for a resolution of the matter. On February 28th, the committee reported that, although Benjamin Tillman was guilty of the graver offense in resorting to physical violence, rather than simply using unparliamentary language, as John McLaren had, both senators should receive the same penalty. Declaring that the conduct of the two South Carolinians represented an infringement of the privileges of the Senate, a violation of its rules and derogatory to its high character, tending to bring the body itself into public contempt, the committee explained that the legal effect of the Senate's contempt judgment had been to suspend their functions as senators, a punishment clearly within the power of the Senate. The committee therefore recommended that both be censured and that the contempt order suspending them then be lifted. The Senate agreed, and by a vote of 54 to 12, censured Tillman and McLaren. Their punishment thus consisted of censure, plus the brief suspension they had already endured. Twenty-two senators did not participate in the vote, perhaps indicating the strong sentiment among many members that McLaren's outburst had been provoked by Tillman's intemperate language. Conclusion. Although the Senate took no vote on the issue of suspension, all committee members had concurred that the Senate had the power to suspend as well as to expel a member found to be in contempt. The breach of comedy prompted members to change the rules of the Senate to provide stricter guidelines for the decorum of floor debate. On August 8, 1902, the Senate adopted this change, Rule 19, Sections 2 and 3 stating, quote, no senator in debate shall, directly or indirectly, by any form of words, impute to another senator or to other senators any conduct or motive unworthy or unbecoming a senator, and no senator in debate shall refer offensively to any state of the union, unquote. Under continuing political attack by Benjamin Tillman in South Carolina, John McLaren served only until the end of his term in 1903 and did not seek re-election to the Senate. Instead, he practiced law in New York City for a time, later returning to South Carolina. There, he served in the state Senate and as state warehouse commissioner before retiring to private life. He lived until 1934. Although Tillman continued to serve in the Senate until his death in 1918, he fell ill in 1908. As repeated strokes and a progressive paralysis marked his declining years, political control of South Carolina gradually slipped from his hands. End of Case 90 and of Section 92